For a bit of background, I grew up in the densest region of the biggest city in South America. It's a dangerous place, to the point that I've never met a single adult person who wasn't robbed at least a few times. You know the story that, in some places, there are a lot of words to describe snow because of how prevalent it is. Well, in Brazil, there are many words to describe a robbery. One particularly common type of robbery literally translates to a great dragging. It's when a group of robbers target individuals in a much larger crowd. A sudden scare makes those near the attack run away, and when people see others running, scared and screaming, they also start running along, dragging the whole crowd in a single direction, hence the name. The robbers use the ensuing chaos to flee before the cops are called, so it's usually a very brief event. Usually. Back in 2009, I used to travel by subway and walk for about 10 minutes the rest of the way to college. I studied at night, and classes finished at 11.15pm, by which time I would take a bus to return to the subway station, because it would be too dangerous to walk this late at night. On November 10th, around 10 p.m., I was in class when I noticed all the lights in the building I could see through the windows turn off, and soon after, the lights in the building I was in would go off as well. I didn't know it at the time, but what happened was a huge blackout that affected half of Brazil and the entirety of Paraguay for a while. Power would generally return, but things would only be normal the next day almost eight hours later. Anyway, the generator kicked in, but our teacher dismissed the class because of the blackout. As I left, I discovered near total darkness outside. Streets were mostly illuminated by the cars on the road. I went to the crowded bus stop and waited. My bus arrived very late, but eventually I reached the subway, and this is when things start to go very wrong. Because of the blackout, the subway was not operational, and there was already a very large crowd waiting for it to reopen. The building itself was powered by generators, but no one was allowed past the turnstiles until things got back to normal. This was a very warm Brazilian spring night. There was no ventilation in the building, and the conglomeration caused it to feel warmer. The result of this is that the crowd was divided in two, one group waiting inside the hot but lightened building, and another waiting outside, in the cooler but dark night. By this point, you might have already guessed what happens. I was in the group that chose to bake instead of stand in the dark, but the larger group was outside. Suddenly, I heard a few screams, and people started to push and squeeze inside. This made the heat almost unbearable, but soon after the commotion started, it stopped. Everything got quiet, and the crowd dispersed a bit. Then it happened again. A few screams, everyone starts to push everyone else inside. Sudden quietness, unbearable heat, crowd dispersing again. This kept happening. I'm not sure how many times it happened. I was equal parts scared and confused. I had no idea what was going on, but I overheard people talking and put the pieces together. I was already familiar with the fact that this region had a lot of beggars by day turned muggers by night. They usually act alone or in small groups, threatening people with shivs and small knives, or snatching phones from distracted victims. During the blackout, however, they took advantage of the large crowd and practiced the aforementioned great dragging. What made this unusual? is the fact the crowd could not disperse because we were waiting for the subway. No one would venture far during a blackout, and no cops would ever arrive. So it kept happening, over and over again. I'm not sure if they were simply snatching phones, using knives, or both. But whatever it was, it scared those outside repeatedly. I eventually managed to call my father and asked him to drive me home. I was almost more scared when I had to walk alone the short distance to where he'd parked the car than I was of the whole ordeal. I was lucky to have someone to drive me home. 
because as it turns out, the subway would remain closed for a few more hours. I can't imagine having to deal with that situation for long. I still remember seeing an old lady waiting alone on a secluded bus stop in near complete darkness during my drive home. She was probably even more scared than I was that night. It's hard to even imagine. I also hope those opportunistic robbers got what they deserved in the end. But knowing Brazil, I highly doubt it. I'm a male and this happened about a decade ago. I was 19 years old. I was getting really fat and started to work out in a gym close to my house at the time. I didn't like the weather much since it's really hot and I had to walk to the gym. I always had some headaches because of the sun. There I met some people, others I'd already known from college and church, but one guy specifically started talking to me kind of randomly. His name was Sebastian. He seemed like he was in his 50s or something. Some friends said that he was strange sometimes, but I was kinda naive about it and didn't give much importance to it. Sebastian would offer me a ride home and I never accepted, except one day that my other friend from college said that Sebastian was taking him home and that they could drop me off at my house too. I thought it was safe, so I accepted. The next week, I was working out and he appears out of nowhere and starts talking about a woman from the gym that wanted to date him, or something like that. He was giving me some sexual details, and it was already really weird. I just tried to change the subject, but he insists on the subject, saying the woman didn't have the body he liked. And he says something like, but I enjoy people like you, with a really creepy smile. I stopped working out and looked at him, saying, What are you talking about? He continues, Oh, come on. Will you say that you've never had any unexpected attraction for someone? I'm not really sure if I know what you mean, I replied, already kind of scared. He walks away with an even more creepy laugh, saying, You already answered me. I was a bit freaked out and started to work out quicker so I could leave as soon as possible. Just when I start my last set, he comes up from behind me and says really close to my ear, let me hear you moan. At that point I'm getting really angry and tell him to piss off and to stop with the weird talk. He walked away laughing and I continued to do my sets and right at the end of it, I didn't see him near me as I was exhausted and I unconsciously let out a moan. Yes, he was right behind me, and then he said, Ah, yes, that's really good. That's what I like to hear, smiling at me. I was scared and started to quickly leave. I got my stuff and got home as soon as I could. I didn't go to the gym for the rest of the week, and eventually stopped going there and never went back. At the time I was like 15 or 16 or something. Some friends of mine that work out there told me that the guy still goes there too. He's often seen with young guys around the same age as I was at that time. And it's still weird. I studied abroad in Peru when I was 19. This was 10 years ago, so the story's a bit foggy. A lot of the time, I was the only white person around, so I stuck out. I would often get whistles and catcalls, but I think this guy was up to something more malicious. I was on a bus to one of the other neighborhoods, a route I'd taken maybe only once or twice by myself at that point. A man who looked to be in his 60s got on the bus, scanned the seats, then headed straight to the seat beside me. He was also white and wearing a baseball hat and t-shirt. He sat down and asked in English if I was American. I said yes and asked him where he was from. I actually didn't care and didn't want to talk to him, but I used to be polite. Anyway, he said he was from Lima, but he liked to learn languages. 
At some point he asked where I was going, and I told him the neighborhood, but not the exact stop. He told me he could read palms, so I said great and flipped mine up. He told me he didn't do readings for free. He said I could trade him English lessons for palm readings. I wanted all interactions with this guy to end as soon as possible, so there was no way I was going to give him lessons. I just told him he was already good at English. He grabbed one of my wrists and flipped my palm up, and he told me it was very interesting and that I needed to know, but he would only tell me for an English lesson. He asked for my phone number, so I lied. I told him I didn't have a phone in Peru yet, but he could give me his number and I can call him when I get one. He didn't like that idea. He really wanted to be able to contact me himself. He hesitantly pulled out a piece of paper and wrote his number down. He wrote his name as Cholo. I read it and asked, Cholo? In Peru, that word is often used to refer to a person from the mountains and is sometimes derogatory. This guy was definitely not a cholo. He was a white guy from the city. Well, he told me I could just call him cholo, brushing it off and said that I didn't need to know his name. I was very freaked out, but I didn't want to cause a scene. He told me that he was concerned I was lying and wouldn't call him. He said that it happened before when he asked a woman from India to give him lessons, and it didn't work out. He said he would hate for what happened to her to happen to me. What the hell? At this point, my skin was crawling. I was panicking, but I still didn't want to draw attention to myself. I realized that no one else on the bus knew what was going on, because we'd been speaking in English the whole time. With as much sincerity as I could muster, I told him I would call him. He told me he didn't believe me because I wasn't looking at him, and he grabbed my face and turned my head toward him. He had his hand wrapped around my jaw and was holding on firmly. I said I would call him and he let go. We weren't close to my stop, but I told him I had to go. I started to stand up, but he pushed my legs back down and told me we weren't there yet. So I sat down and was scared he would try to follow me or wouldn't let me off. He kept his arm over my legs to stop me from standing up. As soon as we were in the neighborhood, I got off the bus. He didn't follow me, thank God. So that's the unsatisfying end to my story. That was the last time I saw or heard from him. I threw away the paper with his number, thinking that I didn't want it and didn't need it. I wish I'd given the information to the police. I didn't know what his plans were, and I don't know anything about the Indian woman. In mid-February of 2021, me and my friend traveled to Cartagena, Colombia, which in hindsight was not a particularly smart or safe decision as we encountered multiple terrifying close calls. Toward the end of our 10-day trip, we decided to take a boat to the party island of Cholan. It's worth mentioning that my friend spoke no Spanish and I could barely communicate more than simple sentences. After a 40-minute, insanely bumpy ride. The boat arrived at the island and dropped us off, when we noticed that we were the only ones getting off. When we tried asking what time they would come back to pick us up, nobody on the boat could understand us, so we just got off nervously and prayed they would come back. I was completely panicking, but I didn't want it to ruin my experience of this beautiful island, so I stripped down to my underwear and immediately jumped into the water in an attempt to wash away my anxieties. There was this fat, middle-aged white man with a bandana on his head, laughing from a table on the shore. He made a joke about me swimming in my undies. We walked over to chat to him as he appeared to be the only English-speaking person in sight. As we approached, we noticed that there was a girl sitting next to him. He asked us to join him and started buying us drinks. He introduced himself as Charlie Loco, and the girl is his 18-year-old girlfriend. She seemingly couldn't have been older than 14 years old. I found it suspicious that he needed to mention she was 18. My friend didn't seem to notice how young she looked until we went for a walk, 
and I pointed it out to him in private. When we joined him again, he explained that he'd spent every winter in Colombia for the last nine years, but couldn't speak a lick of Spanish, nor his girlfriend English. She was communicating to us via Google Translate. After getting us pretty drunk, we realized that the boat was not coming for us. My anxiety came back again as I realized we had no way off the island. Charlie Loco told us he had a 40-foot sailboat parked on the water and offered us to stay the night, saying he could give us a ride to the shore in the morning and call us a cab. Me and my friend were pretty creeped out by this guy, but we couldn't think of another option. We decided to stay over, and when it was nighttime, he went off to bed, leaving me, my friend, and the girl. Being concerned for her, we asked if she felt safe and if she liked him. She responded, he's okay, but he likes to yell a lot. After a short time, she seemed nervous and translated to us, I should go to bed or Charlie will get angry, and she hastily left us to go join him. In the morning, we went for a swim before leaving. He asked us if we wanted his girlfriend to flash us, which we adamantly declined. The whole thing felt incredibly sleazy and disgusting at this point, and we just wanted to go home. Charlie brought us back to the shore, and we took a cab ride back to the city. We felt genuinely worried for the girl, and it stuck with us both for a while. His skin was sunburned, blistered, and infested with fleas or some horrible rash that he was always itching. The thought of that girl having to share a bed with him made us want to throw up. I wonder about her sometimes, and if she's safe or happy. I live in Argentina. This happened at dawn in my city. It's not a very big city, so killings or kidnappings are almost non-existent. Plus, this happened in downtown in the surrounding area. It's the safest area of the city. I'm a 25-year-old male. I went to a nightclub in downtown with my friend and some of her friends. It was a chill, warm night. I had a great time there, dancing, drinking, and all that stuff. I didn't drink much, though. Even though I'm gay, this nightclub isn't particularly a gay club, so I wasn't expecting to meet other guys. I was on the dance floor and this guy seemed to make a lot of eye contact with me. I didn't find him attractive. He was too slim, a bit shorter than me, very pale. In fact, I found him a bit creepy. His face, the way he looked at me. But I was curious, and it caught my attention that he was watching me. Who knows, maybe he was gay and I may like him. Time goes by. Dancing with my friends, I get away from him. It was almost 6 a.m. and it was time to leave. I go to the bathroom when I see him just getting out of it. We almost crash into each other. I finish my stuff and when I was about to wash my hands, I saw him there again. He'd come back to the bathroom. While washing my hands, I saw through the mirror he had his phone on his ear, like he was about to call someone, looking down at the floor. I just washed my hands, and when I was about to leave the bathroom, he looked at me steadily. Our faces were closer this time. For some reason, something in his eyes, the way he looked at me, it was weird, terrifying, and intriguing at the same time. We left the club and said goodbye to my friends. Since I'd wasted all my money, I decided to go back home by walking. It wouldn't be bad. It wasn't cold. This decision was my worst mistake. After walking one block, surprisingly I found this guy with his friends. His friends got in a taxi, and he just started walking the way I was. I didn't know what to do. I thought maybe I should find another way home so he doesn't feel like I'm stalking him. I didn't want him to think that I was stalking him, but I also thought it may be funny too. Who knows? Maybe he would say hi. I suspected he was gay since he made a lot of eye contact. I started walking, speeding a bit so I could reach him. 
He was walking on the sidewalk. Then I noticed he saw me. I didn't want to say hi or anything. I am shy. I tried to not look at him. I just focused on walking. Then he did a move. He crossed the street. He was now walking behind me, just some meters away. I kept walking. He waited like five blocks when I decided to stop on a bus stop in a gas station. I wanted to know how he would react to that. He crossed the street and looked at me. Again, the way he looked at me was weird. His eyes were creepy. That was probably just how he looked at people. Who knows? But I felt something weird. Then he turned to his left and started walking. I decided to stand there and watch him walk away. I wanted to know if he would turn around. He did. At this point, I didn't know what to think. I decided it was time to finish this little game and proceeded to walk home. I wasn't going to follow him. It was enough for me. I figured he was probably shy too. I continued walking one block straight and finally turned to the left. I lost him. I walked one more block and as I was walking, a car stopped right next to me. Inside, I saw a man and a woman. The woman asked me, Do you have a lighter to lend? Don't tell me why, call me paranoid, but there was something wrong with them. I told her no, I don't, and she replied, How is it so that you don't have one? That question annoyed me and I didn't say anything, I simply walked away. The car then proceeded downtown. Seconds later, almost one block in the distance, I saw the guy again. This guy was stalking me. All of a sudden a guy riding a motorbike passed by and yelled at me, Hey cutie, give me a kiss. At this point I was starting to feel uncomfortable. I'm not used to being catcalled. And then I noticed this guy was now walking toward me. This was all too much to the point it was creepy. I continued my journey home, turning around to see if he was getting too close to me. I noticed he was using his cell phone. I turned to the right. He turns too. I stop as if I was looking for a taxi. I wanted to see his reaction again. He did the same thing as he did the last. He crossed the street and looked at me with those psycho eyes. He turned to the left and I started walking. Suddenly, this suspicious blonde guy showed up. He was just walking and looking at me, but it wasn't anything too serious. Then, I see the couple in the car again. The same car that had stopped next to me and moved towards downtown. But now, but now they were going my way, opposite to downtown. It seemed weird. This was the point where I was overwhelmed by all these situations. I started panicking, freaking out. What was going on? Why would the car change its way? Was it all just a coincidence? My instinct told me otherwise. Luckily, I saw a taxi passing by. My first move was getting into it. I wanted to get away from there as soon as possible. I was in the taxi and saw this blonde guy sitting. He was seated in front of a house and watched me as I passed by in the taxi. He was walking. Why did he stop? Why was he just sitting there watching me as soon as I got into the taxi? That was suspicious. But it gets worse. The car that I'd noticed again just minutes before was now just right ahead of my taxi. Why had it moved so slow? Were they stalking me too? Or was it all just a coincidence? Five blocks later, I told the taxi driver to quickly turn left, and we finally lost them. Nothing like this has happened to me before. I've gotten back home after a night out by walking several times before. I've never been robbed or anything. If he wanted to rob me, he would have already, right? After stalking me more than ten blocks, he had the opportunity. I arrived home in a panic. I regret not having done anything. I wish I confronted him, at least said to him, why are you stalking me? What could that little freak have done to me anyway? I was so overwhelmed.
I grew up in a third world country in South America, Peru. Living in places like these means constantly fearing for your life each second you're outside of your home, and sometimes even when you're inside it. I must have been 10 at the time, and they were doing a maintenance check on my apartment building. One night a man knocked on my door dressed in workers' clothes, no different from the men working on the rest of the building, but it was after the usual work hours. My father opened the door without thinking much of it. The guy came in and said his name was Jose. I'll never forget the feeling of uneasiness he gave me, but I brushed it off because my parents are always right. He went to the kitchen with both of my parents while I played on my Nintendo in the living room. The man then came into the living room alone and started trying to tie me up with some rope. I knew immediately what was happening and started kicking, screaming, fighting back, but it was no use. The man was a burglar in disguise, preferring deception over stealth. He knocked out and tied up my parents before doing it to me and stealing our valuables to his heart's content. He couldn't take large things that would make him look suspicious as he left, so he took jewelry, decorations, small paintings, and my Nintendo with all my games. My dad was the first to wake up the next morning. He'd freed himself before untying my mother and I. We called the police, but being the useless Peruvian police, nothing came of it, and they never caught him. We moved away soon after and haven't thought about going back for over 10 years. In April 2019, I was an exchange student in South America. I went on a trip to the Amazon with a group of other exchange students. While many strange things happened, I want to focus on two that were particularly unsettling. I was 18, tall, thin, and white with blue eyes. I was fluent in Spanish, allowing me to talk to locals without misunderstandings. The first incident occurred on our first night slash morning in the Colombian Brazilian town of Leticia. We were all staying in a hotel. It had a strange vibe. I didn't feel comfortable and neither did my friends. The hotel staff were staring at us like creeps, which made it even more scary. During breakfast, I overheard other exchange students discussing a missing phone. I offered to help locate it using the Find My iPhone app and we were able to track it down to a sketchy part of town. The police accompanied us to the location and we found the house where the phone was. The family denied involvement, but their behavior and the fact that the phone signal was coming from their place made it clear to us that they'd probably stolen it. They came out with knives and machetes, yelling and staring at us. It was intense. I felt a shiver down my spine. I had a very strong gut feeling that we needed to leave. We told the police to go back and not do anything about the phone because we were worried about our safety and the phone wasn't worth it. When we came back to the hotel, the police wanted to see if there were any cameras pointed at the door of the room from the outside or the inside. The scary part is that they had cameras from the inside and outside. Only these two cameras were mysteriously turned off for two hours that night. I also know about another incident and found out why the cameras were turned off by someone from the hotel staff. One of our other stops was in a small village in Peru's part of the Amazon. I don't remember the town's name, but it had around 150 people. The village was built on pillars above the water as the river Amazon was overflowing or something. As we arrived and settled in at the local hotel, we were taken to a stage where we were introduced to the region's indigenous dances, songs, and culture. After the performance, the group returned to the hotel, but I decided to stay back to talk to some of the locals. I wanted to see an anaconda, and someone had told me this was a good time to see them hunt. I started talking to a local guy, and he claimed he couldn't show me where to see a live anaconda, 
but offered to show me a picture of one he had taken a few days ago on his phone. Despite what my parents always taught me about going to strangers' houses, I foolishly decided to follow him to his remote, isolated home deeper in the jungle. As we walked, I couldn't shake off the feeling of unease and danger lurking around every corner. When we arrived, he instructed me to wait in the living room while he searched for his phone, but as I stood alone in the dimly lit room, my gut told me something was wrong. I couldn't shake off the feeling that I was in grave danger. After what felt like an eternity, he returned and said he couldn't find his phone. He asked me to come back the next day, but I knew I had to get out of there as soon as possible. I thanked him and left, but my heart was pounding with fear and adrenaline. When I returned to the hotel and told my friends what had happened, they were horrified and couldn't believe I put myself in such a dangerous situation. I couldn't shake off the feeling that something terrible could have happened if I'd stayed any longer. Looking back, I realized that the encounter was bizarre, even if he was truly just a kind person, but I can't shake off the feeling that something could have happened to me. It scares me to think about how gullible I was. Even though I consider myself rational and sometimes even paranoid, I didn't listen to my instincts and put myself in danger. This happened to me nine years ago. At the time I was 17 years old and had been offered a job at a classmate's mom's mini market. Here in my country, in South America, those are pretty common. They sell everything from frozen food to bathroom necessities. Usually people will build a tiny separate building next to their house for it and work the store for themselves. Every condo slash village has about one on every main street. Anyway, my classmate's mom gave me an offer to work there, Monday to Saturday, 8am to 4pm, with some very good cash and free lunch. He lived about a mile away and my house was directly connected to his by a cycle path. I would get used to using my brand new bike as a means of transportation, basically the perfect job for a teenager. I didn't enjoy working there. Don't get me wrong, I actually like working and I like making money, but this store had too much going on in it. I had to make ice cream cones, bag chicken breasts, laminate ham and cheese, work the coffee machine, and keep everything immaculate and in order, all the while checking that all the stuff this lady had in her store wasn't expired. Overall, it wasn't really abusive. She just didn't know how to manage her store, or her money. Although that's a completely different story though. Anyhow, one of my many jobs there was keeping an eye on fruits and veggies, meaning checking for the rotten ones and throwing them away and refilling the tomatoes if the shelves were empty. There was only one huge problem for me as a 5 foot 4, 120 pound girl, the 45 pound potato sack. For context, right in front of the store there was a huge green area and we have public workers and gardeners who take care of them. They have one specific person in charge of specific areas, so the same man would always be there doing his job, and that was Pete. Back when only my boss and her family worked their store, they would ask Pete to help to take the potatoes from the car and drop them off at the back of the store. He would always help, and the only thing he asked for as payment was a cup of coffee and a sandwich. This man was in his late 50s and didn't go through education, and even though he didn't seem to have any kind of mental handicap, he would not understand that there were limits to how you approach people and what is and isn't appropriate. More on that later. Anyway, whenever we had to take potatoes out of the car, my boss would phone him and he would come in quickly as he had a red bike with an engine attached to it. Everyone was comfortable with him. He was just an older man who helped with the heavier duties and asked for very little in return. As I started learning the job, my boss wouldn't be around to help me when I had doubts, meaning I was completely alone in the store. I would struggle by myself on moving the potatoes from the back of the store 
and would often lose a piece of fingernail or something. Because of this, whenever she left, she would ask the gardener to keep an eye on me and help me with it. The problem began pretty quickly. I've interacted many times with people with conditions. I'm not trying to be rude, but when someone has some kind of mental health issue or syndrome, even if they can normally function and even have jobs, you can kind of tell. But I assure you, this man was completely healthy and normal. Looking back, I think he was using his lack of education as a way to shield his behavior. And so people pitied him and felt guilt for not liking him, and he would try to take advantage of the girls who worked there. He would fixate on certain topics, always repeat the same conversations, become way too close to me and my co-worker. He would stand too close and talk about some very personal problems with me. Keep in mind, he was 30 plus years older than me, I was underage. He became another one of the many unpleasant duties I had to deal with on a daily basis. As weeks progressed, he gave me his phone number so I could call him when I needed assistance. I never called him, because I of course didn't want to be around him, and because I'm the kind of person who thinks they don't need help. When he realized I wasn't calling him, he tried to push me into giving him my number. I never did so he would stay right in front of the store and come in every 20 minutes. He gave me a bicycle seat, and even though I told him I didn't want it and he could keep it, but thanking him for the thought, he removed my original brown seat and put on the one he got me. He would tell me he was single and owned a house. He would call me pretty and try to play with my hair, that kind of stuff. I was severely uncomfortable around him but nobody seemed to be bothered by any of those things. It made me feel very awkward and guilty for feeling these things, which only contributed to the already disappointing feeling of working this unsanitary place. I decided to just do my best to ignore him. When he realized I was distant, he started accusing me of being mean to my boss, but nothing else. It was only a summer job, so I thought I just had to stand it for a month and then it would be over. But no. One good day, two weeks before I had to leave, he tells me he's in love with me. Dead serious, too. I was 17 and had no experience with love and such. I never had anyone tell me something like that. Usually I'm a very short-tempered person and snap easily. I could have told him to stop messing with me, but this just left me speechless. He'd already been flirting with me for two months, even though I was underage. He'd given me presents. I'd seen him lift two potato sacks on one shoulder, and he could certainly do as he pleased with me. I started to sweat. I was feeling violated, even when he wasn't trying to approach me. But he just stared so deeply into my eyes that it was clear he was trying to make me feel inferior. I didn't know what to do and he wasn't leaving the store. My boss arrived like 10 minutes after this, so we started chatting with her. I was left feeling violated for the rest of my shift. Two weeks after, my contract ended for the summer. I thought I would never have to see him again, but no. There are green areas where I live too. One day as I was walking my dog, I see a bright red bike with an engine attached to it next to some swings in the park. I recognize it. It was his bike. He saw me and ran towards me, crossing the street even though cars were coming. I have three dogs. One is a pit bull mix and the other a husky mix. Not one of them liked him. You would think my big ass dogs would stop him from standing too close to me. But no, he only took a few steps back when my pit tried to bite his hand. I'd never seen them so angry. He told me his boss had realized he was slacking on his job to help at the store, and he didn't like that, so he was moved to another area away from the store. My area. He insisted on asking where my house was, just like he insisted on my phone number back in the day. My house was a quarter of a mile away. I told him I lived in the opposite direction, because, of course, I didn't want to tell him where I lived. That day, I told my mom about this creepy old man and all the things he'd done at that point. 
She yelled at me for not snapping at him or something. It was like she didn't understand. This man could carry two of those potato sacks on one shoulder. I asked her to not tell my dad because he would get angry at me. My mom did tell though. The next day my father mysteriously offered to walk the dogs. And the day after that, Pete wasn't around to be seen. My mom later told me that my dad approached Pete and threatened him. Knowing my dad, he probably told him about his military background and his gun. Pete asked to be moved to any other area right there, with his boss on speaker and my dad listening. My city is pretty small, so I still see him when I go on longer walks about four miles from my house, but he no longer tries to talk to me. Instead, he keeps his head down and starts moving faster to the opposite direction. Goodbye, you old creep. This was about seven years ago on a dark stretch of road near a main intersection in a major Bay Area city. I worked at a big name, healthy grocery store from 2014 to 2017. I was lucky to meet and work with amazing co-workers, some of whom have become my best and closest friends. One of my best friends, Cav, is one of the nicest, most caring people I've ever met. He's incredibly generous, genuine and warm, and welcoming to everyone, sometimes to a fault. I'm a female, and at the time of this story I was in my early 20s, and Cav is a guy and he was in his late 20s. Cav and I had a weekly ritual of driving around the city after work and talking, sometimes about our problems, sometimes about what was going well, but it was therapeutic and always something to look forward to. This particular night, we invited our buddy, Ben, to join us. His department always got out 30 to 45 minutes after the rest of the store, so Cav and I decided we would do a short drive around the area to pass the time until Ben was off. Cav was driving that night. We did our drive and were headed back to the store to pick up Ben. In order to get back to the store, we needed to make a U-turn at a four-way intersection to get to the intersection, we had to go down a dark but short stretch of road. The intersection is well lit, always busy, and has a shopping center plaza on each side. From the dark stretch of road, it's exactly 302 feet to the main well lit and ever busy intersection. As we're driving down the dark section, Cav suddenly interrupts what I was saying and says, Oh my god. Did you see that person waving? He slows down the car as I look back. No, what are you talking about? I ask. You didn't see them. There was someone in a black hoodie waving us down. I'm looking back. I have poor eyesight. It's dark. No, I don't see anyone. There's no one there. As I'm saying this, Cav is pulling into an empty parking lot parallel to the dark stretch of road. He reaches to the back seat and is moving jackets and other stuff off the seat, obviously making room for this person. No, Cav, I said. No one is getting in this car. Do you understand? But what if they need- No, there's no one there. And if there were, they could walk up to the intersection. No. He agrees, but insists we continue to circle around and check. I reluctantly agree, but realize I have no choice anyway. We circle back, and sure enough, there's a girl, roughly in her early 20s, standing alone, wearing all black. She looks disheveled and is sort of crying, maybe. Cav rolls down the passenger window halfway and asks her if she's okay. She seems off. I immediately have awful vibes from her. Four guys stole my purse, she says, with her hands over her face. It had my wallet. I literally lost everything, and I don't have a phone. The weirdest thing about this is that she wasn't crying. She was stretching her words out and whining, but she wasn't crying. 
I said. Okay, we'll call the police for you. Why don't you walk up to the plaza at the main intersection? We'll wait with you for the police. No, she says adamantly. It won't help. I already called the police an hour ago. This is when I started to freak out. She just said she didn't have a phone. She's been standing in the dark for an hour. I thought you didn't have a phone, I said. Uh, I do, but it's dead, she replied back. All of this happening rapid fire, and before I can really mentally get into what's going on, Cav tells her to get in the car so we can help her. I say, walk up to the plaza and we'll help you. Cav unlocks the door and says, no, don't worry, we'll drive you there. The girl has her hands in the front pocket of her hoodie and gets into the car. I'm pissed, fuming. The girl's acting really weird. I remember, at this point, that I have my box cutter on me. I reach down, into my backpack, and I'm rummaging through my stuff to find it. Cav is talking to her, but everything she says is contradictory. She says that she isn't from this area, has no idea where she is, yet she tells us she grew up and lives about six blocks away. As we're driving, she says she wants to go to a particular bar that she could really use a drink. I thought you don't have your wallet or ID, I ask. I keep looking for my box cutter and I'm looking back at her. She has a waxy complexion and looks me in the eyes as if she's looking through me. It gives me the creeps. Cav is incredibly kind to her, the idiot, and keeps saying positive things, trying to get to the bottom of what's going on. While this is happening, I find my box cutter, open it all the way, and hold it in my lap. I turn my back and keep my eyes on her. She tells us she has a boyfriend nearby and asks us to take her there. She and Cav continue to talk, and she says she was kicked out of her parents' house. Her hands still remain in her pocket, and mine remains holding the box cutter. Because of this whole ordeal, We've totally forgotten about Ben. Still watching her, I pull my phone out and call him. I'm explaining to Ben what's happening, and in a matter of seconds, she went from asking us for money and alcohol, and saying weird shit, to just wanting to get out of the car. We did not drop her at her boyfriend's house, but a few streets away in a random neighborhood. We drop her off, and there's silence for a few seconds in the car. Oh my god, Cap says, laughing. She could have robbed us or killed us. Yeah, idiot. I'm 100% certain, at the very least, she was planning to rob us. Looking back, there's so much I would have done differently. We were lucky nothing happened. But I am positive that there was evil in that car that night. For context, I'm now 26, and I met my stalker at 14 to 15. So when I was 14, I decided to take ballroom dance classes. That was kind of normal for teenagers in my generation in my country. There you had to change partners each song, so every girl would dance with every boy. In my group that consists of mostly teens between 14 to 17, there was a really tall, almost 2 meter. 21 year old guy. His name was Philip. We had a nice chat the times we danced, but he seemed weird. And because I was young and naive, and that's how I normally made friends, I told him where I lived when he asked me. So the stalking began. Philip would ride his bike from his home to my home. He would ask if I wanted to spend time outside with him and play. After doing that for a few times, I asked my parents to tell him that I was not home when he would come over. Both my parents and I were very oblivious about his actions for a very long time. At one point in time, the stalking ended for a few weeks, and Philip also didn't come to dance classes. At that time, I became part of a friend group of a boy I fancied. 
Unfortunately, Philip was also friends with the best friend of my boyfriend, so he was also a part of the group. They told me Philip was in a mental hospital. In the span of his stalking, Philip was in a mental hospital multiple times, and every time he was, I was glad because then I had some peace. When I was 16, my family and I had moved because our landlady had thrown us out. So we moved one town over. We lived two streets apart from my stalker. Every time Philip was out of the hospital, he would be at my house. At my father's birthday, he rang the doorbell, and because my family had guests, they told me to open the door. And there he was, looming over me, like a dark, menacing shadow man. I told him to leave, and I tried to close the door, but he blocked it, so I was standing there, afraid begging him to leave. At one time, I even ran inside to get my dad to send him away, but my dad said, he's your friend, so it's your problem. So I went back to the door, and I begged and pleaded with Philip to please leave. At one point, he was crouched in my doorway. After almost two hours, he finally left, and at that point, it was obvious to me that he was a stalker and that he was fixated on me. The next day I sat my parents down and told them that I was afraid of Philip. My dad also apologized to me for putting me in that situation and not helping me. The next time Philip came to my house, my dad was there and told him that I do not want any contact with him. So he left. After a few more incidents like that, he stopped showing up at my door and I thought we got rid of my stalker. But, every time I started to live happily, starting to forget my fear of him, a letter, an email, or a gift showed up and would send me back into my fears. At 20, I was out of school, and to pass the year I had to wait to start my job. I worked in a grade school, in a voluntary after-school care club for grade schoolers. After a month or two, my mom woke me up in the morning and told me to get dressed because she called the cops. Apparently, Philip was again every morning at our door and he always asked for me. My parents didn't tell me so I wouldn't get scared again. Finally, after the cops told Philip three times to leave and he ignored them, they arrested him and he screamed and screamed my name and that he was burning for me and that the cops heard him. My parents and I were standing in the kitchen, listening. The situation was so absurd and so much for me that I started laughing hysterically. We filed a report with the police for stalking and trespassing, but the officers said that they could not do anything because he hadn't hurt me physically. We tried to get a restraining order, but it didn't go through. A week later, Philip had snuck into our garden and like in a movie, he threw rocks at my window. Idiot me opened the window, but didn't see anything until it clicked. I ran downstairs and told my dad that my stalker was in the garden. Philip had made an escape. A week after that, I was in the kitchen cooking when Philip rang the doorbell again, and because we have no way of seeing who is at the door, I opened it, and there he was again telling me that he missed me, saying that he'd peek through the blinds of the windows in the living room the past week to see if I was there. My parents weren't home. If they had been, I would have run to them. But like this, I had to swallow my fear and stand in the doorway, listening to Philip talk until my boyfriend came. After my boyfriend arrived, he told Philip to leave, and he did. Philip mentioned in passing that he now has a girlfriend, after that, I didn't see Philip again for a long time. A friend of mine told me that he was taken by men in white coats because he believed that his mom was possessed by the devil. I was glad. It wasn't until two years later when I got a letter from court. I was a witness and told to attend a case in which Philip assaulted a girl. Apparently, after coming out of the mental hospital, he had a big fight with his girlfriend. He hit her, and because she was so scared, she played dead. 
Philip called an ambulance and the police finally had something against him. After hearing he was admitted again to a mental hospital and I finally got a restraining order, he was ordered to stay at least 30 meters away from our property. I was so glad. The restraining order also implied that if he broke any of the requirements, he would go to jail. So, it was over. Two years ago, I also moved out of my parents' house. I'm telling this story only now because I believe I'm seeing him again. But it can't be. He doesn't know where I live and he also hasn't shown up at my parents' house. But I believe I've seen him when I leave the house. I just need reassurance that it's not him and that I'm safe in my own home. I go to university two hours away by ferry from the mainland where my family lives. Sometimes on the weekends, I would go to visit them, which would require me to take a 23 kilometer bus ride to the ferry terminal. The bus ride was usually very boring and long, so I would try to make the best of it. Where I live, we have double decker buses and I would always sit at the top and listen to music. One Friday, on my way to the terminal, I was at the top level as usual when a man who looked to be about 40 came up to sit. I made note of his presence but didn't think much of him other than that. He looked pretty beat up, shaggy hair, stained brown hoodie, a silver chain on his neck, but I try not to judge. It's important to note at the time, I was 18 years old and I'm a small female. I don't ever want to have to be hyper aware or judgmental but I was brought up to always take note of who's around me, particularly men, just for safety. The man sat multiple rows ahead of me and in the beginning was initially minding his own business. I was just listening to music and looking out the window minding mine. It wasn't until part way into the trip that I noticed he'd moved one row closer to me. Weird, but whatever. Maybe his seat was dirty or something. He then proceeded to move closer and closer until he was in the seat directly in front of me. It's important to know that on the top level of the bus is only him and I. Suffice to say, I was getting uncomfortable. Still giving him the benefit of the doubt, I decided to phone a friend and have a conversation just to break the uncomfortable silence. So I text my friend, SOS and he calls me and starts a normal conversation. It was at this point that the man decides that he wants to start talking to me. I tell my friend to hold on, and I take out one of my earbuds to hear what he's saying. He starts asking me if I know a good place to get a haircut. I say I don't. I start to put my earbuds back in when he asks what a girl like me is doing taking this bus alone. It wasn't late yet, but it was getting dark so maybe he was just concerned for my safety, I don't know. I told him I was going to the ferry terminal. I again try to put my earbuds back in. He continues on, telling me his life story, about how he was in the military, how his kids don't talk to him, showed me his dog tag and told me he rides this bus back and forth every day, just to have something to do. He has no intention of taking the ferry though, He's growing increasingly annoyed that I'm not reciprocating the conversation. He tells me it's quite rude to ignore people when they're just trying to have a friendly conversation. At this point, I'm starting to get quite creeped out. I politely inform him that I'm not trying to ignore him, but I'm on the phone with someone and would like to resume my conversation. This irritates him, and he asks who I'm talking to, to which I respond, a friend. He notices a male name on my phone and makes a weird face. He tells me to hang up, then asks to see my phone to find a hair salon where he can get his hair cut cheaply, which I obviously refuse. I then get up and try to move to the bottom level of the bus so that I'm not secluded with this weirdo upstairs alone anymore. My friend on the phone has no clue what's going on as I collected my stuff and start moving. He tries to tell me it's not my stop yet 
but I ignored him. I go down to the front of the lower level and stand near the bus until we reach the final stop. The man had come down the stairs and seated himself close by, but didn't try to talk to me further. I thought it was over, but no, it wasn't. I reach the terminal, pay for my ticket, and go to the waiting area. You can't enter the waiting area unless you have proof of a ticket purchase. Well, guess who comes down the escalator? Mr. Dogtax himself. My heart sank. There were a couple of people in the waiting area, so I wasn't too worried about my immediate safety, but I was more worried about having to be trapped on a ferry boat with this guy for two hours. He paced up and down the walkway outside the washrooms, repeatedly checking to see if I'd moved, briefly ducking into the men's room and coming back out after a couple of minutes. He goes up and down the escalator a few times and continued to try to catch my eye either smiling or just staring. I'd had enough at this point and started looking for other passengers that I could sit with for security. I see a woman in her mid-forties and my teenage instinct to seek maternal security kicks in. I bring my bag and politely ask this woman if I can sit with her. I quietly explain what was happening and this woman goes full mama bear, bless her soul. She told me she'd noticed the man too and got a bad feeling. She had two daughters around my age. She insisted I sit with her on the ferry too, just in case. The girl sitting across from us in the seating area overheard and offered her support as well. We boarded the ferry together and I didn't notice the man as we boarded. I assumed he had left the terminal as he said he never intended to catch the ferry in the first place. As we're seating on the ferry, my heart drops when I see him coming towards our seating area. The nice mom assures me she'll handle it if he dares approach us, but he notices that I'm not alone anymore and I guess decides to do a lap instead. We later saw him try to bother another young girl, but luckily her boyfriend returned from the food line and the guy took off pretty fast. For the rest of the ferry, he was just sort of lurking, checking in to see if I'd gotten up or left my group. I did not, even though I had to pee really bad. It wasn't worth it. The girl we were with eventually flags down a ferry worker and informs him of this suspicious individual. Dog Tag hightails it to the other side of the vessel. When we reached the other side, the mom insisted on walking me directly to my dad's car in the pickup zone before leaving the terminal herself. And that was the end of it, thankfully. I wish that woman nothing but wonderful things in her life. She was so kind and protective. I genuinely don't know how the evening would have played out without her. I don't know what this man's plan was, but being followed on two forms of transportation is definitely a new one for me. This kind of scares the shit out of me. I moved to Denton about a year and a half ago. I was always told it's pretty safe, and I felt the same when I lived in my first house. When I moved to my new place, I didn't think it would be much different. Actually, I thought it would be safer, since in my last place, my roommates never, I mean never, locked the doors. In the new place, I have a roommate and a big dog, so that makes me feel safer. We live in a good area where there are families around and stuff, but since I've moved here, there have been four different instances where men have come into my house and done something strange. All have occurred at night from 9pm to 3am. Number one, not one has done the same thing. The first one happened about a month into us living here. It was 3am and the doorbell rang. Who would be at my door right now? As I'm walking to the door, I can see and hear the person trying to get in. Me, terrified, I look through the peephole and see the silhouette of a guy that looks like my roommate's ex. I wake her up and tell her. She opens the door a few minutes later, and the guy isn't there anymore. 
She peeps her head out the door and sees some guy inside of my car. She yelled out to him and he sprinted away. The second time, it's 9pm. I'm home alone. Someone rings the door. My lazy ass didn't get up to get it. A couple of minutes later, the doorbell rings again. This time I get up and no one's at the door. I open it and see two men in an SUV pulling into my driveway. They're almost all the way up to the house. Once they see me, they stop the car, put it in reverse and leave. I don't know what they wanted or were gonna do, but it was weird anyway. Instance number three. One night my roommate is home alone. It's 9.30pm, the door rings, she doesn't get it. She thought it must be her Amazon package. They'll just leave it at the door. The door rings again. Confused, she gets up and looks through the peephole. There's a guy with a black ball cap on. He was looking down so she couldn't see his face. Can I help you? She asks. I have your Amazon package. Okay. Do I need to sign anything? No, he says. Okay, you can leave it on the ground. He ends up just standing there for a minute or so. She nervously stares back at him through the peephole, waiting for him to walk away. He eventually walks away. For about an hour after that, our big ass dog kept growling at the door. Another weird thing is that Amazon stops delivering at 9pm. Maybe he was just running late. And number four. The last, but definitely creepiest. This happened last month around 1.30am. I wasn't home, but my roommate was, with her new boyfriend Alex. They're laying in bed, and from the corner of Alex's eye, he sees a pair of eyes in the crack of the blinds, from her window. He gets up and runs outside, sees a grown-ass man in a construction vest, looking through her window. The guy jumps when he sees Alex and grabs our trash cans right next to her window. He pretends to just be a trash guy, kindly taking out our empty trash cans out for us. Didn't know they had night shifts now, on Fridays. So yeah, those are my stories. I've heard there's a man the DPD are looking for. He's forcing himself into women's apartments in Denton. It's sad that I have to live in fear because I'm a target being a woman. It may sound dramatic to many, but after all these experiences I've had, on top of this guy that's been named a serial offender on the loose, I'm terrified to live alone next semester. I've never been scared of that. I'm a pretty tall, heavier woman, and I've grown up with all brothers. I thought I knew how to fight, but now I'm like, could I even help myself? I'm generally a calm, collected person, but this gives me anxiety every time I'm home alone and I hear something. Well anyway, thanks for listening to my story. If any of you have experienced anything like this around here, let me know that I'm not alone. I'm a guy. When I was 16, I had my first job as a pizza delivery boy. I'm 19 now, so it was about 3 years ago. My boss told me that I had to go up to floor 7 and door 59 or 60, one of those two, in a middle building. I remember there being 3 buildings. So, I went to the middle building and took the lift to the 7th floor. I knocked on the door, waited a minute. And as I was waiting, I heard a man yelling, You got this, over and over again for like 10 seconds. He opens the door and I said, Pizza for Mr. Anderson. I tell him his total. He looked drunk as, white and dark grey messy beard, smells of cigarettes and alcohol. After I read the total, he said, Come on in and I'll grab you the money. Sir, I'm not allowed to do that and I will not allow that to happen, I replied. He then repeated, No, no, come on in, it's fine. I knew he was drunk as hell because his voice was all slurry 
and some words didn't come out right, but I could still manage to make out what he was trying to say. Anyway, I said for the last time, Sir, I can't go into your apartment. Plus, I'm a child. He then said, Fine, but know I'm a nice guy and won't hurt you. He then passed me the money. I handed him the pizza, and whilst he went into his apartment with his door wide open, I swear I saw someone looking at me from the sofa. Not him, but another guy. Anyway, he handed me the pizza and I took the lift. I went back to my workplace, which was literally across the road. I couldn't stop thinking about how creepy that was. I'm 17, but look much younger. Today I was at the grocery store and went to get some food from the salad bar and sat down. As I'm eating, shoveling food into my mouth at the speed of light, some guy with a food container sits down across from me without saying anything. The table was pretty small, so it was definitely weird that he just did that without asking. He was maybe 32 to 35 years old. 5 foot 10 ish, and wasn't unattractive or anything, but I was immediately on my guard. He had this weird vibe. I don't know how to explain it, other than it was exactly what you picture when you hear stranger danger. As soon as he sits down across from me, he says, So, is your mom around? Now, my mom was doing the grocery shopping, and I thought it was weird how he knew I was there with my mom. I mean, why not my dad or grandma or something? I realized he must have been watching me earlier when I was with my mother. I just replied, yeah, she's coming, as casually as possible. I didn't look up from my phone. I could tell he was kind of confused because I didn't say anything else and continued scrolling on my phone like everything was normal. After a minute or two, he says, this food reminds me of when I would go to ski camp which was really random and weird, so I just said, yeah, it's pretty good, while on my phone and continued ignoring him. At this point, he was, I think, a bit confused on how to proceed with conversation. For a while, he was just staring at me creepily as I continued eating. I tried to make myself look as gross and unappealing as possible by chewing with my mouth open, slurping my water, and stuff like that. I think he was beginning to regret coming over to me. I was getting a really weird vibe from him, so I played a sound on my phone to make it sound like it was ringing and pretend to answer it and talk to my mom. While I'm on the phone, he would not stop staring at me. He eventually asks, what grade are you in? And I ignored him. Right around then, by pure coincidence, my mom comes over and we get ready to leave. She was talking to someone on her cell phone, so I couldn't tell her right away what was going on. But we got ready to go, and she accidentally dropped her change. Immediately, this guy lets out the most hysterical, maniacal, clown-like cackle I've ever heard. And he's rocking back and forth on the chair, laughing like a lunatic. My mom didn't even notice because she was on the phone. As we walk out the door, I turn around, and he's still laughing loudly to himself at the table, banging on the table with his fists, gothing like I've never seen anyone do before. That's when I realized he was utterly insane. I got out of there real quick, and I hope I never see that guy again. For context, I live in the USA, in a pretty well-populated apartment complex, with my building right across the parking lot from the leasing office and the tennis court. About five years ago, the office installed some fencing on the far side of the tennis court to be used as a dog park. On the other side of the dog park is just a big empty field that borders with a different apartment complex, maybe 20 yards away. Okay. 
so I recently adopted a dog. She's an older pup who alternates between sleeping for hours and being so hyperactive that she spins in circles just to entertain herself. I take her on walks three times a day and we always go to the park. I adopted a dog pretty recently, so I've been making use of the dog park pretty regularly. She absolutely loves running around the park so we usually spend about 15 to 20 minutes there before going home. Now, I have an unusual schedule, so our last walk doesn't happen until 2am. This has never been a problem for us, until lockdown happened and my state issued a shelter-in-place order. As a result, the lights that used to illuminate the tennis court and dog park have been shut off. I still took my dog to the park and I brought a flashlight along, one night, we finished our walk and went to the park like usual. My dog had been acting a bit strange, pulling hard on her leash and making grumbling sounds. But once we were in the park, she was running around like normal. However, as I was standing there, huddled in my coat with the hood up because it's cold and a bit rainy, my dog abruptly stopped dead. I figured she saw a rabbit or something in the field so I turned on the flashlight to look around, and there, in the field, there's a man. He's pretty far off, but clearly walking towards us through the grass. I was a little spooked already, because it's 2am, raining and freezing cold, but the man doesn't seem to be wearing a coat or hat. I immediately decide it's time to leave. I went down the length of the park to grab my dog, I hooked on her leash and jogged to the gate to leave. Once we left the park, my dog went ballistic, barking wildly and yanking so hard on her leash that she was choking herself. I turned and could barely make out the silhouette of the man bobbing up and down like he was running after us. I didn't even bother with the leash. I picked up my dog and ran for my building, terrified that she'd claw herself over my shoulder to try and get to the man. Once I got home, I bolted the door and wedged a chair under the knob. It was probably a dumb thing to do, but I felt safer knowing it was there. I curled up on the couch in my living room, watching the window and praying no one comes up, while my dog stood still in front of the door, growling every time the wind blew or something shifted outside. I told my boyfriend and roommate what happened but neither of them seemed as spooked about it as I was. I don't know what was up with that guy. I have so many questions about the whole incident, but I'm too scared to consider what might have happened if the guy had been closer to the park when my dog noticed him. Or maybe I'm just paranoid and he was coming over to say hi at 2 a.m. in the freezing rain during a lockdown. Anyway... I'm scared to go out alone at night, so my boyfriend goes with me to walk the dog. We haven't seen the guy since, but I can't shake off the deep sense of unease that crawls up my spine whenever I think back on it. This was over 20 years ago, but still creepy. I was at an amusement park with some of my friends, and as I'm waiting in line for the roller coaster, I see a guy that has a t-shirt on that says, 68 and I owe you one. I giggled as I read it. He looks me in the face, we acknowledge each other, and that's that. I don't even think we exchanged words. The next day, I'm at home with my roommate, and my roommate says, Hey, uh, you have a visitor. I go upstairs from my room and see these two guys in my house that I don't even recognize. Yes, they've been invited in. Innocently enough, as I'm sure that my roommate didn't know that the guy was a stalker. I was so puzzled that I had to ask who they were, and also where we met. The guy says, Remember yesterday? I saw you at the park. I ask him how he knew where I lived, and he brazenly admits that he followed me home. So, now he and his friend are in my house. I'm feeling really uncomfortable. 
I mustered up the courage to politely tell him and his friend to leave and to never come back. Luckily my roommate was there, who was a male, so I felt like I had some backup. But then he was the one who let these fools in. They left peacefully, probably embarrassed. Fortunately, I never saw either one of them again, but I was on high alert status for the longest time after that. At my apartment building, it's all street parking. Tonight, as I was pulling in and parked, I noticed that there was this man walking the opposite direction from me, but then we made eye contact, and he immediately turned around and walked in my direction. At first I thought it was strange, but then he started crossing the street and making a beeline for me. He wasn't saying anything at all, so I don't think he wanted money or directions. It still freaked me out so I frantically tried grabbing my keys out of my purse and peeled out of there. What freaked me out though was that he was close enough to get to my car at that point that I made crystal clear eye contact and he looked pissed. So I drive off and circle around. I don't see the guy anywhere but decided to circle around again and look really carefully. Once again, Looking all around the sidewalks and side street, he's not walking around. I start getting out of my car and see this guy coming out of an area where there's a bunch of bushes. I guess that's where he'd been hiding, and he again beelines for me. At this point, I've actually been on the phone with a really good friend of mine, who at that point says he'll drive over. Said friend looks around and walks me into my apartment where I'm currently inside now and safe. But seriously, what was that all about? He didn't say anything threatening to me, so I don't think I can call 911. But I do think I'll try the non-emergency number when I calm down. Stay safe out there, folks. This happened a few years ago, but I sometimes still think about her. I'm earning my wage through college by performing in cabaret shows in semi-big cities. My parents help me out from time to time, but it is enough to buy groceries and pay bills. Also, I don't really have a filter in what I tell people, just in case you're wondering why I told the woman anything at all. I was on my way to the train station to take the train a few towns over for one such cabaret show, and I was in a bus at the time. I was listening to music on my phone and had my earplugs in when the bus stopped at my station. There was a middle-aged woman, I'd say maybe in her 50s, immediately at the door outside to get in, and I felt her looking at me. Okay, it happens. I have a clothing style that is unique enough to earn me looks from time to time. When the bus door opened, I got out and the woman turned with me, tapping my shoulder. She told me her name was Leslie. Excuse me, she said. Yes, I replied, taking out my earbuds. I just wanted to say you have such a unique style and it really stands out. I love it. You look like you're really creative, she said. She was seemingly really genuine, and I was pretty happy about the compliment. I didn't really think about the fact that Leslie was about to get onto the bus, but then didn't as she was talking to me now. Oh, that's so sweet of you, thank you. And yes, I earn my wage doing cabaret, so you're kind of right. Oh, that's so interesting. Gotta keep an eye out for posters here in town then she said. Yes, I'm on stage here quite often. In two months, the town over, for example. Also tonight, but it's the other town over. Oh, sounds like you're about to have a great evening, she replied. Yes, I am. The people are wonderful. Then I'm coming with you, she told me. Now hold on, wasn't she just on the way somewhere? This was also when I realized that she didn't get onto the bus I got off of, and that this bus had already driven off. 
Uh, weren't you about to go somewhere? Yes, to my friend's birthday, but I'll cancel. This sounds way more fun. Wait a minute. She had some place to be and just randomly decided to cancel her plans and come out with me. Onto the train, with a person less than half her age and drive three towns over. Where, by the way, there was no way for her to come home afterwards. I had a place to sleep there for the night, but she wouldn't have. You won't be able to come here afterwards. There's no train that late at night. I have a place to sleep, and she stared silent. She looked as if she started thinking, and I thought that she changed her mind for a second, but then she smiled again. It's fine. I, uh, have a son living there. I don't exactly know what she said there anymore, but I know that it was something to that effect, and that I immediately thought she was lying. At this point, I was weirded out immensely, but still not freaking out. I started walking off since I had to get a subway still. Leslie took this as a sign of me agreeing and came with me. I know she was talking the whole way to the subway and that she was walking pretty slowly. I didn't have to rush off to the station. I was pretty early in fact, wanting to grab dinner on the way, which I mentally wrote off at this point. But the way she held me back was by linking arms with me and holding on tight. I was freaking out at this point, but trying my hardest to stay calm. Whenever I was asked a question about myself, I was lying now. In my head, I was making plans to say I wanted to grab lunch, sitting her down at McDonald's and making a break for it. But Leslie beat me to an opportunity to bail. Sitting at the subway station, there was a pretty well-known homeless person of our town. We'd never talked, but I knew his face and he'd always been polite. Leslie, apparently, did know him and got distracted immediately, letting go of my arm. Oh, hi, John. How are you? You doing good? Oh, hi. I'm doing my best, but stuff is shitty at the moment. Oh, you always say that. It's like I always tell you. You gotta. I didn't stay around to hear the conversation and started jogging, then running, inside the train station. I didn't want to stop for dinner anymore, afraid that Leslie would find me again, so I immediately got the train. It would be heading off in 15 minutes, which freaked me out even more since she would have plenty of time to still get inside. So I did what I thought was best and hid in the train toilet until it drove off. Then, and only then, I got out and sat down. I had to change trains once and felt watched the entire time, but Leslie was gone. She didn't appear at the town over and at the cabaret show. I told the story to my colleague who called my best friend, who both helped me calm down. I never saw Leslie again, and today, I think she might just have been lonely or confused, but I don't care to find out. In September 2018, I was visiting San Francisco and was walking through Fisherman's Wharf. It was really busy. There were a lot of people and I was just passing the entrance to Pier 39 when a man dressed entirely in black stepped out a few feet ahead and started walking directly towards me. I didn't think much of it at first until another man appeared out of nowhere to the side of him and both seemed about to corner me. A really weird thing was that both men were wearing latex gloves. Obviously, I was confused. I turned around and walked straight off in the opposite direction. It was weird, but I didn't give it much more thought. Fast forward a week later. I just returned to San Francisco from a trip and was once again around Pier 39 with a couple of girls I'd met out there. And at this particular moment, we just spotted another couple of people from our group. It's difficult to explain, but at the exact moment we greeted the other guys we knew, another person appeared directly beside me. 
wrapped an arm around my friend and I and said, Hey, let's get a selfie, while snapping a picture of us on his phone. I quickly covered my face, but they got a complete picture of my friend's face. When I turned around to look at the person, it was one of the guys who had tried to stop me a week earlier, again dressed in all black. To be honest, I was completely freaked out by this experience, and after we'd gotten some dinner in the area, I told my friends we'd have to get an Uber back to the hostel rather than walking because I had a really bad feeling about that encounter. I'd wanted to call the police actually, but no one else seemed to understand why I was so scared. To this day, I do wonder, did we narrowly avoid being trafficked? I can't think what else would have been going on, but thankfully, nothing else came of it. A few years ago, about 2019, I was riding the bus one night to get home. There was a guy on the bus that was a little disheveled and dirty reeked of alcohol and generally acting weird. I was sitting in the back and he sat near me and tried to talk to me. I was polite at first. I ride the bus at night a lot so a drunk homeless guy does not bother me and I have no problem making small talk with a stranger on the bus. Plus, I'm used to there being one or two sketchy people on the bus considering the route and the fact it's late at night. When he tried to get flirty, I politely told him I wasn't interested and put my earphones back in and ignored him. He got a little frustrated and even said some vulgar things, but I couldn't really hear him so it was fine. It's not my first rodeo being in that kind of situation and while it is uncomfortable and there's nothing okay about that sort of behavior, I rarely feel threatened. Most of the time they're harmless, all bark and no bite, and I'm a big girl as in tall and overweight, and I know basic self-defense and always have an exit strategy when in scenarios where I don't feel safe. When people get like that on the bus, I find most of the time ignoring them and acting like I'm not phased is enough for them to get bored and find something else to do. I only engage if they get in my face or start harassing other passengers, especially other women, kids, and seniors or anyone who appears vulnerable, because I will not tolerate that, and the bus drivers usually don't put up with that either if it escalates enough. Anyway, this random drunk homeless guy would have been just one of many random drunk homeless guys if it weren't for what happened next. So, my stop is coming up. I'm looking forward to going home. I'm exhausted and so ready to get to bed. I pull the cord to indicate that I want to get off at the next stop, and the guy gets up and walks to the front to talk to the driver, then laughs loudly. I don't think much of it, except I'm a little wary and thinking, please don't tell me we're getting off at the same stop. As the bus slows down, I'm waiting at the back door to be let off at my stop. Instead of opening the back door, he opens the front door and the guy gets off. I ask the driver to open the back door, and I see him shake his head in the mirror. And annoyed, I walk to the front to get off there, but he closes the door before I can get off and starts driving. Angry, I say, what the hell, that's my stop, and the driver replies, sorry, but I can't in good conscience let you off at the same stop as that guy, either get off at the next one or wait until we get to a transit station and take a bus going the other way. Not getting it, I ask. Why? Because of what he said to me, he says. I ask what he said, and the driver just says, Nothing I would like to repeat, ever. I'm so sorry, but just trust me. The driver actually looked shaken, and considering the tone of his voice and the look on his face, as frustrated and anxious as I was to get home, I trusted him and took his word for it. I caught another bus going the other way at the next terminal 
It watched the driver radio dispatch to get some peace officers and transit security to patrol the area near that stop. They were parked in the parking lot near the stop when I finally got off. I was extra paranoid and on high alert as I walked a couple of blocks to my apartment that night, fortunately without further incident. I never saw that guy again, and I'm okay with that. To this day, I wonder what exactly he said to the driver. It bugs me not knowing, but at the same time, maybe it's better that way. Either way, the implications are enough to have freaked me out. A few years ago, I used to live in the apartments across the street from a grocery store. I worked nights and needed to get a few groceries after work in the AM. If I didn't need many things, i just walk instead of drive. This was one such occasion. It was early enough, I'd say 8am-ish. I'm browsing the store. I grabbed a really nice measuring cup, sort of like an impulse buy. Toward the end of my shopping, I grabbed the last few items. I passed this same man at least twice. He would pass me and dip into the aisle right behind the aisle I would go in. The last thing I needed was milk, which was at the back of the store. Again, I passed the guy. On my way to the checkout stands, I decided not to get the measuring cup. Here comes the guy again, going into the aisle right behind the aisle I went in. The measuring cup was at the front of the aisle, and I was there no more than 10 seconds before I was out of the aisle, going to the checkout stands, and the guy was out of his aisle and passed me again. I continued on to the self-checkouts that were currently full, so I stood in line. You know how people talk about gut feelings? Well, I suddenly felt extremely sick, like I was going to vomit and even got a cold sweat. I turned around and saw the same man right behind me. His basket looked empty or only had a couple of things in it. I was too panicked to really tell. People were lined up behind him and his self-checkout became available. I glanced at my shopping basket and very audibly said, Oh shoot, looks like I forgot something. And I went off back into the store in a hurry. I'm pretty sure it would have been out of place for him to suddenly follow me, but I don't know exactly what he did. I didn't look back. I circled around the entire store and came back to the checkout lines that were empty now. I quickly scanned all of my items and rushed out of the store among the small crowd of other shoppers. I saw a brown paneled van parked near the entrance. I'm sure it was the same guy, but I could have just been paranoid. He was looking down. I'm guessing at a phone. I ducked behind a different parked car and almost sprinted back to my apartment. To this day, that is the most intense gut feeling I have ever had. A couple of years before the pandemic started, a friend of mine, Mary, introduced me to a guy. He wasn't really my type, but she's one of those people who turns into a matchmaker when she's in a relationship, so I agreed to go on a couple of dates with him so she wouldn't feel as worried that I might die alone and so on. The first time I met up with this guy, it was a group date with Mary, her boyfriend Tim, and another friend and her boyfriend. This guy Mary was trying to set me up with, Joe, seemed alright. We talked, traded jokes, that sort of thing. I was comfortable with him because I wasn't interested in him. At the end of the night, he asked if we could meet up again sometime, and I agreed. Afterwards, I told Mary, and she was delighted. Her boyfriend Tim was not very happy though. Tim's training to become a doctor. He's a very smart guy, and my friends and I greatly value his opinion. There's something off about Joe, Tim said. I agreed, and Tim and I talked it over for a bit. 
but neither of us had seen or felt anything worse than a bit of weirdness. Be careful with Joe, Tim said when I hugged my friends goodnight at the train station. Joe and I texted for a couple of weeks before we met up, and those exchanges only cemented my first impressions. I just wasn't into him, and something about him was off. He began to reveal a side of him that was less friendly as well. He had very low self-esteem and was always looking for reassurance. At first, that wasn't so bad, but it turned toxic pretty quickly. He seemed to get off on that sort of attention. I didn't really want to go out with him again, but Mary was really invested in the idea of Joe and I getting together. Mary is a sweetheart, but she doesn't really have any instincts. Occasionally, that gets me, or someone else in our friend group, into trouble. Mary's cute, and everyone wants to make her happy. She has good intentions, but she has no instincts. She can't sense danger, and sometimes she drags people into dangerous situations unwittingly. I was hoping this was not going to be one of those episodes. Anyway, Mary was excited about the next date and Joe kept asking when I was going to meet him, so I invited Joe to an event my hobby club was holding. I figured that was safe, because we'd be surrounded by people I knew well. The evening was alright. Joe wasn't as creepy in person as he had been over text messages lately. After the event, we walked along the river for a bit, on a walkway crowded with families and tourists. We parted ways at a busy train station. I figured I'd just gently push this thing further into the realm of platonic, and everything would be alright. Then, on one night a couple of weeks later, Joe called me, and he was going to end himself. I freaked out and tried to calm him down. I stayed up all night talking to him, from when he called around 10pm until the sun rose. Every time he calmed down, I tried to say goodbye, but he kept saying that if I hung up, he would do it. So I stayed on the line, talking him down over and over again. Something about the situation felt wrong, but what else was I going to do? I wouldn't let anyone do that. As I sat on my patio, watching the sunrise over the forest behind my house, he finally let me off the hook. He said, thank you. And for a moment, I felt that I'd done the right thing. Maybe I just saved a life. Then, Joe said, with a voice full of glee, that was the best night of my life, and hung up. I was stunned. What the hell? Had this psycho really kept me up all night, knowing full well the next day was going to be busy for me? just to get off on the attention. I decided there was no way in hell I was ever going to see this guy again. I told Mary what had happened, and she was very apologetic. She agreed that Joe was a complete psycho, said she was sorry she had set me up with him, and told me to call the cops if he came to my house. I didn't think he would. Joe didn't have my address, and neither did the person Mary had met him through. I don't give out my address to anyone but trustworthy family members because I don't want my abusive ex-step-parent to find me. That precaution probably saved me from a much worse experience. As it was, when I broke it off with Joe, he took it pretty badly. He threatened to end it again, so I messaged Mary and she contacted her and Joe's mutual friend, who kept an eye on Joe for a few days. Not long after that, I started getting creepy phone calls after midnight. They were often at 2 or 3 a.m. The caller never said anything, just breathed heavily down the line. It was so unnerving. I blocked the number every time. Joe must have gone through four or five numbers before he switched his phone to a private number to get around the caller ID. I couldn't block him anymore. I didn't know what to do. For more than a year and a half after Joe got a private number, I was forced to answer every one of his calls. A whole branch of my family had private numbers because one of them was scammed a while back. 
Luckily, the police caught the scammer and they didn't end up losing any money. But unfortunately for me, that meant that if I received a call from a private number at night, I had to pick it up just in case something had happened to a member of my family. On one particular night, my phone went off at 3 a.m. It was a private number. I knew it was probably Joe. I was staring at my phone, trying to figure out what to do. I never let these calls go to voicemail, because apart from the whole family issue, even if he didn't know where I lived, he certainly knew where Mary and Tim's house was. I was afraid that if I didn't play along, he might go after my friends. The phone was still ringing. I reached out to swipe up and answer the call, then paused. I had an idea. Back when I was in high school, my dad would sometimes call early in the morning. If no one else was in the house, I'd be woken up, stumble over to the phone half awake, and answer in a slightly croaky voice. I have a low voice for a woman, so every time I answered the phone like that, my dad would mistake me for my brother, John. I realized that I could use that. I cleared my throat, dropped my voice as low as I could, and then said, Hello? I was delighted with the result. It sounded exactly like John. It was uncanny. It made me a little sad, really. John died about a year before I met Joe. It was a bit of a jolt, hearing something so close to his voice again, after almost three years. I quickly grabbed my phone before it could ring out, tapped the answer button, then said that deep, Hello? Again. This time there was no creepy breathing, only silence. I said another deep, Hello? After a moment's pause, Joe hung up on me. I was overjoyed. Every other time, I'd had to hang up on him. No matter what I said before, he'd always wanted as much of my time as he could get. I let myself feel a flicker of hope. Maybe I was free. It's been over a year now, and it looks like I'm free of Joe. I haven't gotten any creepy calls since I pulled out my John impersonation, and I can only guess that Joe thinks I've changed my number or given it to someone else. Joe never met John, so when I said hello, he probably just heard a young man's voice. If John was still here, I know he'd approve. If I could tell him now, he'd be very happy to know a part of him could still protect me, even so many years after he was gone. I will probably spend my life looking over my shoulder, Every time someone attacks the bins on my street, I worry it might be Joe. Every time a beat-up car passes me as I walk to the bus stop or train station, I worry it might be him. I've heard from mutual friends that Joe has said some awful things about me. He's told some people he slept with me, which he didn't, of course. Who would sleep with someone that creepy? Worse than that, Joe and Mary's mutual friend it said that Joe had told her he wants to kill me. Mary and I were horrified by that. The friend has since told him I've moved to another city, so that might be enough. She's very close to him, distantly related actually, so he believes what she tells him. When I'm done with my studies, I'm going to move across the country. Until then, I'm keeping my head down. My campus and Joe's are a 30-minute train ride apart. That's nowhere near far enough away, but it will have to do. There is one positive thing that has come out of this. Mary is now completely cured of any desire to play matchmaker. For reference, I'm a 16-year-old male. I have kind of longish red dyed hair and wear eyeliner, and was wearing all black denim at the time. I got off the bus and parted ways with my friends and made for the bus station to go home. After I stood in the queue, I got tapped on the shoulder and I turned. It was this mid to late 20s guy. 
When I took my earphones out because he started talking to me, I thought he was asking me for directions or something. He proceeded to tell me I was cute and tell me that when he saw me, he sprinted after me. His tone sounded off. I'm not exactly sure what it was about it, but it was like he was oblivious as to how creepy that was. He then asked to exchange various social medias, to which I said I had not. He also asked my name and if I was from around there, to which I gave false answers for both. I said I only came there to see a friend. He asked how old I was, to which I replied 16, hoping it'd make him back off. It didn't. He asked me if I was single, and I said no. He then asked if I had a boyfriend, and I said I had a girlfriend to put it across that I don't swing that way. He kept following me up in the line, and the only reason I kept talking to him was because I didn't want to turn my back to him. I mean it when I say there was something badly off about him. I didn't want to end up getting touched or hurt or anything. I'd rather shoot the shit and come across as friendly to avoid him maybe getting aggressive and to elevate the situation. Fortunately, as I was about to get on the bus home, he walked away. Maybe he thought I'd make a scene if he tried getting on with me. Maybe he caught somebody watching, or maybe he caught on that he was being a creep. I don't know, but I'm just so glad he didn't try to get onto the bus with me. The last thing I wanted was him knowing where I went around. If he confessed to sprinting after me, I wouldn't put it past him to do the same when I got off the bus, hypothetically if he did manage to get on with me. This happened to me last year. I'm a 19-year-old guy. My friend just bought a new house so he decided to have a housewarming. I had a great time, and at just after midnight, I decided it was time to go. I tried all the taxi services in our area, and I either got a no answer or told I would have to wait at least an hour. I live in rural Wales, UK, and we don't have Uber. I'm a student and work weekends, so I had to get home soon as I had work in the morning, so I decide I'll walk home. My phone says 41 minutes, and I was in a drunken state, so I say my goodbyes and refuse any offer of company or calling another friend, and set off. I was lit but not too drunk, easily followed the directions on my phone and got about 30 minutes in when I came across an alley I had to take. I sped up as I walked through, as it was very dark, but I got through and felt silly for being a bit spooked. As I carried on walking, I reached a long pathway and noticed a figure in the distance. I couldn't tell if they were walking toward me or just standing still, but as soon as I got closer, I could see them just standing and smoking a cigarette. I kept to the other side of the path and walked past. As I carried on walking, I felt a little uneasy and looked back, and the guy was now walking behind me. I quickened up and hoped to gain distance, but this was a straight path and he kept pace. I knew I was getting close to an area I was familiar with from walking my dog, and I knew I would be in a well-lit residential area soon. Finally, I reached a crossroads and prayed he would go the other way, but he turned the same way as me. This continued all the way until I was just two streets away from the one I live on. I decided I had to lose him, so the next corner, I took off as fast as I could. I'm a fit guy, so I managed to get to the next street very quickly, and up the last alley into the street I live on, before looking back and noticing he was out of sight. So I quickly ran to my house and got inside. My parents were in bed, thankfully, so the lights were out and I took a breath. I began to calm down as my dog ran to greet me. I gave her a pat and went into the living room, but I kept the lights off as I planned to head straight to my bedroom after grabbing a drink. I walked from the hall and into the kitchen as my dog Faith followed, but as I took a drink from the refrigerator, she turned from me and looked at the front door. 
she slanted her head before slowly walking towards it. I swear, I got the creepiest feeling. Like my whole body froze as I saw a figure through the small frosted glass panel in the door. I slammed the door to the refrigerator and hid out of view. I was terrified. Faith began barking and jumping at the door. I stayed hidden out of view as she shuffled around, pawing at the door. Suddenly my dog charged into the kitchen, still barking. She ran past me to the kitchen door and leapt up. I ran into the hall and saw my dad at the top of the stairs. He asked what Faith was barking for, and I blurted a guy followed me home. He charged down the stairs, and Faith was still going crazy in the kitchen. My dad marched into darkness as I followed, but again, Faith ran past us, back to the front door. My dad went into the front garden as I held Faith back, and he saw the front gate rattle. We went to it and looked up and down the street, but we saw nothing. He decided to stay up, and I went to bed. The next morning, in the garden, we found a rusty knife. It was dirty and had black tape all around the handle. There were also two stab marks on the back door. My dad refused to report it to the police, which I think is insane. Somebody clearly tried to break in, but he insists they won't come back. The whole situation really played on my mind. It really creeped me out, and I can safely say... I'll call someone for a lift home next time. Today I decided to visit my city's public library. I didn't have a specific plan in mind of what I wanted to do there initially, so I just did some browsing. However... Once I moved onto the second floor of the building, I noticed that they had a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle set up on one of the tables. So, I made my plan to spend time putting the puzzle together for a bit, and then check out a book I saw earlier once I was ready to leave. The puzzle had already been put together in bits and pieces by others, but it was nowhere near finished. I spent maybe 20 minutes or so working on it when this old guy came up and started talking to me. It was very hard for me to understand him, but he said he wanted to sit down and watch me do the puzzle, so I let him. The man seemed friendly enough. We exchanged names and I gave him a fake one, just because I'm a very cautious person, and he started to ask me about what kind of movies and music I like, that kind of thing. He also asked me what my high school major was, or just what I like to do in school. It's at this point I feel I should mention that I both look and sound much younger than I really am. I'm currently in my third year of college, but many people mistake me for a teenager at first. As I continued working on the puzzle and talking to this guy, I felt more freaked out by the minute. I'm not sure if it was just a gut feeling or whatever, but something seemed off about him. Between how old he was and the way I could barely understand him, I just didn't feel comfortable continuing conversation with him. I did my best to hide it, but he could definitely sense how I really felt, because he kept asking me if he was making me feel uncomfortable. Me, being the absolute doormat I am, told him that he wasn't. Finally, right around the time I was about to make up some excuse to get out of there, the man essentially asked me for my phone number. His exact wording was that he wanted to call me, but I don't think that makes much of a difference. I apologized and declined, saying that I don't really just give my number out to anyone. He seemed extremely disappointed and, without another word, he got up and walked away. I took this as my chance to go downstairs, grab the book I wanted, and get the bus home. As I'm waiting for my bus to arrive, I thought I saw the strange guy again, so I pretended to be walking to another stop instead, just in case he tried to follow me or something. I don't know if it was actually him, but if it was, he didn't attempt to talk to me again. He just walked right by me. 
I got on the right bus to go home once I couldn't see him anymore. So, what do you all think? Did I unintentionally hurt some old guy's feelings? Or did he have other intentions by trying to get my number? I honestly feel like I've dodged a bullet, considering I look like a minor and never told the man my age. But I'd love to hear some feedback. On June 3rd, 2016, I had a social media event. I was an Instagram influencer, and the event was a golf tournament. I posted on social to ask followers to come. So when he showed up, it didn't surprise me. Sure, the tickets were $250, but for some reason, that didn't click with me. It was a drinking event as well, and he showed up at least tipsy but having a good time. He was also an Instagram model who I knew online. He asked me out on a date for after the tournament. I was a single mom, and because of the event, my parents were watching my kid until the next day. I said sure. We went off on the date, went to a bar and grabbed food. The man was handsome, but mostly charming as hell. We had a beer, and then in his car he offered some weed. I rarely smoke, but decided what the hell. We hotboxed, then went off to a bar. He was friendly with everyone and made me laugh quite a few times. Then off to the liquor store for more alcohol, and finally to his house. I was drunk and high, so it was easy to sleep with me. He had a bunk bed, and I remember him being on the top, and being very selfish and aggressive, and me being scared. I didn't stop him out of fear. He had driven and my car was still at the golf tournament location and we were too far for me to afford an Uber back to my car. The next morning I went to the restroom and afterward noticed a long pipe coming from the toilet after I flushed. He came out upset because it was to water the weed him and his roommate were growing. I didn't know. I was still too drunk and high for it to click. I apologized deeply and was scared. We came downstairs and I looked at the walls and decor for the first time. Knives and weapons were used as decorations all over the house. I waited for him to have breakfast and drive me back to my car, trying not to show panic. In the car, I knew I needed an excuse that wouldn't hurt his feelings. I told him I had a blast and was bummed because I really like him but my child's father passed away when he was one, and I can't have CPS take him away because I'm around someone growing weed. I told him I didn't care about the weed and didn't want him to change, so it was a bummer. I let him make out with me one last time as he dropped me off. I was shaking as I drove off because of the vibes. The very next day, after he dropped me off, he met a girl that was 10 years our junior and she was an 18-year-old mini-me. He dated her for three weeks. She dumped him, and he stalked her like crazy. So much so that he was arrested a few times. In September of the same year, he gets out of jail the last time and heads to a bar, meets a girl there, and takes her home. He ends up murdering her, chopping up her body, cutting her heart out, and setting it on fire. He's currently serving life for his crime, and I get flashbacks all the time. For a bit of backstory, I was working at a small chain motel in the Midwest as a night auditor. My hours were normally 11pm to 8am. With those kinds of hours and being a woman, I'm bound to have some weird stories. The scariest time I've ever had working there happened within my first month. So, it was a little before my shift started, and because I was single and 22, I was on Tinder before work. I match with this guy who seems cool, a little goth and alternative, and into Ouija boards and tarot, which is my type. So I was hyped at the time. 
We talk for a bit, and I tell him I have to go to work. We say goodbye. Now, that night was my first night off training, so I was running the motel by myself for nine hours. I was already a little nervous, but then this vaguely familiar guy comes up to the front desk and asks for me by name. In my head, I've got red flags blaring at me because this guy is weird. Not by looks, but just by the vibe. I tell him yes, that's me, and he explained that he was the guy from Tinder, and he saw that I was less than a mile away, so he went out to see if I was possibly working at this hotel. That's right, this guy was staying where I worked. Red flag number two. I stay behind the comfort of my desk for two hours because this guy won't stop talking to me. Mostly about how his ex left him and how he beat people up and how he wanted to bang me. Needless to say, I was uncomfortable and this hadn't happened to me before in a work environment. So I did not know what to do. He finally decided to go to bed at 2 to 3 in the morning and I take a much needed smoke break. I go outside, and right after I spark up, guess who shows up? The creepy guy. I snooped a bit on his account. He was a painter and was doing work locally, so he wasn't from here. He tells me about where he's from, and keeps getting closer and closer to me. He asks me if he can smoke weed, which I said yes so he'd get away from me. I showed him where the cameras weren't and he pulled me in, smelled my neck, and started to grab my ass. I swiftly hit him and told him he better not touch me again. I threw my cigarettes on the ground and grabbed my phone to call my boss before going inside. The creepy guy rips the phone from my hand and proceeds to text himself. Now he had my number. First thing he sends me is a grotesque picture of his extremely body-modded nether region. I've seen some of those in my day, but that was like nothing I'd ever seen. Then came the creepy BDSM adult images, with captions like, I can't wait to do this to you. You know what room I'm in. Now I'm already freaking out, and I don't know why I didn't call the cops. And my boss wasn't answering. So there's me in the back office having the panic attack of my life when I get one more video. Why I clicked on it, I'll never know. I refuse to say what I saw in detail, but it was a snuff adult video. Very violent, very sexual. I then locked myself in the back room, cried, and waited a few hours before proceeding to make hotel breakfast. The text went on for a few days until I'd had enough. I got the balls to tell my boss. He immediately kicked out the creepy guy and banned him from our hotel. His company is not even allowed to book with that hotel anymore. In hindsight, I should have called the police, but I was too scared. I'm so mentally and emotionally drained from this whole situation. Some more important things to know before I get into it. I'm a 24-year-old trans guy who's a homosexual and aromantic, and even though I don't flaunt my sexuality, I don't exactly hide it either. I've made a couple of posts on Facebook stating this, so I don't know how she didn't know. She herself is a 23-year-old woman and I've known her for almost two years. Anyway, this takes place the day after Valentine's Day, and I'm getting off work at about 3.30ish, when Tiffany asks me if I wanted to get dinner with her at a specific steakhouse that I really like. So I join her at the restaurant, thinking we were just hanging out because I had no reason to believe that a lady I was friends with for two years would want to date an obviously gay man. I ordered chicken strips and water, and she ordered a lot of food. Like a lot. During the whole meal, she tried to share her food with me, and I kept refusing because I just wanted chicken strips. We discussed a few topics and some weird ones. The weird ones were asking about past relationships and 
experiences with others. I vaguely mention that I haven't dated in a few years and usually just end up getting my needs met with a stranger. I kept it fake as we were in a restaurant and even though I'm open about my experiences with friends, I don't think that sharing explicit details in a public setting is appropriate. I honestly kind of felt uncomfortable as she tried to pry me for details, but I just told her that I didn't feel like this was a good place to talk about stuff like that. She eventually dropped it. Once we finish, I went to pull out my card to pay for my meal, and she stopped me, saying that she'd pay for it, and I asked if she was sure. She insisted, so I let her pay because my meal was really cheap. The bill total ended up being almost $100. Like I said, she got a lot of food. I thanked her for the meal and I Ubered home. About 2am on the 16th, two hours before I had to get up for work, I was woken up by a lot of Facebook messages from Tiffany, calling me all sorts of names and other crazy messages from her. I responded half dead with, what? And as soon as I sent a few messages asking what she was talking about, she called me on Facebook Messenger and I answered, still half asleep. She immediately started screaming at me, saying, I paid for your meal. I can't believe you. You let me on. I spent a lot of money on that meal. The least you could do was hook up with me and some other crazy scream that I was unable to understand because screaming at a half-asleep person through a phone doesn't come out as clear as you think. I ended up hanging up because I needed sleep and maybe she was drunk or had messaged me by mistake, so I fell back asleep. Guys, I honestly thought that I'd never seen a grown woman go so batshit crazy. When I woke up at 4.30 in the morning, I was gifted with a wonderful wall of notifications of 87 Facebook messages and 17 missed Facebook calls. Thank goodness this girl didn't have my actual number. While I was getting ready and waiting to clock in at 6.30am, I read them all, and the amount of horrible and disgusting things this girl had sent was just baffling. She called me everything from homophobic slurs, sexist comments, calling me a dirty half-breed who should have died in the womb along with your mom. I'm of Mexican and Spanish descent, so I think she was referring to that. She said some other extremely disgusting shit. She also demanded I pay her a hundred dollars for the trouble. After reading all that, I clocked in for my eight-hour shift, immediately regretting reading all of that before. And after getting off, I get home to more horrible messages. I sit down in a Discord call with friends, and I end up dumping the whole thing on them because I was stressed out and extremely cranky. And during that call, I'm thinking about how to go about this when a wonderful idea pops into my head. I should send some screenshots of these to her parents. So I pick through all the messages, making sure to get the best ones to send, and send them to her mom and dad. A little bit about her parents. Her parents are the sweetest and kindest people I've met. The mom is a sweet southern Christian woman who's the type to bake cookies for the new neighbors and is very loving in the love thy neighbor no matter what. She knew I was gay and trans, but her daughter didn't until later. And her dad is the upfront and clear and take no shit kind of person. The way he talks is kind of annoying, but I like it because he tells you exactly what he thinks. Anyways, her mom messages me a bit later saying, I'm so sorry about this. I had no idea. I can't believe she would say or do something like this. This isn't how we raised her. I hope you don't think we think the same about you. After about 10 or so minutes after, Tiffany messages me back saying, Did you just message my mom? And I didn't answer. Some time passes and her dad messages me, apologizing for his daughter's words and acts, and then goes on to say that they've kicked her out of their house, taken away permission to drive their car, refused to pay any more of her college expenses, and her brothers have cut contact with her, one of which is married to a Mexican woman, 
so you can imagine how he took the half-breed comment she made. After that, it was silence. No messages, no calls, no nothing. Until today, I get on and went to go look at Facebook and notice her Facebook is gone. She's completely deleted it, so it's over. I'm not afraid of her finding me because she doesn't know where I live or work. She doesn't know any of my contact information other than Facebook. This whole situation has been unnecessarily stressful and just terrible. I did ask her parents if they were okay with me talking about it publicly, and luckily they were okay with it. I met my ex in February of 2020, but didn't end up dating him till closer to my 17th birthday, because he still lived with his girlfriend and I didn't find out till later that they were actually still doing things together, and meeting him was the biggest mistake of my life. Everything started off great as every relationship goes. I sent pictures because he was my boyfriend, so you know, and of course I let him save them for later. Another big mistake. I noticed that they were still texting, and when I went through his phone, he was still saying he loved her and missed her. I was deeply hurt and called him out on it. He apologized and said it would never happen again, and I told him to text her that we were dating. And he did. She was pissed. She stopped paying for the house and helping him with car payments, and at this time he quit Taco Bell and refused to do his new job Ubering because, and I quote, I need to practice League of Legends because I want to be a pro league streamer. So I worked my ass off and ended up losing my job because the manager didn't let me work without a doctor's note. So I was stuck working his job while he played his games. Before I met him, I had four and a half thousand dollars in my savings. He ended up using my card to pay his phone bills, car payments, the apartment, daily weed, fast food, new league accounts, and also CSGO knives. He kept losing his accounts due to telling people to off themselves and constant swearing and racial slurs. But the worst was yet to happen. I found that he was using an old tablet to excessively watch adult entertainment set up dating accounts and have different Instagram accounts, but on these accounts he was pretending to be a woman. I called him out about this and told him I wanted to leave. He freaks out, jumping around and screaming and crying, saying he would change, and I trusted him. As time went on, things got worse, and I was scared to leave, and by the end of this you'll see why. He'd shoved me into a wall and got in my face, screaming, You stole my car key because you don't want me to work, because you're jealous of other girls. Which was stupid, because he'd thrown his car keys at me during a different argument. But one day, I went through the iPad and found that he was actively not just sending, but selling my pictures from when I was 16 to 17, and doing the same with his other ex. I started to try to get my stuff together and put Gorilla Glue in the charging port to just get rid of the filth I saw. When he found out that it no longer charged after he used my card to get us food, he was livid. He started screaming and getting in my face. I tried to go around him and grab my things, but when my back was turned, he pulled me down to the ground, wrestled me till he was able to put me in a chokehold. I was sobbing and just accepted that this would be the end, but before I blacked out, he let me go and I started gasping for air and gagging from excessive coughing as he just stood there and laughed at me. I tried to crawl away from him and then he grabbed my leg and started dragging me out of the apartment. I kicked to try to get him off me, which just made him pull me like a dog playing tug of war. He eventually dragged me out, keeping my wallet, keys, and all of my valuables. So I sat crying, begging for my stuff so I could just go home. He came outside and pulled me down the apartment stairs by my leg. 
I was left with extreme bruising and some cuts. I did end up calling the police, and they did absolutely nothing. Fast forward, he had to move because he had nowhere to stay or live after getting evicted from the apartment, and I had gotten a new job. One day, it was particularly cold, and I went to get a shirt out of my car. And there he was. He was sitting in my car on his phone. I left the door unlocked usually because I worked in a good area. I called him a cheater and told him to leave. He got out of the car and was starting to go around the back, so I jumped in and tried to lock the door from the back seat. He ran over and pulled the door open and started trying to pull me out of the car. I started screaming and kicking at him. Thankfully, a customer saw this happening and called the police. They arrested him and told me to go home for the night, which they ended up firing me for. Unfortunately, he got bailed out, and while he was in jail, he'd given out my phone number to other people there. He walked four and a half hours to my house after he was released, and he was looking around my backyard when my neighbor saw him and called my dad. My dad got in his truck with a gun and waited for him to come out of the gas station. He eventually did, but ran off. He wasn't shot. He had harassed me by saying that he was going to show up to my graduation and ruin everything. And he's gotten to the point of making multiple fake accounts on Snapchat, Instagram, and TikTok, pretending to be me and his other exes. And as of the 1st of January, 2023, he still pretends to be high school girls, selling our pictures and making fake accounts. We've all had bad dates, right? This is the only date I've had to date that rang every alarm bell and waved every red flag. I'll start this by saying I don't go on many dates, but when I do, I make sure I follow safety protocol by only meeting my date in public spaces. I let either family or friends know where I'm going, and I park in a populated place close by to wherever we meet. Anyway, this date initially suggested we meet at his house to watch a movie and have a few drinks. I said no, I don't feel comfortable with that. I only want to meet in public. He seemed okay with this, but then brought it up a few more times and said if money was an issue, we could meet up another time or forget about it altogether. But my date backtracked and went with my idea of meeting at a cafe that I chose. Anyway, he turns up in a two-door car and goes into the cafe, and I follow behind and introduce myself. After a polite introduction, things begin to get a bit weird. I order a Coke, and he says, Don't you want a drink? I was going to pop into a bar and get one. I say no, I'm not drinking, and he looks at me confused, as if I'm being unreasonable. I already explained in messages I don't drink as I'm on medication, so having to re-explain it again pissed me off. He seemed to disappear and goes to order a cider from the bar while I get a table. Anyway, we sit down with our drinks and the date immediately goes on about going back to his place even though the original plan was to stay here and order food, and I already stated that was not happening. He says something along the lines of having a few drinks and eating at his place, and I said we don't have to eat, we can just have drinks and leave. He gets defensive and says he has money, but prefers it if we go back to his place. I make a joke and say, you're not a killer, are you? And instead of laughing it off, he stares at me uncannily and says, You don't think I would hurt you, do you? I laugh uncomfortably and say of course not, but really I'm relieved this date won't be going any further. My date suddenly says, Are you going to follow me in your car? Because that wouldn't make much sense. How about we go into my car? But I've got packages in the front, so you'll have to squeeze in the back and I'll drop you off back to your car after. In reality, that made less sense than me following in my car and driving home from his house. The fact it was completely illogical made it even more creepy in my mind. 
Every alarm bell was going off at this point. I said, look, I don't want to go to yours, and your insistence is giving me the creeps. My date looks shocked, mumbles something about needing the toilet, and excuses himself from the table. A few moments later, I see him through the cafe window, getting into his car and driving off. Massive bullet dodged in my opinion. Also, the fact his car didn't have back doors made it even more sinister. Because imagine if something happened in the car and I couldn't escape. This was in April 2021. For a bit of background, my name is Janelle. I'm a 21-year-old French girl. I'm a student in Lille. I was tired that I was not finding true love, so I decided to have my first time with my best friend. Then I find a fantastic sex friend, which I get along with wonderfully on all levels. We were together for about three months. They then sound the time to throw me away because I still love my ex. I was very fragile that I make my first attempt to end it all. I end up being taken to emergency and then the mental hospital. For those of you that have already deduced, you'll understand that I was already in a depressive state for a few months with a strong punch shot for alcohol. To complete this auto-destructive mechanism, what better than dating apps? A few weeks after my release from the mental hospital, I match up to make new encounters and especially forget my dear and tender sex friend. I always meet the guys at home for a first date because I have zero experience and that's what I did for my very first date. One fine day comes when I matched with a guy, Matthew. Matthew is not very beautiful and has a few extra pounds but I'm no Beyonce either, so I match. We laugh a little, we have some common tastes, and especially he smokes weed, so I thought, it's perfect, we'll smoke some joints between us. He gives me some personal information, like his address, and his job, or rather old job, he'd just gotten fired. Work or no work, I don't care, I don't want to share my life with him anyway, I explain to him that I'm fragile and that I've come out of a mental clinic, that I'm depressed and blah blah blah. It was all for the sole purpose of making him understand that he can't play with me. I also tell him that I'm solely looking for sex, but still with some discussion, complicity, hugs, and other things of that nature. I explain that I'm not just a shot in 20 minutes and it's done. He assures me that that's what he's looking for too and that he's actually very cuddly. Perfect. After only one or two days of talking, we agree on a date. Mojito party at my house, and he brings some joints. And here's how the meeting went. Matthew arrives. He's really not cute, even worse than in the photos. He has a dirty look, like greasy hair, a stained t-shirt, the style of a grungy teenager despite him being 26 years old. In short, I mean far from wetting my panties, but I desperately need company. I offer for him to make the drinks while I chose a film on television. He goes into the kitchen and prepares to make two mojitos before joining me on the sofa. We talk a bit. He's not very smart or very interesting. I drown in my drink, hoping to animate the party alone. And this is the start of a three-day blackout. According to our dear Matthew, we would have then drunk and smoked while watching a film before going into the bedroom. I vaguely remember being naked on my bed and seeing him dressed above me, looking at me before turning his heels and slamming the door. My phone is dead. My alarm clock is not ringing. I'm away from a work group appointment, so my friends are worried and call me. They can't contact me, so they contact my sister, but when she tries to get a hold of me, it goes straight to voicemail. The girls come down to my place and ring and ring again, but still no answer. They call the fire service, who manage to get the entry door open, but not the door to my apartment. They knock on the door, calling me, and I end up opening the door, 
dressed in a blanket to hide my nakedness. I look at them confused. The firemen conclude that I'm hungover and they leave while my friends help me get dressed. They also think I drank too much. They notice my body is covered with yellow betadine on my arms, legs, and stomach. I told them that I burned my arm yesterday and that I treated myself, but there were no signs of a burn or anything on my arm. Besides, I don't even own betadine. My friends take my cat and I end up at one of their houses, being as I'm in a comatose state. I have trouble speaking. I look completely elsewhere. I even have trouble thinking. The next day my sister comes to pick me up so I can stay with her for a few days. Everyone is convinced I try to end myself again with drugs and alcohol. I start complaining about pain in my intimate area and blood loss, so my sister decides to take me to the hospital. I tell them that I might want to make a report since I was unconscious and it may have been unprotected. I get so many tests. I'm advised to file a complaint, and I'm being redirected to the OB emergency. The next day, I finally regain consciousness gently. My relatives see it right away. I'm a little more lively and more coherent. I end up getting more swabs done, and I get preventative AIDS treatment. Over the course of a week, I made a series of appointments for blood samples, urine samples, and that stuff. I went to file a complaint with the testimony of my friends who met me at my home and my sister who took care of me. After talking about it to people my age, older people, but especially medical staff and the police, the term organ trafficking was more than mentioned. They think the guy chickened out at the last minute. Despite my complaint, my bed full of betadine, my underwear torn off, and the blood on the doors of the apartment. My attacker got nothing. I will never know what really happened and what he really wanted. I would like to point out that I used to drink and smoke in addition to my treatment, and that never before have I had a blackout of three days. I'm pretty sure he put something in my drink. It's good to talk about it anyway. Thank you. For a little bit of background, I'm in a wonderful relationship now with a guy I met on Tinder, so this is in no way, shape, or form me shitting on the app. I'm currently a senior at a four-year university, but this happened in my sophomore year when I was 19. For me, it was pretty hard to find someone to just casually date and get to know, since I'm a bit of an introverted individual and wasn't looking for any old hump and dump. I also went through my fair share of abusive relationships, so dating for me was really difficult when it came to opening up and trusting people. When I matched with Chris, I was pleasantly surprised. He was a funny, smart, interesting college student with a decent job and good intentions. I enjoyed talking to him, but there was a lot of anxiety when I spoke with him. I know now that I should have trusted my gut instinct, but at the time, I assumed I was doing my introverted trust issues bullshit and tried to push that feeling away. We would talk a few times a week, and every time we did, the feeling would persist. Only each time we talked, it would be stronger. He started to make comments about how he wanted me to be his girlfriend and how he was so excited for me to meet his parents. But we hadn't met and it only talked on and off for a few weeks at this point. So, slowly, I stopped responding to some of his messages. Then I started to leave them completely unanswered. One day... I confided in my friends and told them about the bad feeling I always had while talking with Chris. They told me that I wasn't being open to new experiences because I hadn't let go of my past and that I wasn't being fair to him. So, reluctantly, after a few weeks of radio silence and feeling guilty, I messaged him again. Another week or two of messaging and catching up, he asked me to go out to dinner with him I was hesitant to say yes, as my anxiety was through the roof. 
but my friends insisted that it was just nerves and it would be good for me to go out with someone. I agreed, and he excitedly told me he had plans to take me to a nice Japanese restaurant in the city next to my campus. My friends were ecstatic and asked to see a picture of him. I pulled up his Tinder profile, and when they swiped through the pictures, they were silent. You know, he, uh, he kind of looks like Jacob. Jacob was a particularly abusive ex. I went into a full-blown panic attack. Once I saw the resemblance, there was no going back. There was no way I was going anywhere with this guy. I texted him back the night before the date and explained that I no longer felt comfortable going out and that I was sorry. He never texted me back. That same week, I started getting multiple phone calls every day from an unknown number. They would leave me voicemails that would say things like, Call me back, babe. Or, Baby, where are you? Why won't you give me a chance? I tried ignoring them. But one day, after getting almost ten calls, I answered, ready to curse someone the fuck out. I called Chris by his name and told him where to go and was met with laughter. This isn't Chris. This is Jeff. Who? Chris said I could have you. <laughs> he started laughing, so I hung up and he immediately called me back. I sent him to voicemail. He said you wanted to go out with me instead. He told me what university you go to and showed me your pictures. I'll wait on campus if I have to. I blocked his number and for a few more days I got a few more unknown calls and voicemails detailing some pretty weird, aggressive, and gross stuff. But they eventually died down. I don't know if this guy was serious or maybe it was Chris getting his friend to mess with me as revenge for cancelling. But whatever it was, it had me looking behind myself any time I walked anywhere on campus for the rest of the semester. My roommates and I had a male friend stay with us for a while, just in case. I started going back to my hometown on the weekends because I was afraid to stay on campus for too long. It's been two years, so I hope that in this amount of time, Chris and Jeff have learned to become better people. Or that someone kicked their asses already. So this happened about ten years ago when I was in college. I am a female and I was a sophomore at about 19 to 20 years old, and I was horribly naive. The college I went to was a religious school and had several rules that students had to follow. The rules important to the story are no drinking on campus, you could only visit the opposite sex in their room during visitation hours, and during visitation, the door had to be left open. I was not an unattractive girl, and I happened to draw the attention of a guy who shared the same major as I did. This means we had a bunch of classes together. He introduced himself to me as Andy, and we began talking. He was very tall, about 6 foot 4, and quite heavy. At one point, he weighed about 300 pounds. He expressed romantic interest in me, but I wasn't attracted to him and told him this whenever he brought it up. He would immediately backtrack and say how happy he was being my friend, and he didn't mind that I didn't care about him romantically. I did get along very well with him though, and we hung out just the two of us frequently. The other people in our class began to expect to see us together, and we became fast friends. Andy had a girlfriend when we met who attended another school. He broke up with her during the summer break between freshman and sophomore year. But unbeknownst to me, the reason for the breakup was that he wanted to start pursuing me more actively. When I came back from summer break, something had changed. Andy became more forwards towards me, often making comments about how pretty I was and that I should be with him. I began to become uncomfortable with the attention and told him so many times. 
I unfortunately didn't want to lose him as a friend, since he was one of only a few friends I hung out with. A lot of those friends I met through him, so if I had to cut him off, I would have close to no one to talk to. Andy would often swing wildly from charming and sweet to insulting and manipulative. He would offer to take me places and help me with things, then would say that I owed him something in return for those things. He would say we were so close and we should just date, since we were already practically together all the time. Alcohol made it worse. I tried to avoid drinking with him, but it did happen occasionally, either off campus or sneakily while in his dorm room. He sometimes used my past relationships to manipulate me into feeling guilty. As a religious person, I had committed a cardinal sin by sleeping with the two guys I'd previously dated before meeting Andy. He brought this up a lot, implying that I was damaged goods because of this. He at one point told me, I'm the best man that you could possibly get because of your past. Eventually, I caved and told him I'd date him just to see if there were any feelings there whatsoever. This, of course, made him ecstatic, but it also made him extremely overprotective of me and jealous of any attention I received from anyone of the opposite sex. He would call and text me constantly, and if I didn't pick up the first time, he would call me until I did. He constantly questioned where I was going to be and would follow me there if possible. I worked for the college as a short order cook at their late night grill, and Andy would wait for me to get off work almost every night. He would sit at one of the tables for hours, just waiting for me to finish my shift. It began to creep me out, but I chalked it up to him being an overprotective boyfriend. We did eventually have sex, but I was still not physically attracted to Andy and I was essentially waiting for him to finish every time we did the deed. He made me feel like it was a necessary part of our relationship, and that, because I slept with my exes, I also needed to sleep with him. Despite this, I did genuinely enjoy his company and our conversations when he wasn't being possessive. We tried being in a relationship for two months, until Christmas break rolled around, when I went home, I had the chance to clear my head and speak to my family about the situation. My mom especially seemed uncomfortable with how frequent Andy contacted me, and it got way worse while we were apart. He got a hold of my family members' Facebook pages and phone numbers, and he would call or message them whenever I didn't immediately answer his calls or texts. It got to the point where he was calling me upwards of ten times a day, and I had hundreds of texts from him. I honestly couldn't afford this relationship anymore. After thinking long and hard about it, I called him up. I told him how I felt, that I thought this relationship wasn't working. I said the cliched phrase, I still want to be friends, and I genuinely meant it. Andy flipped out. He began calling and messaging me even more frequently than before at all hours of the day and night, swinging wildly from, you broke my heart, please come back to me, all the way to, how dare you, you stupid bitch, I deserve way better than you, and he'd go back again. I had no clue what to do, I dreaded returning to school. When the day finally came and I went back to campus, Andy sought me out. He would freak out on me for no reason, curse at me and call me names, then apologize profusely. His attitudes would change frequently, sometimes the next day, sometimes even the next hour. He still waited for me outside of work. He still followed me back to my dorm. He still walked with our group of friends to and from class. When they were around, he would pretend to want to be friends, then wait until we were walking alone and start in on me. He would push me or step on the back of my heels while I was walking and mock me. Then when I complained, he would say he was just joking. I didn't realize it at the time, but he was showing all these warning signs, and I was too stupid and naive to pick up on them. I did tell him I thought we needed to spend some time apart, and that worked for a short while. 
and he eventually seemed to even out and a few weeks later invited me to his dorm room to play video games with him as a peace offering. When I arrived, he snuck me in the back way so we didn't have to leave the door open. He offered me a drink. This made me nervous, but I was an underage college student, so far be it for me to turn down an alcoholic beverage. Everything seemed to be going alright. We were getting along and joking around, so I got more comfortable. I had another drink, and very quickly after this, I started to feel exceedingly tired and had trouble standing. I don't know if he was topping off my drink when I wasn't looking, or if God forbid, he put something in my drink, but there was no way I was leaving that room that night. And he became very accommodating and arranged for me to crash on his couch. I agreed, but I could tell something wasn't right. So I told him in a drowsy voice while slurring my words that under no uncertain terms was he to try anything sexual that night. He laughed it off but agreed, and the last thing I remember is curling up on the couch and falling asleep. I don't need to tell you what happened that night while I was passed out. The next morning when I found out, I was horrified. I yelled at Andy who laughed it off as something funny that I brought it on myself by drinking. I then left. I went to my dorm room across the campus, crawled into bed and cried. I skipped classes that day and stayed in my room the whole time. I called out of work. I didn't want to do anything or see anyone. I didn't tell anyone what happened then, and I honestly didn't know that what happened was considered sexual assault until months later. At some point during the afternoon, Andy tried to sneak into my room. I freaked out, yelling at him to get the fuck out. He apologized and told me he just wanted to drop off some things, and he didn't think I'd be there. He had a hot water bottle and flowers. How sweet. Not. He kind of threw them in the room and shut the door as I yelled at him to leave me alone. A couple of months went by. And he still followed me sometimes, but I told him to back off. He still messaged me, but I mostly ignored him. He followed me off campus on multiple occasions, and I also learned that he'd been following me around for quite some time. I began to develop anxiety about seeing him everywhere, and I went to the campus doctor. I explained parts of the story to him, and he gave me some Xanax and antidepressants to help with my paranoia. I tried my best to function, but my grades suffered and so did my friendships. By this point, I had maybe three friends left who didn't think I was this horrible person that led Andy on and then dumped him and broke his heart. The icing on the cake for me was when Andy crashed my birthday party. Apparently he asked one of my friends if he could help plan it, but she didn't know that we weren't speaking, so she agreed. He showed up to the park where it was being held, drank all the alcohol, then began telling my few friends that I still had how much of a bitch I was. He called me a whore. He told them I let him on and broke his heart, and the entire evening was ruined. Unfortunately, he was too drunk to drive himself home, so I was nominated to bring him back by driving his car. I mentioned I didn't want to do this by myself, so a friend offered to ride with me to help carry him into his dorm room, but immediately after that she booked it. She left me alone with him in his dorm room, even though I told her I was extremely uncomfortable being alone with him. She knew some of what happened, but I think she figured I was being dramatic or exaggerating. Immediately after she left, all of a sudden he wasn't that drunk anymore. He immediately turned hostile and threatening. He told me if I didn't stay with him, he would hurt himself, and he pulled out a pair of scissors. He held the blade of his scissors to his wrist, and I took a step back. I was at a loss of what to do in this situation, so I simply stated that he shouldn't hurt himself, but I really wanted to leave. I backed up and slowly went for the door, but he jumped up, dropped the scissors, and grabbed my wrist. 
He yanked me back from the doorway and twisted my arm behind my back until I cried out. He then threw me against the wall face first, slammed the door shut and locked it. Then he picked me up and tossed me onto his bed. I was terrified, but I told him that if he didn't let me go, I would scream. He covered my mouth with his hand and told me if I screamed, I would get into trouble for violating visitation. He said he was going to let me up if I promised to stay in the room with him. I tried to portray that I was calm and relaxed, but inside, I was scared for my life. I thought if I stayed, he would try to assault me again, or worse. I agreed to stay with him, and he let me up off of the bed. I sat up, and with all the strength I could muster, I smiled. I said I would be okay hanging out with him, but I really had to use the bathroom. He agreed, but told me not to take too long. He said he'd be waiting outside the door. The dorm bathroom was actually a shared bathroom between two dorm rooms. In Andy's room, there was a door to the right that led to the bathroom. Then if you walked through the bathroom, there was another door on the opposite side that led to another dorm room. Both bathroom doors could be locked from the outside to prevent someone from one dorm using the bathroom to access the other dorm room. I went into the bathroom and closed Andy's door then prayed the guys who lived in the next dorm room were trusting enough to leave the bathroom door unlocked. I walked to the other side and tried the doorknob. Miraculously, it turned, and I opened the door into the room of two very surprised guys. I apologized and mumbled. I just need to get out of there before turning to leave. They both stared incredulously at me as I ran out of their front door. I left that residence hall and ran all the way across campus to my dorm. All of a sudden I heard footsteps behind me and I heard someone shouting my name. My heart sank. It was Andy. I panicked, but the hall that housed my dorm was directly ahead of me. I picked up the pace and Andy followed suit. He was gaining on me and it had been ages since I ran. I could see the entrance to my dorm. I had my key out and grabbed the door handle of the first set of doors. There were two sets of doors that led into my residence hall. The first one was always unlocked, but the second set you needed a key for. When I got inside the first set of doors, Andy caught up to me and grabbed me by the arm. He tried to use his weight advantage to pull me back away from the second set of doors and out of the entrance. I fought with everything I had yelling at him to let me go the whole time. I saw through the dorm window that there were people inside the foyer, and if I could just get their attention, I could get one of them to open the door. I finally managed to get close enough to the second set of doors to knock. The instant I knocked on that door, Andy let me go. He walked away quickly, letting a few choice curse words fly in my direction, before jogging back in the direction he came. When a guy from inside the foyer opened the door, he saw a girl who was out of breath and on the verge of tears. He asked me if I was okay. I said, I think so, then waved him away. I ran to my dorm room and locked the door immediately. The very next day, I contacted my RA about the situation. I showed her some of the messages Andy sent me and explained that he had broken visitation by coming into my dorm room to drop stuff off for me, and that he had just chased me across campus. She was immediately concerned, and contacted the Dean of Discipline. They instituted a ban of Andy being allowed to enter my dorm, and told him to stay away from me, and not to contact me anymore. It took him a long time to even begin to comply. I should have gone to the police, but when I met with the Dean of Discipline, he strongly encouraged me to keep everything in-house. He said, We are a family, and we will deal with this internally, like a family should. I didn't learn this until years later, but this is the attitude of many colleges when dealing with victims of stalking and assault who attend their schools. Eventually, over the next summer, 
I told my mother most of the details of what happened, and she cried with me. She was extremely supportive and drove me five hours to the police department in the town where my college was located so I could file a report. They basically said since it had been too long since the assault, there wasn't much they could do, but I could try to get a restraining order. I followed their directions and was able to get a restraining order against Andy. He violated that order several times, and it ended up going back to court. The court put so many restrictions on him that he ended up having to transfer to another college while I finished my degree. When I graduated, I got out of there and never looked back. I returned to my hometown where I moved back in with my family and got a decent job. I've dealt with anxiety, depression, and extreme paranoia since then, and for a while, I was terrified he would find me again and finish what he started. I got a firearm card and bought a handgun that I keep under my nightstand for protection. I've never had to use it outside of practicing at a range, fortunately. I eventually found a fantastic guy who's amazing, sweet, kind, and very understanding of my past. We're married now, and I've never been happier. I'm so glad I got out of that situation. Many women aren't as lucky. Andy, let's never meet again, because if you try to hurt me, I'll probably be armed. When I was 16, my friend had told me one of her boyfriends liked me. I asked which one, and she said Austin. I said that I would be okay with her giving him my number. She did, and a week later, he became my boyfriend. There was nothing out of the ordinary at first. He seemed like a nice guy, and I felt like I could trust him. Fast forward to a week later. I was at his house, and he wanted to make out with me. I said no because we were in the middle of a video game. He got mad at me and started to have a meltdown. He dragged me upstairs by my hair and I couldn't fight him. Once upstairs, he began to abuse me. I was scared and didn't know what to do. I kept getting abused for a year and a half because I was too scared to leave. Finally, I did, and then I found out some pretty weird stuff about him. I'd heard from a friend of his back from his hometown that he'd planted a bomb in his school and then tried to light himself on fire. Plus, he's been institutionalized more than once. Okay, major red flags, and I wish I would have known a lot sooner. I graduated high school early, at the age of 17, and then moved out of town and started going to college. I had Austin blocked from everything, phone, Facebook, Twitter, basically any social media site. I blocked him if he was on it. Not even a month into college, I kept getting these calls and texts from numbers I didn't know. It was him. I had to constantly block numbers. I was getting tired of it, so I answered one. He was asking me which dorm I lived in because he was on campus and wanted to see me. I threatened to get security and the police if he did not leave. He hung up. I'd gone home that weekend, and then there was a knock on the door. I answer it, and it was him. He was holding a coffee cup and smiling at me. He tried handing me the coffee and told me it was my favorite kind. He was right. It was a regular order at the local coffee shop. I asked him how he knew that, and he confessed that he'd been watching me when I go there. I quickly shut the door and called the police and told him that's what I was doing. He left, but when I went back outside, the coffee cup was next to my car. The thing is, I don't know how he got my address. None of my friends ever gave it to him, and I sure as hell didn't. Fast forward to right before my 18th birthday. I was in the musical at my college, and I'd been advertising it on my Facebook, so friends and family knew when it was. After our Saturday show, I'd gotten a text from an unknown number that said, Thanks for making me laugh. 
You did really good tonight. From A. I lost it. I showed one of the girls in the show with me, and she got security to walk me back to my dorm. A few weeks later, I found out that he'd bought me birthday presents and wanted me to come get them from his house. I told him no, and he kept bothering me about it. Yet again, he ended up showing up at my house when I was home. It was about 11.30 at night, and I heard a tapping noise at the window. I thought it was the wind making a branch hit the window, so I thought nothing of it. Probably about 10 minutes later, I heard whispering outside. I opened my blinds and he was standing there. I froze and shut the blinds. I called the police again, and when I got off the phone, went back to the window and told him the police were coming and that if I ever saw him again, I would get a restraining order. To this day, that was the last time I saw him. I'll start with some brief context. I lived with an abusive male partner who didn't value my safety whatsoever. He got really mad if I didn't leave the door unlocked, and we lived in a not-so-great part of town. He was way older than me. I was barely 18 at the time, and he was 26. Neither of us owned a car. He worked at Waffle House, and I was getting sick constantly, so keeping a job wasn't easy for me. He liked drugs and alcohol, and he traumatized me in regards to both. He blamed me for his usage and would assault me while he was on it. Fun fact, he said if I reported his conduct, he would blame me because he was the one on the substance, even though he held me down and forced it, not me. I digress. When I finally got the courage to leave him, for the last time, I did it while he was at work. I begged my mother to get me necessities, Instead, she called the cops. There was a warrant for his arrest, and she got a police escort just in case. As soon as he got out, he immediately started messaging me from a different, new number, threatening to murder me and my family if I didn't go home with him. It didn't matter if I blocked him. There would be a new number, and he would keep at it. I was scared, but I thought for the most part I was safe. After all, he didn't have a car. I was wrong. About a week into this, he and his gun-owning friend showed up. He banged on the door and was screaming. His friend owning a gun is important because he repeatedly said that he and his friend would shoot us. My window was on the second floor facing the street and my stomach dropped when he saw me. I immediately dropped and army crawled to my little brother's room and hid in the closet. His window faced the backyard, and I guess my monkey brain felt safer there. I was the only one home, and scared that if I breathed too loud, he'd hear me. I was terrified. I didn't want to call the police, because my dumb ass thought he'd hear that too. I silently texted my mom. Police arrived about 20 minutes after my mom said they were on their way. He and his friend were taken into custody after the same friend had gotten him out on bond. His friend did have a gun, but he didn't. Bottom line, I was able to get a restraining order, and I'm strictly sober, and definitely in therapy after that. My memory of this story is not perfectly chronological, and in all honesty, at the time the truth came to light for most of us, a lot of stories converged, causing some cloudiness. This was over the span of at least six months. When I was ending my senior year of high school, ready to transition into my freshman year of college, I was added into a group message on Facebook with a bunch of other incoming freshmen by my roommate. Her name was Fran. We'd met through the Facebook page for our school and ended up living together all four years. She rocks. Anyway, I believe there are about ten or so of us in this group chat and we talked all day, every day, 
leading up to our arrival on campus. We'd gotten really close over the summer, and had hung out in smaller groups quite a few times already. The day we arrived on campus, everyone scurried to their rooms to unpack. My roommate and I were setting up our room with the door open, when the mother of one of our neighbors popped by to greet us. We went over to their room to meet them, and their mother introduced us to her daughter, Sam, and her roommate, Nancy. Both of them were nice girls, and we talked for a bit before going back to our room to continue unpacking. We invited them to come with us to the welcome party later that night. When the time came, we were all organizing to meet up for the campus welcome party in our Facebook group. We had added our two neighbors to the group chat after telling everyone we invited them. We agreed on a time and all met up down there. It was a lot of fun for everyone, and we continued to regularly hang out following that day. As time passed, smaller groups of people from the large chat began to get closer and closer. Fran and I became quite close with our neighbors, since their room was near ours. We usually kept the door to our room open, as it was a common hangout spot for all the people from our group. We just asked that they would knock if it was closed, but that otherwise everyone was always welcome. One day we were all hanging out, talking about high school, and Nancy tells us that she never went to a prom because she was bullied and everyone at her school hated her. We all felt so terrible and apologized that this had happened to her. We assured her that prom really wasn't that fun anyway. She seemed to appreciate that. We noticed following this that Nancy was an open book and would often tend to share personal information without really being prompted. However, I don't think anyone minded. It was a weird time for everyone, and maybe this was her way of bonding with others. I remember also that she had a very dark sense of humor, and would often make strange jokes alluding to things like violence. Strange as it was, again, we brushed it off as though she was just struggling to connect and awkwardly overcompensating. As time goes by, she continues to disclose intense personal details. She ended up disclosing experiences such as sexual assault and abuse, things that people in our group who'd gone through similar things really connected with her on. One night I was at a chain diner with Nancy and another friend from the group chat. In a moment of silence as we ate our food, Nancy blurts out, I used to have an eating disorder, you know. Too stunned to think of an empathetic response, both of us just kind of raised our eyebrows and said, Wow, this sounds like a pretty cold reaction, I understand, but please know at this point, there was something new every time we hung out with her. It was hard to keep saying something meaningful, especially when it was so often out of nowhere. It was overwhelming so most of us began to distance ourselves from her. My roommate and I started keeping our door closed most of the time, just so we could at least get warning when someone was going to come in. However, Nancy didn't respect this request. She would often just swing the door open and come in. So, one night, we decided we would start locking our door to help reinforce the knock-first policy. We were sitting in our desks doing our homework, when we hear someone turn the knob and push. Of course, being that it was locked, the door didn't open. The person aggressively jiggled the doorknob before finally knocking. I remember looking up at my roommate creeped out and being met by her wide-eyed stare back. We open the door, and lo and behold, Nancy cometh. She asked about the locked door, quite jarred by this matter, and we explained our reasoning. She stayed and hung out a while, and we talked. She looked at Fran's prom photo on the wall and told us how she was prom queen at her school and how she was so popular and loved by everyone. How awesome, we thought. We asked to see pictures of her dress and she showed us. We told her how beautiful it was and how she looked so nice. A bit later, we said our goodnights and she left. As we spent less time with her, the stories became more and more intense. She was being stalked and she showed us photos of her walking down campus, taken by someone else. 
we saw text after text from this person to her, threatening her and berating her. We were scared for her and would make sure to accompany her wherever she went. At the same time, she began to experience fainting spells. She refused to take them seriously. We would see her just randomly fall onto her bed occasionally, but most of the time she would just report them to us. She told us it happened in the shower many times. Her roommate, Sam, being a concerned and caring human, reached out to Nancy's parents. They got her in to see a doctor, and she returned to school with a heart monitor, which was somewhat shocking to us given that she told us her family was neglectful and abusive. Maybe they just got involved since Sam had called to keep up a good front. During the time she'd had this monitor, not a single episode occurred. As soon as it was gone, again she fainted. Interesting. We were not in the business of questioning anyone's health or looking to accuse someone of dishonesty, so we simply continued to distance ourselves. Eventually, we began to speculate and pieces of the puzzle fell into place. The first thing we realized was that the prom stories did not match up. She told us that she was hated and bullied, but she also told us she was prom queen, and we saw pictures of her dress and her at prom. Why would she lie about that? At this point, we assumed she was probably just lying about small details in her life to control the way we viewed her. Fran and I continued to figure things out that didn't add up. She told us she was assaulted by a family member in her youth, and he was in prison for it. So, being young women adept at Facebook creeping, we got to researching. For a few hours, we combed through Facebook pages, tracked down the names of all family members, looked up criminal records and databases, and never found a single thing besides a speeding ticket. Now this was starting to get weird. Why would someone lie about things like that, especially after other friends had genuinely been through similar circumstances? Not cool. Fran and I were sure that we were being lied to constantly at this point, but we had no idea what to do about it. We are both far from confrontational, so we thought to have a meeting of the minds instead. We invited two people from our group chat, who we believed to be the most level-headed, over to our dorm, in the hopes that we were just anxiously hyping each other up and that they would bring us back down to earth. We whispered our thoughts to them, as we didn't want her to pass by and suddenly hear us. I'm sure we were making a bigger deal out of it than it was necessary, but it was so eerie. They actually agreed with us, and we decided we were officially not going to be friends with her anymore. Honestly, at this point, we barely were anyway. She stopped getting invited to group hangouts, and I think she began to get the hint. Sam was still friends with us, so there was definitely a lot of tension between them. One day, Sam noticed Nancy on a Twitter account that didn't look like her personal one. She searched the name up from her phone and found an anonymous Twitter account filled with tweets about how much this person hated their roommates, their old friends, how they had something coming for them. I can't remember if it had been in person or on the account, but I'm certain that there was a general mention of access to weapons somewhere. Sam confronted Nancy about the account, and Nancy said she knew nothing about it. Sam asked to see her iPad, and Nancy handed it over, where Sam saw the account logged in. Nancy explained that she'd given her sign-in information to a friend to rant about their living situation, and told Sam that the friend would text her to confirm. A few minutes later, Sam received a text from the friend admitting that. They talked it out to make sure it was true, and Sam apologized to Nancy for misunderstanding. After discussing this with my dear friend and ex-roommate, Fran, I realized there are numerous other strange lies and encounters that I desperately want to include because they enrich the story but can't feasibly be put into writing. 1. She told us she was straight edge and never drank when we first got to campus. She would not drink with us. A long while later, in conversation, she mentioned that she drank a lot of alcohol in high school. So much so 
that she had brought a water bottle full of vodka to a volleyball practice and gotten intoxicated there. Number two, like I said, she alleged that she had a stalker and would often send us screenshots of their texts, but she refused to show us them on our phone and always blocked out the phone number in the screenshots. She told us she didn't want us to call and harass this person. Number three, one time during the fainting spells, Fran complimented a shirt Nancy was wearing, and Nancy responded, Thanks. My mom said if I faint again, she's going to return it. And that really shows how she would just spurt out very serious things casually. Number four. As shown by the door locking incident, she had a really bad read on personal space. Once, when I was away at home, Fran had a really bad migraine, and Nancy came over to check on her throughout the evening. She would stand over Fran as she was resting and insisted on calling her Princess. Sam said she'd woken up in the middle of the night to Nancy sitting up in bed staring at her. Number five. She came back from being home over one weekend and told us that her parents took all the money out of her bank account and pushed her down an entire flight of stairs. She did not have a single visible scratch, bruise, or bump on her. That's not to discredit, it's just a note. And number six, we're pretty sure she would pretend to be on the phone arguing with family because she was doing so once and we could hear no one talking or yelling back on the other line. Moments later, she received a call and we could hear someone loud and clear responding back. One of our friends was a commuter student and invited a bunch of us over to his house for a bonfire, luckily without Nancy. We were all sitting outside in the dark by the warmth and light of the fire. Given that bonfires pair pretty well with a spooky tale, Fran and I decided it was time to bring out our hypothesis on Nancy's dishonesty to the whole group. At this time, we figured she'd been dishonest about the prom story and the fainting. We still believed everything else otherwise, warily. Everyone began to admit that they thought it all seemed untrue and we all began to piece more lies together out loud. I remember the intensity of it all. We felt like investigators, like a detective on a case, finally finding that last piece of evidence. For a long time, we all got really energized and were on a passionate group tirade about the whole situation. The energy died down a bit, and finally Sam got everyone's attention. When I was on her iPad, I saw a free texting app. What if all those texts were fake too? The stalker, the friend, silence. It was absolutely silent. We should call it, I said. Those numbers don't work for phone calls. So one of the girls pulled up her phone and entered the number of Nancy's friends from Sam's texts. We sat in silence as she pressed the call button. It was a dead line. The hair on my neck stood up. The whole lot of us sat there, entirely aghast. I think being outside in the dark certainly intensified this, but we were honestly horrified. We realized that the Twitter was her, and she was making those tweets about us. About Sam. And she mentioned weapons. We tiptoed back into our dorm that night, and Sam slept at her boyfriend's. Sam, Fran, and I decided we needed to share this information with our RA, just in case. We concocted up a rather ridiculous plan on how we would get there without Nancy noticing. We asked to meet the RA in the downstairs office, rather than one of our rooms. Then, and this is the ridiculous part, we each went down a separate staircase. Highly unnecessary and hilarious to me in hindsight, but I think it highlights just how scared we really were at the time. We disclosed most of the information to the RA that pertained to us being in danger, but nothing about abuse or assault. In the event that those things held any truth, it wasn't ours to share. And that's kind of where it ends, for now and hopefully forever. I can't quite remember much detail after that night, and I don't think the RA did much more than just talk to her, but I'm not sure. She got a new roommate and moved out, 
I know she befriended some new people and they stayed friends, as far as I know, until we all graduated. In all, I don't know if she was ever truly a threat to us. I somewhat still believe much of this was a strange and unacceptable way to try and connect to others. There's a piece of advice that my roommate's awesome mom shared in all of this, and a warning I heed to others. If something seems too good or bad to be true, it probably is. Regardless, for my own well-being, I have kept my space from Nancy and intend to indefinitely. This happened to me back in 2005, right after I graduated university. I live in a small town near the outskirts of London. It's not creepy or out of the way or anything, but it can get quite deserted at night. The night in question, me and a bunch of mates were all going to get together and go down to Fabric in central London. I was getting ready to leave the house when my girlfriend Sarah called with a bit of a problem prompting me to tell my friends that they should go on without me and I'll meet them there. I hopped on the bus and headed to hers. A few hours later, I'd helped her sort through her crisis and was thinking I'd better make a move and head to the club. I asked if she wanted to come several times. She insisted she felt better and wanted to stay home. Knowing better than to test her resolve, I left it at that and called a minicab. I was waiting for the cab at the front of the driveway when Sarah joined me for the wait. We were kissing when the car drove up. This was my first sign that something was wrong. We didn't hear him pull up because he was driving really slowly with the headlights off. The only reason he grabbed our attention was because he turned his bright lights at us. It was an old ice cream Mercedes station wagon. I ignored whatever apprehension I had because I thought I just had an overactive imagination. Okay, so we pulled up quietly. So what? Knowing what I do now, I'm so happy Sarah never agreed to come with me. I got in the cab and told this guy that I wanted to head to Fabric in central London. He just nodded his head while looking into the driver's side wing mirror. I said, Did you hear me, mate? He nods again this time also letting a yes slip out. That's quite a fair, he said, all the while staring at the window. That's when I realized what he was staring at in his mirror. It was Sarah, walking back up the driveway. I was about to react when she got to the front door, but the cabbie beat me to it, turning and saying, can't have the little lady going in unescorted now, can we? All manner of deviants out there. This threw me a bit as his whole behavior was off, but I also knew that's what I would have done had it been the other way around, and maybe this guy had kids himself. I decided to just talk to him, break the ice, and after about five minutes, I felt at ease as we slipped into a familiar conversation, footy and women. It was all okay until he started telling me about his ex and best friend, how they'd been hooking up behind his back, and how he kicked the ever-living shit out of his best friend for it. Then he started fixating on his ex, saying how all women were whores and liars, and were only out for themselves, that men are only there to pay off their debts and wants. He even tried to justify a time when he kicked the shit out of her, saying that, Men can be excused from their actions if appropriately provoked. Then it got even weirder. He started talking to me about men, trans men, and then he started talking about them in a disgusting way. And then he said, Though some ladies are mighty fine, like that lass of yours. He turned to stare at me through the mirror, almost testing my reaction. I'm man enough to say that I was freaking the fuck out by this point at not only the conversation, but at the fact that the mobile phone I'd forgotten to charge had died halfway through this rant. Not one to show fear, I asked him to stop off at an ATM so I could get cash out to pay him at the end of the journey. He agrees, and for a moment, I feel like it's all going to be over in a second. 
when he says that before he does that, he needs to stop to take a piss. That's better, I thought. I can sneak out when he's pissing and bolt off. He turned off the main road and went through a random residential area before we finally found ourselves going down a dirt road and heading toward the woods. Mate, where the hell are we going? You can take a piss anywhere. He replied something along the lines that it was safer in the woods. That's when I noticed it. This particular car had no unlock feature in the back, and a very quiet slow tug on the door handle revealed that the child lock was on. I was trapped. He stopped the car near the edge of the woods and turned around and asked if I wanted to join him. I declined and said that I was in a hurry and asked him to hurry himself. This seemed to anger him and he slammed the door and vanished. I waited about one minute and tried to climb out the driver's side but it was locked too. I was scared that my movement had alerted the cabbie just outside. Having tried and failed to restart my phone, I looked around to see if he had a phone or some kind of device that I could communicate with, but nothing. After nearly ten minutes had gone by, I worked myself up to smashing the windows, figuring that this was in no way a normal situation and that abnormal measures could be taken. Just as I was getting in position, I heard a loud crash. It sounded like a massive branch had just hit the leaves below. I froze not moving a muscle, not even my lungs. I wanted to be able to hear everything just at that moment. As my ears slowly tuned in, I began to hear two very distinct sounds, but both in intervals. The first was a rustling sound, but it wasn't the wind. It sounded more like birds flying through the trees all at once. The second was a squelching slam, the slam only occurred three times, whereas all the rustling was quite often. Then silence again. I decided not to wait any longer. My imagination was going wild as to what those sounds were. I just wanted to get away as fast as my legs could carry me. I leaned back and thrust my legs out as hard as I could and kicked the back seat window through. It shattered and I wasted no time in shimmying through the broken window and outside. That's when it happened. My eyes focused in the dark, and I began to see that the ground was littered all around me with clothes, children's clothes, and the odd toy. I was so busy looking around that I didn't notice him walk straight up to me from behind and grab me by the nape. Where are you going, friend? I still need to take you down central. I noticed his shirt was off. He was sweating profusely and was covered in dirt. And in his hand, he had a fucking knife. Like a full-on kitchen knife. And there was something on it. I said, What the fuck, man? What are you doing? He replied something to the effect that he had some foul traps out in the woods and he was checking on them for game. He offered to show me. Recognizing that if I went with him, it would probably be the last choice I make. I twisted my body as much as I could and punched him square in the face. And I ran. I ran as fast as I could. He yelled after me, See you soon. I ignored him and kept running. Even though we'd driven quite far, at least five to six miles, I still legged it all the way back and straight to the cops and told them everything. They said they would check it out and sent me home in a squad car. The next morning I called Sarah and went over right away to check on her. I still wasn't over the creepy way the cabbie had been staring at her, and since he had picked me up from hers, he knew where she lived. I told her the story. When I was done, she just stared at me in disbelief, not knowing what to say. She just hugged me. At that point the police rang and I went outside to take the call. They told me that they went to check the specific area I mentioned, finding none of the clothes or toys I'd seen. Neither was there any sign of foul traps or a knife. They did mention finding a few pieces of cut up rope, but with nothing to go on, they just insinuated I was having a laugh at their expense. I then called the minicab company, figuring I could at least lodge a complaint against the wacko 
They said they had no record of a car picking me up that night. One had been sent, but by the time it arrived, no one was waiting. This creeped me out all over again. How had he found me then? Was it random? Was I chosen? Could he have been listening in to their private car radio network or something? I left Sarah's and headed back to mine. She was going to join me after helping her mom do some chores, and I wanted to go chill for a while. I should mention at this point, me and Sarah are now happily married and that all is well. However, that day, after I got home from hers and took a shower, I wandered over to the window. What I saw sent a chill down my spine, and it still does whenever I think about it. I saw it. That fucking cream Mercedes station wagon and the crazy cabbie staring at me with such a cold, empty look on his face until he slowly smiled and drove off. He told me I'd see him again. He wanted me to see him. Wanted me to know he could find me when he wanted. I still don't understand how he followed me or what his intentions were and I've never told Sarah about this last incident. About a year later, I took out a loan and moved me and Sarah to another part of the country, and my parents followed soon after. Over the years, I've pondered what he was going to do, where he wanted to lead me, what the noises were, how had he found me when he stopped to clean up the spot in the woods, but most of all, why had he even picked me that night? I suppose I should be happy it was me and not some other poor victim who might not have reacted as I did. This happened back in 2010 when I was 21. My best friend and I had blown off any sort of responsibility for the whole summer and chose to just party instead. It's probably no surprise that by the end of the summer, we were both evicted and now condemned to our parents' houses until we got our shit together again. One night, we were at my mom's place playing Left for Dead until about 2am, when Cam decided to call a cab and head back to his mom's place. He had to use my phone to call the cab company because he forgot to pay his bill. This was also the days before Uber and Lyft, so you'd have to call the station and they'd send a cab. About 15 minutes later, we could see the cab waiting outside, and he got in and left. About ten minutes later, I got a call on my cell phone from the cab company. I knew the number by heart, so I knew it was coming from the central station. When I answered, there was a woman on the line whose voice immediately sent shivers through my body. This is Badger Cab calling for Cameron. His cab has arrived. I was confused and responded with something like, uh, what? She said. Tell Cameron to come outside. The voice was echoey and distant, like it was an auditory house of mirrors bouncing around a fog-drenched void. I wasn't sure why the voice was creeping me out so much, so I tried pushing it aside and just told her that he already left like ten minutes ago. I glanced out the window and saw a car idling outside on the street. It was parked a bit to the right of my house, so all I could see were the brake lights. I figured dispatch probably sent an extra cab on accident, but the woman responded almost like she didn't hear me the first time. Tell him to come outside, she repeated, but this time with a rigid bite in her tone. He was already picked up, I repeated. There were a few weird noises for a second, like the wind was blowing into the microphone, and then the call dropped. I redialed the number to the cab company, and a man answered. I told him what had just happened, and let him know that they must have sent two cabs on accident. I don't have any female cab drivers out tonight, the dispatcher told me. I thought to myself, maybe it was a guy with a high-pitched voice. The dispatcher told me that the driver picked up my friend just fine a while ago, and that a cab driver wouldn't be calling through their landline like that anyway. When I told him there was a car idling outside and reiterated that there was 100% a woman calling, telling my friend to come outside and get in her car, he started getting very creeped out and worried. 
We both figured that someone had to have spoofed the cab company's phone number. It's pretty easy to do, but that didn't leave us with any comfort. Why was someone spoofing a cab company's phone number and waiting outside their customer's pickup location? How did she even know that Cameron had called for a cab? The dispatcher radioed his driver and made sure he had Cameron and that everything was fine. Then he let me know that he was safe and almost to his destination. The dispatcher and I talked on the phone for a couple of minutes, brainstorming what the fuck could possibly be happening. From his perspective, it's almost like someone is following and trying to lure a customer into their car, which is probably not good for business. After Cam made it to his mom's crib, he called me on the landline there to ask what was going on. The only logical explanation he could think of was that it was this stalker he's been dealing with for several years. He had a restraining order on her because she would follow him, break into his apartment, and wait for him to come home. She would do all sorts of weird, creepy shit like that. I'm not totally convinced that's what was happening though. How would she have known he just called for a cab on my phone? How would she have known where I was living with my mom? If he were leaving my actual place or the place of one of our close friends, then that would be plausible. But we were pretty tucked away on the outskirts of town in a suburb, and my mom has a different last name than I do, so she couldn't have googled it. But it's the most logical explanation either of us could come up with, so it's the one I'm betting on, until someone throws out a better theory. I must start my story by making the disclaimer that I was a bit high at the time of the event. I'd smoked with my boyfriend two to three hours before, so it was minimum really. With that out of the way, here it goes. I was at my boyfriend's house after a night of cooking and watching movies. I couldn't stay the night because I had a matter to attend on the next day. Usually my boyfriend would drop me off at home, but like I said, we'd smoked so I preferred he stayed home and I could just ride in an Uber. It was quite late, a bit after midnight, and of course he did not like the idea, but it is usually safe to have an Uber ride back home, so I brushed it off. The time came for me to leave, and my boyfriend came with me to the Uber store to say goodbye, and he made sure to get a look at the guy and the plate, and I went off. The drive from my boyfriend's to my house takes about 15 to 17 minutes. When we were about 7 minutes away from getting home, he suddenly started talking to me about gas prices and whatnot, asked if that was my boyfriend before. I said yes, and he just started giving me weird vibes, asking how old I was, if I drive a car, what kind of car, and that stuff. At some point, we were passing through quite a desolated somewhat long road, and there was a car stopped, seemingly having trouble. Then this guy asked me, Hey, if the car was to suddenly stop in the middle of the road, what would you do? Let my parents know exactly where I am so they can come and then ask for help, I responded. Smart. Now what if I stopped and there was no one, and you had no battery on your phone? That would not happen. I always have battery on my phone, I responded. And he just kept insisting on what I would do in this situation. It felt really weird and creepy, and my heart was beating so fast. He suddenly stopped asking, and I was letting my boyfriend know everything, live location included. When we were very close to getting to my house, he started talking about how dark and far from everything this was and how he'd never been here before. I don't know. It was so weird I didn't even want him to drop me off at my house because of not wanting him to know where I lived. When we got to my house, he just said bye, and I quickly walked home and locked the door as fast as I could. I'm not sure if I was just paranoid or if this was just really off, but it felt weird, and next time I will definitely be staying at my boyfriend's.
I live in the country where women get murdered in staggering numbers. About 10 to 11 are killed daily according to statistics, and most of these murders go unpunished. Hell, many don't even get investigated by police. The murders range from domestic abuse to random abductions. For example, several women have been abducted in regular taxis and services like Uber, and then their bodies turned up abandoned with signs of abuse. As for my story, I usually get around town in my own car, but I have used Uber on multiple occasions. This is not Uber bashing, by the way. Most times it is a safe and reliable service, which is why I use it and I try not to be paranoid despite the stories of women that have gone missing this way. Anyway, this means that every woman I know has thought about what they would do if they found themselves in this situation. Stuff like being on the phone with someone the whole ride, not falling asleep no matter how drunk or tired you are, sharing your location through another app, assessing whether jumping out of a moving car is worth the risk, and even carrying weapons. I carry a pocket knife and I've learned to use it. Survivors have told stories of their driver going quiet, turning off the app, and then changing routes to streets they don't recognize. They try to pass it off as taking shortcuts. That being said, one day after work I had to take a taxi home, and I scheduled an Uber as usual. The car rolled up, the make and model matched, the plates matched and the driver looked like the photo. So far, so good. I climbed inside the car, greeted the driver, and immediately shared my live location with my husband, letting him know I was on the way. As an extra precaution, I always check that the locks can be disengaged by hand, and bonus points to cars with windows that can be cranked down manually. The drive started normal. The driver was an older guy and friendly, we struck up a conversation, you know, small talk. We found a lot of traffic, and the driver asked if I wanted to take an alternate route. I pointed at an access road that I normally use to skip traffic, and he switched lanes. We were going down the access road, and this is when things started getting sketchy. He said that he made a wrong turn, and we kept driving farther and farther away from the main road supposedly looking for a way to get back on track. The app was still running as normal, and the GPS was telling him how to get back on the main road, but he kept ignoring it, saying that we were now too far away anyway, and that he knew another way to get to my destination faster. So this is when alarms start going off in my head, especially because we kept getting closer to the bad part of town. True, if you cross those neighborhoods, you can find another main road on the other side, but most people avoid it for being the aforementioned bad part of town, like police don't even patrol those streets sometimes. As he drives deeper into the neighborhood, he notices I'm tensing up. Truth is, I was debating whether I should reach for my knife, or if I was being really paranoid. And maybe the driver was honestly just trying to get to the other main road, so he starts telling me about the neighborhood and that I shouldn't be scared, that it was a dangerous place, but that good people lived there. Honestly, I wasn't so worried about the people living in the neighborhood as I was about this guy taking the scenic route. So I started talking too, about how I was aware that there was a road that crossed to the other side and that I knew exactly where I was. The conversation at some point turned to his daughter who was college age, and I kept making as many parallels as I could between the girl and myself. My hand on my pocket knife at this point, the other hand ready to unbuckle the seatbelt, while I kept an eye on the map to make sure we were getting closer to the other main road, and thankfully we were. I did not begin to relax until I started recognizing where we were. We did eventually make it to my own neighborhood, and I made him stop a block before reaching my house. I didn't want the guy to know where I actually lived, and I skipped out of there as fast as I could. I really, really hope I was just being paranoid, and that I never was actually in any danger. But damn, that was an intense ride.
when I was about nine or ten, my sister and I moved out of our school district just on the edge. It greatly affected the school's test scores, so they opted to put me and my sister in a school taxi service than to just make us change schools. It was cool. Every morning you'd get some driver to take you to school in a specific car, and then after school, you'd go to the pickup line and get in the same car with a possibly different driver. I didn't have to do the whole bus thing anymore, and it smelled far better. Win-win. There were about four different drivers that would rotate our route, so very quickly we got used to them all and felt safe. I mean, after all, these people were being vetted and sent by the school. Why wouldn't you trust them? Like any other day, we got out of school and got in the car with one we didn't see as often, but it was often enough that we knew him. He pulled off and we went about our business. I was talking to my sister about her homework. She had just started kindergarten that year and was excited. We talked about the mean girls at school who were bullying her because she was bigger, saying she was slow and failed kindergarten. Now at this point, we should be home, so I look out the window and don't recognize anything. I was confused and thought that maybe this was a new route home because of the construction. Where are we going? I asked. I have to pick someone up. I immediately knew something was off, but I was ten so I didn't know exactly what. Of course my sister didn't catch on. She was trying to do her homework then so she wouldn't have to later. I was trying to be nosy, but he had the GPS turned away from us. I also didn't have a phone, because my parents didn't think that at my age, I would need it, so it would have been a waste of money. He drove around for about 45 minutes. During so, we passed farms and very little cars, until eventually, he turned into this apartment building and called someone. I'm outside, where are you? I hear him say. No, tell him I couldn't get the boy, I got the other two though. Okay, I'll be waiting. He hung up the phone and told me again that we were waiting to pick someone up, and then he would take us home. Fifteen minutes. That man waited fifteen minutes before he called again, and he then said he was leaving. I couldn't make out what the other person said, but he replied with, No, he's not coming. He told me sorry for the wait, and he turned the car around, and we started that long journey back. We didn't get home until 5.30. My mom was livid the minute she saw the car. She took us out and went for the driver. She had to be pulled back and she was screaming. The police were called and they questioned him. They asked us where we went and I really didn't know anything about it. I was trying to remember everything so hard it all became a blur. I was just panicking. From what I remember, he wasn't charged with anything and was simply suspended for a few days, then given different kids to pick up. I may have been book smart, but ten-year-old me wasn't life smart. I am so glad nothing came of it. It wasn't until years later when I told the story to a friend that she told me she thought I was going to be sold and someone chickened out. I was drinking with a few co-workers of mine last week and decided I'd had a few too many and would Uber my way home. The guy around 35 to 40 years old picks me up in a nice car. The conversation started off normal enough until he starts talking about a girl he knows also named Jess. She was always hanging on me and trying to kiss on me and whatnot, but I thought she was too pretty, so I wouldn't date her. He went on about Jess from New Mexico and how she looked like an angel, and how he thought she was too pretty to date. It lasted for about half the ride. Then he goes on about how he's seen a lot of strange things as an Uber driver. How a woman once got into his car and began to strip completely naked, and began throwing her clothes out the window. He playfully jabbed that he hopes that doesn't happen this time, with a creepy, perverted smile. He then told me I was very gorgeous, and how I too looked like an angel. It was an uncomfortable ride, but it had finally come to an end when we pulled into my driveway. He says, five stars for you, 
as I opened my door and stepped out. But then I heard his car door open too. He got out of the car. I was pretty drunk, but he was small and I wasn't too worried. I walked to my front door, keeping an eye out on the weirdo who just kind of stood at his door as I walked into my house. Nothing else came of this, so it was a bit of an anticlimactic ending, but it was a creepy encounter for me, to say the least. Stay interesting, Uber. This happened four years ago after a concert. And yes, full disclosure, I'm a total moron. I lived in a really sketchy town, and the venue was in a moderately safe part of my town, bordering on the less than ideal parts. I'd like to note that this happened around 11pm, and so all the public transit was out of service for the night. We also did not drive downtown. I was with my boyfriend at the time, Marvin. Neither of us really wanted to download the Uber app, so he decided he wanted to call a taxi for some ungodly reason. I was tired and didn't question him. I remember him explicitly telling the guy on the phone we wanted to pay with card, so they said it would be about 15 to 20 minutes for them to arrive. We waited about a half hour, and then a taxi with the same logo of the company we called shows up. Marvin asks if the driver is ours, and he says, yeah, get in, and we followed suit. We explained to him that we're only able to pay with card because neither of us carry cash. The driver seemed pissed off and told us he'd drive us to an ATM. We explained that we talked to the company over the phone and told them we'd only be paying with card. He told us it was too late because the meter was already running and he wouldn't let us out. I started freaking out especially when he drove the opposite direction he was supposed to. I kindly let him know he was going the wrong way, since he seemed to have no idea where he was going. He kept asking me where I lived and what exit he should get off of, and when I offered to route him, he got angry and ignored me. I tried to get his information, but he didn't have his taxi license on display like he was supposed to. I was too afraid to talk back to this guy, because he had such a brash demeanor. So I sent my location to my friends and told them what was going on and took a photo of the driver when he wasn't paying attention. Before you say anything, I know I'm an idiot, especially since I have a lot of experience living in the city and taking taxis. Anyway, we finally arrived to my apartment in one piece, but the meter was almost at $30 at this point, so he demands we go to an ATM even though I wasn't sure if my campus had one, and my boyfriend decided to go look for some reason, so I was left with this asshole taxi driver. So, I was just playing on my phone trying to ignore my gnawing anxiety attack. I asked if he'd roll down the window, and he says, no. The doors were also locked inside, and when he moved up to another parking place, I almost knocked his ass out and ran away thinking he was trying to kidnap me. But of course, this only gets worse. He starts by asking me pretty general questions and actually isn't an asshole for once. He asks how long I've been in school, what I study, you know, the usual stuff. Then he asks if my boyfriend and I live together. I laugh and just answer, no, since he didn't even live in the same city as me. He asks me if I want to marry my boyfriend to which I give him a gentle, no. Then he started asking if we were having sex before marriage, and I straight up wanted to kill this guy. He proceeded to ask me if I had any experience and how many boyfriends I've had, and he tells me I'm very pretty, along with other highly suggestive questions. Finally, Marvin comes back with money. The fare is almost up to $40, and my boyfriend just gives him two twenties. The driver finally lets me out, but then has the audacity to demand a tip. And of course, my ever so classy ex says, here's your tip, you greedy bastard, and flips him off, and proceeds to cuss him out while I'm literally having a full-blown panic attack. We're both fairly certain that he would have robbed us if we had cash. Also, as a note, we called the taxi place and asked what happened, 
They said our driver reported that we never showed up. He ended up sitting outside my building for two hours while I was literally freaking out. I'm just glad I live in a high security apartment building. Okay, I know this is completely and utterly avoidable on my part, but I thought I'd share it anyway. It was 2 a.m. I had been drinking at a bar with my friends. I was drunk but relatively functional, and I decided to call a lift home. Somehow mid-lift ride, my lift was cancelled. I told him I didn't mean to cancel, and I asked the guy if I could stay in the car and reorder the lift. He told me I couldn't do that and then had me get out of the car. Immediately after I'd left the car, my phone died, so I was stranded in downtown LA after 2am. I decided to just walk until I found someplace open, which of course, literally nothing was open. Then I noticed some guy following me. I walked faster and he started calling out to me in an aggressive way. He also started walking faster. I eventually ran as he chased after me until I saw a car that was running. I knocked on the window and luckily they let me in the car. I was sitting there in silence in this stranger's car, sniffling and crying for 10 minutes in complete silence until my phone charged enough that it would last and a new lift got there. I had worse things happen to me in LA but it was definitely the scariest situation that could have ended horrifically if I hadn't found a kind stranger. I was locking up a big warehouse I worked at one night. I turned all the lights off as I went through each section, so it was pitch black behind me. I was getting a really creepy feeling I was being watched like the hair on my arms was standing up. I finished up and was going out the last door to the outside and looked back one more time because I felt so uneasy. Sure enough, I saw a shadow peek out at me behind a wall. I called the cops. They went in the building and ended up shooting the trespassers. It was two 14-year-old kids that had snuck in before I finished locking up. Unfortunately, one of them died. Being 14-year-old dumb kids, they started throwing shit at them. One thing they threw was a coffee cup that smashed against the wall behind them. The cop's story was he thought he was being shot at, so he started blasting. He got one kid right in the heart, and it killed him instantly. His friend that was standing next to him didn't get a scratch. When it all calmed down, I had to go in, and I saw the kid lying there. I had to go through a bunch of court and police depositions. Turns out the cop was a rookie and was on the job for less than six months. I don't know if the family received any money or if the cop got reprimanded or fired. I had to go to therapy for a while after that. A couple of years ago, I was living in Colombo, Sri Lanka, at a small hostel on the outskirts of the city. The hostel catered to long-term guests, so I got to know everyone pretty well who lived there. There was a guy living with us. His name was Raj, and Raj was a middleman of sorts in the casinos. In Sri Lanka, the casinos are incredibly shady places, full of Russian mobsters and other low-life criminals from China and India. The casinos are technically illegal, but they continue operation through bribery and government coercion. I went to one of them one time, and it was a surreal experience. Anyway, my friend Raj's job was to take online bets from Indian clients and make them physically in the casino. He was playing with their money and was simply the vessel to allow individuals to play from another location. He played in some high-stakes games and with a lot of money for some powerful people. Basically, a recipe for disaster. One night, he messed up, big time. One of his clients managed to gain access to his online system and stole all of the money his clients had deposited to play with, a sum well over $50,000 US, which is a fortune in Sri Lanka. 
We only found out about the theft after Raj's disappearance. A note was left in his bed, very cryptic. It said, don't look for me. I'm leaving, amongst other things. The guy vanished overnight. We made a police report and waited to hear anything. After a few days, the police came back to visit, asking someone who knew Raj to join them. The locals in the hostel were afraid to go with the police, so I volunteered and was taken to their headquarters. They took me to the back where I was shown photos of a body cut into pieces. It was Raj. He'd been cut apart and dumped into the sewer canal nearby by someone. They'd brought me there to identify the body. They never found out who did it either, and the image of those photos had never really left me. I'll forever be haunted by it, and I left the hostel shortly afterwards. The poor guy was caught up in some shady stuff, but he didn't deserve that. I used to work the 7pm to 7am shift as a nursing assistant about 15 years ago. I worked the surgical floor, so most patients were pre or post-op, but they would send up overflow from time to time, so we did have a death on occasion. Hospitals are generally well staffed at night, so I didn't spend a ton of time alone, but as an assistant, things like bathing people and changing beds was a part of my job. One night I was given a patient bath, he was elderly and barely there in all senses. When I heard knocking, I checked the door and no one was around, so I shrugged it off and went back to work. Again, more knocking, but it didn't sound like the door. The third time I realized it was coming from the window, at first this confused me, so I just opened up the blinds thinking maybe some kids were running around playing a joke. There were apartments nearby, and I guess kids are weird. When I opened the blinds, I suddenly remembered we were on the second floor, overlooking the parking lot. This sent a chill down my spine, and I waited there to see if there was any movement or reasonable explanation. When nothing presented itself, I just freaked out internally and shut the blinds. I tried rushing through the rest of the bed bath, hoping it was over. When the knocking happened again, I didn't go look. I finished up, grabbed my stuff, and got out of there. He ended up passing away a few hours later. I told a few co-workers, and they didn't seem surprised. They just kind of said weird stuff happened like that, and you get used to it. I was working night shift in a gas station slash truck stop in Tucumcari, New Mexico back in the mid-90s. I had another guy working with me who ran the diesel side while I worked the gas side. We had a guy come in around 1 or 2 a.m. and just looked at stuff in the aisles for a while before he left. I didn't really think twice about him. Later, at about 6 a.m., when I got off, I drove home past a convenience store named Allsup's. They're big in the southwest. There had to have been 30 cop cars in the parking lot. There aren't even 30 cop cars in Tucumcari, so where they came from I have no idea. I come to find out that sometime during the night, the Allsups had been robbed and the clerk had been taken into the cooler, tied up, and beheaded. I found that out when I was awoken by the state police a few hours later and asked if I'd seen anything suspicious during the night. That guy who came in and left was the only thing I could think of. The police took a copy of our security footage, which led them to a suspect who was later convicted for the murder. I can't even begin to tell you how hard it was to go to work the next day. We kind of assumed that the guy was going to rob us first, but didn't want to deal with two clerks. So he left and hit all subs instead. Buckle up, sunshine. I don't do nights anymore, but for years I did nights in residential care facilities. 
One of the spookiest was in a salt charge dementia facility. 15 D3 residents and no one but me to keep an eye on all of them. Around 3 a.m. in the morning, after doing an intentional round, which is where you check all the residents are safe and well, I hear the doorbell ring. I get a sudden wave of goosebumps because this is a secure facility and it's the middle of the night. I go and look out the window. There's no one there. I blow it off as being a hallucination. Ten minutes later, it rings again. I'm shitting myself. I go back to the window and check again. No one's there, but I look across the street and a strange car is parked there. I take a photo of it just in case, and then I go back to my station where I've been playing a game of, match the card suits, with a delightful but very demented lady. I sit down and she looks at me and says, What did that gentleman want, dearie? You look like he had a bad night and needs a cuppa. Chills go down my spine, but I brush it off because hallucinations are common with dementia, and this lady is particularly prone to not being orientated to time and place. The doorbell rings again less than five minutes later, and this time I'm freaking out. Another of my residents is up and walking the hallway, painting with a clean paintbrush to keep him occupied. I pass him on the way to the front window, and he turns to me and says, Don't answer the door alone. He might hurt you. Before carrying on painting, I'm shitting myself. I'm trying not to cry. I don't know what to do. I'm a single 23-year-old female in charge of 15 people with varying stages of dementia, and the doorbell keeps ringing in the middle of the night, and it's a weekend, so my on-call won't answer the phone. She never does on the weekends. I'm looking out the window and see the same car as before, and as I'm looking around, I see a shadow move in front of the door, and a person walks around the corner, and then looks straight in the window next to me. We make eye contact, and I scream. My residents start freaking out. I'm freaking out, and the guy just bolts. I call the police. They turn up. It's chaos because I have 15 residents who've all been woken by the commotion and now have two police officers in their space. My on-call isn't answering her phone and I'm struggling to deal with the whole situation. Eventually, after many cups of tea and Milo and two lots of PRN meds for the most challenging residents, we're mostly settled. It's now 7am and the handover shift arrives of a nurse and a caregiver. I tell them what happened and they tell me there was a woman down the road whose house was broken into, and she was attacked in her bed by a drug seeker who ransacked her house looking for drugs. I have an internal meltdown because we have drugs in the cupboard in the med room. Good drugs too. Morphine, methadone, fentanyl, all that stuff. I can't help but wonder if he was intentionally looking for us and just took the next best option. For reference, the facility was an old converted boarding house in a gentrified area, so lots of old doctors' houses in the area. Easy to make the home I worked at for a regular house. I left that job not long after because they refused to hire a second person to work the nights, despite it being understaffed according to best practice guidelines. For some backstory before the main part, I smoke weed. I'd smoked for a while, mostly for recreational use, but also partly because I have some insomnia and it helps with that. The only downside being it made me a bit paranoid, which was never a problem until I switched to vaping my THC. While vaping was much better and easier, I also started to get way more paranoid. Paranoid to the point that I thought there was someone else living in my house and had even strategically hidden several of my kitchen knives around my place. In case of a break-in, my weed-addled mind concluded. And for those logical people thinking, why didn't you just stop smoking? Well, I was weak and had grown dependent on it. I just couldn't stop. I then had to go buy replacements to use in the actual kitchen because I was high a lot those days and therefore paranoid a lot and decided to leave the knives hidden around. 
I went and bought like four more, and one large chopping style knife, with an orange rubber cover on the blade, which is important for later, because after unpacking my items at home, I had the strangest compulsion, and rather than put the orange knife away, I stuck it into my purse. After a time, the knife became at home at the bottom of my bag. It felt the same as loose receipts, tissues, anything I had in there just adding to the miscellaneous bag junk I never questioned. Now for the really crazy part of the story. One day I had finished my shift at work and had gone outside to get my dose vaping before my short walk home. I then popped in some eye drops and went to grab my stuff, but before I could leave, my manager told me my co-worker had flaked on cleanup, and I had to stay to fill in for him and lock up. Needless to say, I wasn't in the right mindset to argue, and it took way longer to clean and lock up than it should have, mostly because my manager flaked on me as well, and I kept getting distracted. When I left, it was pretty late. I was sober, though not much, and made the poor choice of going the 10-15 to 15 minute walk home rather than pay for a ride, and the even worse choice of taking a few vape hits before I set off. That's where the real story starts. The streets were a lot quieter the further I got from work, and the paranoia started to set in. I was glancing around lots, and that's when I noticed him. There was a man on the other side of the street who'd come around the corner. He was in dark clothes with a big jacket and cap on, despite it being dark out. My hackles were already raised at this point, and all my paranoid energy was hyper-focused on him. So when he crossed the street to walk behind me, I was instantly on edge. I couldn't relax with him behind me. I had a terrible feeling, so I crossed over to walk on the other side of the street. Now, you can only imagine my horror when rather than stay on his side, he crossed over with me. My brain immediately pulled a red card on that move, Alarm bells were going off, but I wasn't sure I wasn't imagining things in my semi-high state. So what did I do? I crossed the street again like an idiot and then proceeded to silently lose my shit when he followed me. I panicked, knowing I'd probably given myself away that I knew he was following me. There was no one close to help me. I was alone on a dark street with this creeper who wanted God knows what from me, and I was unarmed. Except you're not, the thought popped into my head. I remembered I'd had that big orange-covered knife in my bag. My bag was wrapped over my shoulder in front of me, so he couldn't really see me open it and shakily rummage around for the knife. I cannot describe the small rush of relief I felt when I had it in my hand, even more so when I took the cover off, and it glinted back at me. When I looked back, the man was a lot closer and walking quickly towards me. I froze and stopped walking. He looked spindly as hell and I thought I couldn't outrun him. So instead, I turned around to face him in what was both the stupidest and bravest moment of my life. He seemed surprised by that, but only when he saw the knife in my hand did he stop approaching me. We both just stood there, staring at each other. I couldn't really see his face from the shadow the cap cast on it, so I had no idea what he was thinking. I was a barely composed mess, but I felt the strangest confidence radiating from the big-ass knife in my hand, while his hands were empty. It was the same confidence mixed with my high brain and a nagging feeling that made me step forward. I was stiff and terrified, but my body started moving on its own, and I started to walk towards him staring straight at him. He didn't move an inch, but as I got closer and closer, he finally shifted his weight and slid a foot back. That little movement must have triggered some long-dead predator bullshit instinct in my lizard brain, because suddenly my gut screamed at me to rush at him. And so that's what I did. I broke out into a run straight at him, and he nearly fell over his feet, turning around. I got so close to him, I could have touched the back of his coat, but instead swiped downwards with a knife that I didn't even remember raising. It slipped across the fabric, but snagged on the hem for just a second. It would have fallen out of my hand if not for my death grip. He must have felt it, because in the next second, 
He was bolting down the pavement like a man truly running for his life, and I, for whatever reason, ran right after him. He very easily outpaced me, but I didn't stop, and when he made the mistake of looking back with what I imagined was a horrified expression, he stumbled slightly. I think he might have rolled his ankle or something, because he was suddenly much slower with an odd run. There was so much adrenaline pouring through me, I didn't feel afraid anymore. I felt so alive, I even felt a sadistic sort of pleasure, watching him scrambling to get away from me. I think I might have laughed out loud. It all came to a stop when my sane brain finally asked me, what will you do if you catch him? Now that thought immediately shut me down, and I stopped running after him. I watched as he raced off and disappeared around a bend while I panted. I was bent over, hands on my knees trying to catch my breath, trying to understand what just happened. Was I still so high I just imagined it? Did I just really run after a man with a knife? What would I have done if I'd caught up to him? The adrenaline rush quickly just turned into sheer panic and disbelief. I started shaking like a leaf and realized I was still holding the knife. I threw it into my bag, turned around, and started to run again. I ran until my lungs burned and my whole body ached, and then I just painfully jogged and walked until I finally made it home, locking my door behind me. I dragged myself to the kitchen, pulled water out of the fridge, and collapsed on the cold floor. I was shaking so much, most of the water ended up on my face, clothes, and all over the place. I may have also cried a bit. After sitting there for God knows how long, my mind running the scene over and over in my head, and all the terrible ways it could have gone wrong, I finally came to a conclusion that I was lucky as fuck to have made it home, and that I was going to stop vaping since I had no damn control over myself. Sure, my paranoia made me notice him sooner and had me prepared with a knife, but it made me an easy target. It could have gone so, so much worse. It was my bad decision making when high that let me think it was a good idea to walk home so late. I eventually got off the floor and went to my room and flushed my vape juice down the toilet. I went back into the kitchen and took the knife out of my purse. It had jostled when I ran and tore up the inside of my bag a bit. I was both relieved and weirdly disappointed it didn't have any blood on it, but I shoved that feeling deep down. I considered throwing it away, but after it saved my life, that just felt cruel. So I put the orange cover on it and left it on the countertop before taking an hour-long shower, crying a ton more, and then crawling into bed. So yeah, essentially this is the crazy story about how I quit weed and terrified myself for months afterwards. But now, when I look back, no matter how terrifying it was for me, I can chuckle a bit and hope it was even worse for that creep. I hope the image of me running after him with a knife still scares him to this day. Oh, and I still have the orange kitchen knife in one of my bags. When I was in Afghanistan, we were in the mountains right on the Pakistani border. The first few months of deployment were pretty hairy, but as soon as winter rolled around, the fighting season dried up. Things got really quiet. Night shift went from, when are we going to get hit, to, what kind of weird shit am I going to witness tonight? I think it was February or so, and I was out on guard patrol in the north-facing machine gun shack. We all had night vision devices, so since it was pitch black, we always wore them on night shifts. Well, I was looking out into the mountains when I see what looks like a guy come crawling out from behind a boulder up the hill, about a hundred meters away. Being February, we hadn't gotten hit in almost a month, because there was two feet of snow on the ground, and the temperatures were hovering right around zero. So the Taliban chucked deuces back to Pakistan and left us alone for the cold months. Now, this guy was on all fours like an animal, just sitting there, half behind a boulder, 
seemingly staring into my soul. So I pointed the machine gun at him and turned on the visible laser. I put the laser right on his nose and didn't get a reaction. Nothing. The guy just stared at me. So at this point, I'm getting a bit freaked out. I'd been blown up, shot at, almost RPG'd, and now some local is playing fuck fuck games. I radioed into our tactical operations center that there was an unarmed local staring at me on the north post, and I either wanted someone to clear me to wax him or come out and look at what I was seeing. E5 on the radio tells me he's sending a private out to babysit me. Fucking dick. The guy comes out, looks up at the hill at this guy, and promptly nopes out of there. He goes back to the tactical operations center and tells the E5 that there really was a guy just staring at us out on the mountain. So the E5 comes up to the shack and I point this guy out. I shit you not, as soon as the E5 gets an eye on the local, the guy jumps up, hops up on the boulder and starts screaming like somebody just dipped him in boiling water. Guard tower at the east corner can now also see the guy and as soon as the crazy local started howling, East Shack loses about a 30 round burst of 762 out over his head. That shit is loud when it's dead quiet. The crazy guy jumps off the rock and runs down the mountain screaming the whole way. It was dead quiet the rest of the night, but the commander upped security to 50%, meaning half the guys on our outpost had to pull security for the rest of the night. The running joke for the rest of the winter was to be on the lookout for the mind-controlled experiment that the CIA lost track of. It freaked me out. Good for a story, though. I'd freshly turned 18 and was working a closing shift at a small cafe in a grocery store. One of my regular customers comes in, Tom. Tom liked a hug. He'd come in and call out, where's my girls? And we'd all have to awkwardly hug this 80 year old man while he whispered, God bless you, in your ear. I hated Tom. He always held on a little too long and whispered a little too close. On this shift, I was closing alone and Tom came in at about 4 p.m. It's not unusual. I dealt with the creepiness and got him his coffee and bagel. He was with his wife this time. She was sweet but tired looking. He started asking me questions as I worked. What do I have to do at night? Is it hard closing alone? What time am I off? Do I ever get scared walking to my car in the dark? The questions got progressively more uncomfortable and his wife just sat there silently. I answered as friendly as I could despite the hair on the back of my neck standing up. I would catch him staring at me often. It was okay though, I was off work at 7 so it wasn't a big deal. Until he didn't leave. His wife went home without him, and he just stayed, staring for hours. I asked if there was anything else he needed. He said, No, I'm just waiting for you to get off of work. He wanted to walk me to my car. He said, because young girls shouldn't be in a dark parking lot alone. I told him it wasn't necessary and continued about my work, ignoring him now even as he stared. He left about 15 minutes before my shift ended, into the dark Michigan winter, and I breathed a sigh of relief. I didn't think twice when I punched out and headed to my car. I grabbed my snow brush and began clearing my car, enjoying the quiet that's unique to a snowy night. I began to hear the crunching of footsteps behind me. I brush it off. I am in a parking lot after all. But they got closer, past any other car and directly towards mine. It was parked away from all the others in the employee parking. I look, and it's Tom, maybe 50 feet away and smiling. He tells me that I should have looked for him. He'd been sitting outside waiting for me and I should know it's dangerous for young girls to be alone in a parking lot at night. I began shaking. I tried to open my car door, but it was frozen shut due to the earlier storm. Tom came closer, calling me a stupid girl and asking God to forgive him. 
I debated running back into the store. He was so old, he surely couldn't have kept up, right? I didn't want to chance it, though. He could have been younger, as I'm a terrible judge of age, and I'm not exactly fast myself, considering my weight. So, I stand my ground. I fumble in my purse for my pepper spray, thankfully attached to my keys. I tell him to stay back, I have pepper spray, and to go home to his wife. He glowers at me. I show him the teal canister. We're about 15 feet apart now. He's well within range. He calls me a bitch, spits at me, and heads back into the store. I get in my half-uncovered car and drive home, terrified. I called the store when I got home and told them what had happened. They kicked Tom out and told him not to come back. He began cursing up a storm and his wife had to come pick him up. He ended up getting arrested for indecent images of minors a couple years later, but I don't know the details as I'd moved away at that point. I can't say I'm sad to see him go, though. So, I work as a baker for a small bakery in a tourist town. I'm regularly at work around midnight most nights. I'm pretty close to the local strip of bars and clubs, so I hear late night party goers quite often. Sirens a few times a night, people yelling, that kind of stuff. The weirdest story though, which started out creepy but didn't end that way, was when I opened the door around 4am to someone knocking. The only reason I opened the door is because my boss had literally just texted me saying we might be getting an early delivery, so I thought it was just them. I open the door and no one's there. I glanced around, thinking they knocked and ran back to their truck to start unloading, and then suddenly someone steps out of the shadows looking like Slenderman. I panic, but hold it together pretty well. And once they got out of the shadows, it obviously wasn't Slenderman. It was just a tall, skinny girl with no pants on, or shoes, and a shirt that obviously wasn't hers. This poor girl then asks me if she can borrow a phone. It clicks in my mind what could have happened, and I tell her to come in. I let her use my phone. She tries to call her boyfriend, and tells me that essentially she came to after passing out. She didn't know where she was, and I was the only light on on the street. I didn't ask what happened to her but she was saying something about pulling a firearm earlier and was hyperventilating over the cops being called on her, so I didn't call them. Her boyfriend never answered the phone, but I helped her figure out where her hotel was and luckily it was on the same block we were already on. I couldn't leave to walk with her or drive because I had a million things in the oven, but I actually gave her my phone with the place pulled up on Google Maps and the flashlight on and she walked there. She made it back okay, showered and took a nap, and brought me back my phone later in the morning. She hugged me twice and thanked me profusely, and I'm just sitting there like, damn, I didn't think I was getting my phone back, but I'm glad it worked out okay. I don't know if she was sexually assaulted or just the type to strip when drunk or what, but she seemed okay after having been back to her hotel room. It could have gone a lot worse for her. So I'm glad I was the door she knocked on. But God, did she give me a heart attack at first. I work at a hospital second shift. Once, I stayed into third because we were short-staffed. It was about 2.30 to 3 a.m. I go downstairs to clock out. I go down and I'm almost to the office. The door at the end of the hall opens. In walks a middle-aged, 5 foot 10-ish white man. He doesn't say a word and doesn't wave. Nothing. He just walks past me. The door leads outside and the trash and linen pickup are out there. It's not a public entrance, only for people in my department. These are badge only entrances and exits. I told my coworker about it the next day. He had absolutely no idea who the man was or why he was down there. 
My coworker has worked at the hospital for 25 years. How and why does he not know this man? There's no trash or linen people on third. He was indeed wearing our scrub color. No one could identify him or tell me why he was down there. I worked as a night shift manager at a 24-7 gas station slash fast food place in a sketchy part of town. I have hundreds of stories about the wild shenanigans of crackheads. Most aren't creepy, but more. What just happened? Like the guy who gave me a magic crystal to protect me from the apocalypse because I covered the change he needed for some hot dogs. Or the other guy who tried to buy his cigarettes with lawn clippings stating, I know it ain't weed, but it works almost just as good, before conking out standing at my register. I'm gonna go with the creepiest being discovering dead bodies the first time. Two regulars OD'd while hiding in my dumpster area. I called 911 and did what little first aid I knew, but the EMT said they'd likely been dead for hours, judging by how cold they were. But I swear to God, I thought I could feel a pulse and I clearly remember hearing a gurgling noise. When I was in third grade, there was this girl in my class. She wasn't particularly liked by anyone, as she was quite the bully and overall a rude person, even to adults. She was known to have anger issues and get mad at people for what seemed like no reason. I was no exception. Her name was Carly. She'd been mean to me in the past, but that didn't deter me from going to her house one day after she'd been nice to me all day at school. Naive, I know. So, before leaving school that day, I called my mom to ask if I was allowed to go to Carly's house. She said yes, and to call her when I get there, so I can give her the address. Now when I think back, I wonder if she had a bad feeling about the situation, since she doesn't normally ask for the address, and she wasn't picking me up since Carly's house was about two blocks away. When I got there, after calling my mom of course, Carly insisted on making me look pretty, aka wetting my hair and brushing it. I let her. Then she told me to close my eyes and that she was taking me to the living room. I closed my eyes and she began to guide me towards the bathtub. We were already in the bathroom, so the tub was a solid two feet away from where we were standing. I opened my eyes just enough to see where she was guiding me. My foot hit the side of the tub and I said that this didn't feel like the living room. She said that it was, and that I just need to step over the gate. I tell her that I know this is the bathtub. She stops trying to get me into the tub and brings me to the kitchen instead. She says she's going to make cereal. I was standing behind her when she reached into her dishwasher and said she was grabbing a spoon. The way that she clarified that she was grabbing a spoon immediately told me what she was really going to grab and it was for sure not a spoon. I can still remember the feeling of dread that overcame me when she said those words. She pulls out a large knife and backs me up into a corner, holding the knife only inches away from my neck. I can't remember if any words were exchanged during this. Maybe I was just too shocked to say anything. I only stayed there for maybe 30 seconds before I pushed her aside and ran towards the door. I grabbed my backpack and put on my winter boots. By the time I had my boots on, Carly was trying to block the sliding door. I pushed past her again and flung open the door. I ran down her patio steps and out her front gate, not bothering to close it. I just wanted to get home to where I was safe. I remember her yelling at me as her dogs escaped through the open gate. I didn't care. One of her neighbors, who was in their front lawn, waved and smiled at me, clearly oblivious to what had just gone down. I ran down the road into my house, not stopping once. 
It wasn't until I was in the door of my house that I broke down. I began to cry and yell for my mom, my two older sisters yelling at me to shut up. My mom walked over to me and immediately knew there was something wrong. I explained what happened, and she was very understanding and freaked out. I can't remember if it was the same day or the next day that I had to talk to a police officer about what happened. He asked me what kind of knife it was and whatnot. I think my mom relayed most of the story to him because I don't remember having to say much. They got in contact with Carly's foster mom and Carly got in big shit for it. At school, Carly yelled at me for getting the cops involved and tried to guilt trip me by saying that her mom threatened to put her back into foster care if she did anything like that again. I told her I didn't care. The school was also notified about the situation and the teachers made sure to keep an extra eye on her. But that didn't mean I wasn't paranoid around her. I made sure to keep my guard up for the rest of the school year. Which was true. She had it coming. I always thought that it was a bit extreme to involve the cops, but I ended up making Carly never mess with me again. I ended up moving after that year for unrelated reasons, only to move back before I started sixth grade. The first day of middle school, I was waiting for them to call my name so I know which class is my home room when I hear an all too familiar name, Carly. I watch as no one goes up to join the class. Was she not here? Next, I was called. I go up to join the class that she would have been in. I found out later when the teacher was doing attendance that she'd moved three hours away just before the beginning of the school year. It's been years since then, and I can only hope I don't see her again. But if I do, I'm not too concerned. And if she does make an appearance, I will make sure that she stays away from me. That incident has given me some trust issues, but at least now I know how to choose my friends wisely. For some context, I live in a major city and currently don't do a lot of driving due to ongoing issues with my car, and the pandemic has made me turn to more delivery apps in general. So the other day, around 1pm, I decided to order some lunch after doing a lot of cleaning. I placed the Uber Eats order and found something to watch while I waited for the food. Within a few minutes, a driver accepted the order and I noticed right away that the driver, Anthony, was on a bike, didn't have a profile picture, or any deliveries on record. At first, I wasn't alarmed at all. I was almost amused, like, oh wow, guess I'm this person's first ever customer. But then a full 30 minutes passes, with no driver movement on the app, and at this point, I'm thinking maybe something is glitching out, or the driver is stuck. I contact support via the chat option, and they end up assigning a new driver because they couldn't reach the first one. Odd, but whatever. Now is when it starts getting a little weirder. The new driver assigned is in the exact same spot as the original driver was. They're also on a bike, also have no profile picture, and have no prior deliveries as well. And this driver's name was... Laurie. I let another 20 minutes pass with no driver movement before I message them myself and say, Hi there, are there any issues with the order? The app shows that the driver saw the message, but there was no response. All this time, I'm checking to see if Uber Eats is maybe experiencing some issues, and at this point, while I'm definitely weirded out, I'm mostly just hungry, so I contact support again to request some assistance. They reassign the driver again and apologize for the inconvenience. Finally, the third driver assigned is the exact same scenario. Same spot, on a bike, no profile picture, no prior deliveries. Only this time the name is Robert. 
and before I can react and go about cancelling the order at this point, because I'm tired of dealing with this, he suddenly has my food and immediately messages me the following. Hello, have your food. What's your phone number? I responded right away with, I'm not really comfortable giving my phone number out when you can just message me here. And he responded with, What's your number? Be there in ten. How old are you? And at this point the alarm bells are going off. I contact support immediately to have the order cancelled and get further assistance. I get connected to Uber's safety team who informs me that the order has been cancelled. I'll be refunded. They start taking down the details of the strange interactions. As I'm giving the woman on the phone the information she needs, I'm starting to calm down, thinking this was just some creep or something. And that's when I hear a man's voice at the door. Miss Joanna, I have your food. And I can't even describe the chill that went down my spine because of the way he said it. Making things even worse, the uber safety woman on the phone with me heard him as well and says, Is that him? We cancelled the order. I poked my head around the door. The main heavy door was open. The metal screen door was closed and locked, but it did allow us to see each other. I got a look at him, and when he saw me on the phone, he went from smiling to looking furious. He suddenly got right up against the door and kept asking who I was on the phone with. And at this point, I started asking him to leave because he was making me uncomfortable and he's getting more and more angry. He starts pounding on my door and grabbing the doorknob while shouting to be let in. The woman on the phone is asking if I'm okay. The man is still shouting. So basically, I'm in full meltdown mode at this point and hurriedly close the heavy door to lock it. The man is becoming borderline belligerent as he kicks my door, and the woman tells me to call the police. He ended up walking away from my house about a minute after that, and back up to the sidewalk. And for a moment, I thought he fucked off. So I finished my conversation with the Uber safety woman, so she could submit the report. Once she submitted it, I called the police and told them what happened. They told me if he came back to call again and they would send out an officer. I did end up having to call them again and give a full report and description of the man since he didn't end up leaving right away. He stayed in the neighborhood for almost 20 minutes. According to one of my neighbors, after she heard the yelling, she saw the man I described walk back up from my house to the sidewalk and hop into a truck with another man in the passenger seat, and they apparently just sat there staring at people walking by and being incredibly sketchy. And that's when she walked back towards my house and asked me what happened. Luckily, she was able to give myself and the cop a description of the vehicle, and the other man as well. So basically, there was a very bizarre and uncomfortable experience, and I wanted to share it to maybe see if anyone has ever experienced anything like this. Because honestly, I'm still pretty shaken up, and I will be avoiding delivery apps for quite a while. So, strange Uber Eats driver who asked me for personal information and then proceeded to try and break in. Please, let's not meet. My wife and I purchased our house about six years ago and decided to start a family. I love our neighborhood and our neighbors and especially love to go out for long walks at night. One neighbor is a single mom and has three kids. I never really thought much about it though. I often would remark to my wife about how awesome it was that she could afford such a nice house and always seemed to be around. It became apparent one day though that something was wrong. We started seeing different things sprinkled around her house. Fake plastic flowers tied to her mailbox, dressed up with ribbons and a doll head. Just creepy stuff. After a quick powwow with my neighbors, we found out that she had a history of mental disorders. 
and they all feared that she'd stopped taking her medication. Over the period of a couple weeks, she began acting more and more erratic. She would peel out of her driveway in her car, race up and down the street, wander around, and would come up to various neighbors and give them a random present. Things like a rock, a shiny stone, plastic toy, or something like that. One evening, I go out on one of my regular walks, and I can instantly tell something is up. Her car is parked sideways on her driveway. Every exterior and interior light was on in and around her house, and she was pacing back and forth in her yard. I crossed the street and hid in some shadows and just decided to observe her. I have training in human development, and I'm a generalist in knowledge around emotional and behavioral disorders. Suddenly, I saw her sprint across the street to my side of the street and jump on my neighbor's porch, right in front of the door, and just stood there. She stood there for a good ten minutes, and then, very slowly, turned around and started to walk back across the street. I thought about calling the police, but she was technically not doing anything wrong, so I started walking across the street to intercept her. I did not startle her and said loudly, Hi Chrissy, how are you? Now, I don't have any direct experience working with people during breakdowns, and after seeing her eyes and behavior, have no desire ever to. She immediately was friendly and said hi, asked about my pregnant wife, and that was when I noticed that she had two open lock knives in each hand. Now I was creeped out, but still did not feel like I was in danger. I was really more worried that she was a danger to herself. I continue talking, and she suddenly says, I really need your help. I can't get my DVD player to work. Can you fix it for me? My curiosity was out of control at this point, and I am much larger than her. I entered her house, and literally walked into a nightmare. The place was trashed. There were garbage bags and dirt on the floor. All of her possessions were stacked up in various areas of the living room and kitchen. There were broken light fixtures. The kitchen sink was filled with dishes and rotting food. Suddenly she went full on with manic behavior, started explaining how the different piles were different cities, and then became completely nonsensical in her speech. She was using English words, but completely out of context, and then would look for me for a reaction. Honestly, I should not have been there but I just finished up two years of studying human development, including schizophrenia, which is definitely what she was. It was just so utterly fascinating to me, and even though she still had two knives, I never felt threatened by her. In fact, the opposite. She was so glad to have some company. I started to quickly scan her house looking for weapons, drugs, or anything else she could harm herself with. She led me upstairs, which was completely trashed as well. She was using small potted plants with plants half dead in them as ashtrays. Her clothes were everywhere. I went into her master bedroom and honestly did try to set up the DVD player while she randomly walked around the house talking. Even though the TV was like mine, I just couldn't get the TV to recognize the DVD player for some reason, and I was starting to get nervous. During this time, I noticed that she had a set of knives down, and I quickly folded them up and pocketed them. I apologized to her that I couldn't get the DVD player to work, and then asked her if she thought it was time for her to take her medication. She assured me that she already had, and asked me if I had a joint. I told her no. I scanned the upstairs and saw no more knives or weapons, and it was sad. You could tell that her kids had left in a hurry. Their rooms were trashed and they had left their Nintendo DS's behind. Not seeing any more weapons, I went back downstairs to double check the kitchen, but she was watching me now and I didn't want to be obvious. I apologized for not being able to help her, but thought it was time we both went to bed and that she might want to stay inside now. She agreed with me. I left and when I finally went outside, realized that I had just walked into her madness and even felt a little strange afterwards. And it just been too bizarre. 
The next day was Mother's Day. I found out later that her husband's parents had taken her kids away from her a week before that, due to her erratic behavior. With Mother's Day approaching, she just lost it even more. Eventually she went away and came back about a month later, and she was back to her normal self. Friendly, but subdued. I still live down the street from her, and I say hi to her, but it's the saddest thing to see. You can tell she's on her medication and regulated, but she has no emotion, no personality. She's lost her husband and her children to her disease, but the big unknown is where she gets her money. She used to be a corporate buyer for a large corporation, buying lots of goods all over the country. She had another episode about a year ago, and I found out that I'm now her reach out to person during them. I was working in my yard and she came up to me raving mad that they would not put a stop sign on my street and started swearing and ranting and then gave me a glass stone that she told me would protect me and my beautiful family. She's back to being fine now, but I know what signs to look for around her house. I still have the glass stone and I keep it on a ledge I can see when I walk down the stairs in my house. To me, it serves as a reminder of how truly lucky I am with what I have, and how bad life can be for those afflicted with mental illness. I also found out her teenage son was killed while out skateboarding at night. She went off her medication, as if the tragedy could not get any worse. She came over to see me and broke down crying in my arms. This is such a tragedy. I'm glad I can at least be there for her. Really not the way I wanted to spend my Saturday morning, but sadly here we are. I'm writing this as I sit down, more scared and anxious than I ever have been, beyond belief. I'm a female who was at my friend's flat. We were with her sister and also another female friend. Lots of good vibes and laughs. Just normal girly time. At some point, uh, a trusted nice guy and a bit of a simp, but someone we wouldn't feel uncomfortable around, arrived. Women know what I mean, especially about the nice best friend to girl guy. Anyway, he was very approachable at first. Very polite and sweet, but I was always told never to trust anyone who is nice on first appearance. It's usually overcompensation for something, or to hide something evidently darker, as I found out later on. He slowly became more argumentative, and had a very patronizing, condescending tone, which would rise for no reason. He acted like he was being completely normal, despite being passive-aggressive. It was a quick turn. Moving on, he attempted to take my water bottle and insisted to everyone for no reason when I took it back out of his pocket, which is weird anyway. Who put someone else's Evian bottle in their pocket? He then insisted it was his and that he brought it with him and genuinely seemed to believe it was his. This was when I got a weird gut feeling something was just not quite right. We then proceeded to have a back and forth. Nothing harsh said, but I told him he thinks he's the smartest person in the room, and I could see right through him. Quite an assumption to make about someone, but as a human, we can sense danger. Then, to top this already slightly alarming experience, he started pulling very vulgar sex faces and hand motions, not even in a jokey way between friends. He did it every time he got the chance. He was pretending to do some weird sex motion, Needless to say, I was very disgusted, as I barely even knew him, and it wasn't in a badger-type way where it was laughed off as a little one-off, but he repeatedly did it. He did this to me as no one was looking, and stood slightly behind my friend who was talking, so he could make these ugly gestures to me. He kept asking me to come back to his, and told me he wants to take me abroad, as he needs someone to look after him when drunk. I told him I'm not a babysitter in a bit of a joke way, and he straight away went very stiff and defensive, 
slightest things seemed to trigger him. After being in a high alert, abusive situation for many years, sadly you recognize even more so that something in the air just isn't right. Even if you're not 100% of your gut feeling, always follow it, because it's there for a reason. There's absolutely no need for taking chances. Sadly, this world is too unkind. Anyway, my friend had gone to bed. My friend's sister was getting ready to leave, but I was very reluctant to be left alone with him for obvious reasons. She ordered a taxi and asked him to walk her out to it. He agreed, and I told him very bluntly I'm locking him out, and his immediate response in a very nonchalant manner was, yeah, I would. That for some reason was what made me double down wholeheartedly on making sure I locked him out. Despite my friends maybe getting upset I've locked another friend out, I wasn't too concerned about what they would say, as I knew in my heart this man had ill intentions. I got the vibe he was pre-warning me, a bit like an animal playing with his food before eating. He was enjoying being weird and making me uncomfortable. As he walked out the door with my friend, I immediately locked the door. And thank you, God and Jesus above, that I locked the door, as usually I would forget. But in this instance, I am forever grateful I turned the lock. Thinking I was free of this weird creep, I heard talking at the door, and someone trying to slightly push it open. I told him I was feeling scared and don't feel comfortable at all in his presence. I called him a weirdo and a creep, and his response was, I'm not that weird. But he said it in an inquisitive way, like he was trying to convince himself, and not at any point did he take offense to my dramatic accusations and labels. I told him he had suppressed sexual urges, and that he won't be taking them out on me. He then proceeded to say, Oh, but not in a cute way. It was in a very apathetic, weird tone. Even in these interactions, I was panicking more, because instead of just thinking he was a run-around normal creep, I was digging into something much weirder and darker. He proceeded to attempt to open the door again, begging just to talk to me for two minutes, and weirdly enough, I couldn't make out if it was actually him through the door as I had bad eyes, but I knew it was him, obviously due to the conversation we had. He stood outside for 15 minutes, pretending to book a taxi, and he kept repeating that our mutual friend was gone. He then left, and I was on high alert. I was standing by the door, and out of nowhere, I saw a white guy. The original guy was not white, so I noticed it wasn't the same person. He walked straight over to the door and covered the peephole with his thumb. This made my heart literally quiver. I was genuinely scared for my safety in a way that was very unsettling, and I hope no one else feels that fear. But those that know, your heart just sinks in this horrible way. The door was the only thing separating me from this utter evil predator. What made it so weird? is that he was attempting to get a friend to come round, and that we should all go out to the town. It's weird, as no one was dressed for such outings. But looking back, that second guy who came to the door ever so randomly, and covered the peephole, looked like he left something on the floor. But I'm obviously not going outside to check, as I panicked so bad, I don't remember if I saw him leave the little hallway or communal entrance but I'm not sure if he did. I woke my friend to tell her. She could see I was so scared. I told her what happened, and she said she's never had anything like this happen, and how she doesn't know an older white guy, saying that she's a 24-year-old Jamaican woman and just doesn't happen to know any middle-aged white guys. It wouldn't have been so scary, but the way he just came right to the door and immediately covered the peephole, it was like he knew someone would be looking through there. I believe maybe this was connected, because what are the odds of this happening so close to each other in about a ten minute difference, and not have some form of connection? Either way, 
Please remember to lock your doors. It saves lives as simple as it is. If that door had opened when he attempted due to being unlocked, who knows what I would have endured. I've never had anything this creepy happen, and I live in a big city, and I have a slightly unconventional lifestyle, so I have seen it all. People are very dangerous. Please be aware, if you feel something isn't right, it's not. A buddy of mine had just bought a camera and liked playing around with the exposure open, so we took a couple of colored plastic cups and went out to a part of the woods where we knew there was a trail we could walk down. It was close to midnight because we wanted it to be dark out to be able to see the effect of the light. Me and my friend held the cups over our heads and used the flashlights on our phones to light up the cups. I had a phone that I had to start recording to be able to use the flashlight, and so I did. The plan was to start at the top of a hill and walk down the trail towards the camera to create sort of a string of light. As we started to walk down the hill, me and my buddy started chatting, but quickly noticed his eyes were wide open, looking at me as if a werewolf had emerged right behind me. Naturally, I said, what? getting really scared immediately as well as we got totally quiet. He says in a high-pitched, whisper-screaming type of voice, You don't see that? And then I heard it. The sound of laughter from kids not older than six years old. Both of us panicked and started running down the hill, and we got to our friend with the camera way too early, and he says, What the hell are you doing? You have to walk slowly towards the camera or you'll ruin the shot. We told him that we heard kids laughing in the woods, and he didn't believe us, naturally. But I realized I had the camera running. So maybe it caught something, and I played it back to him. The microphone picked it up perfectly. Two or possibly three kids, around six years old or so, in the middle of the woods. No house or guardian or light in sight. Needless to say, we note right out of there. So while I was attending cosmetology school, I worked at Applebee's trying to support myself. Emphasis on try. I went to both every day, which resulted in 18-hour work days. I didn't mind it this time because I was in an abusive relationship and didn't really want to be at home. However, I was still very tired at the end of the day, considering I worked from 8 in the morning until 3 in the morning. Well, I was closing one night, and one of the closing duties at the bees was to clean the bathrooms. I'm a female and it wasn't uncommon for men to come into the bathroom while I was cleaning it. Usually they would wait for me to leave so they could do what they needed to. This night was different. As I was cleaning, a guy walks in. I look up and see it's one of the cooks. Usually the cooks were friendly, so I just said, Hey Shannon, let me get out of your hair. Without saying a word, Shannon proceeds to push me into a stall. He locks the door. He pins me against the wall and just stares into my eyes for what seems like an eternity with an angry look on his face. The entire time, I'm absolutely freaking out and beg him to let me out. He says nothing at all and just keeps staring at me. After what was probably only about a minute but felt like an hour, he moved out of the way. I unlocked the stall door and ran to the safety of the front of the house. I immediately clocked out and left. I didn't tell my managers I was leaving or what had happened. I quit about a month later. I haven't seen Shannon since I quit, but Lord knows I'll murder him if I see him again. Fuck you, Shannon.
Once, I was working in a restaurant and got done around 12-ish. I always rode my bicycle to and from work. It was about 15 minutes along a bike trail next to the train tracks. This trail was constantly straight, but had a few exits here and there. It also only had a few small parts of it lit up by street lights. So without my front bicycle light, I would be totally blind for the most part. So, this one night, I leave on my own home after the shift, and I notice a guy is biking behind me, which isn't too weird at that time of night, in a busy city. It was weird that he had no lights, and was still there after the first main exits, which after that led to a small town, but I thought it might just be a coincidence. I began to feel a bit creeped out, and thought I might just be tired, and the darker the night is getting to me. So, I decided to bike a bit slower and let this person pass. There was definitely enough room on this trail. The person started drifting along at the same speed as me, and made no attempt to pass or even come closer. This is about when I'm a few minutes away from home, and decide to take some random lefts and rights instead of going straight home, just in case this person was following me and wouldn't find out where I live. I bike around, going in random twists and turns in a suburban neighborhood, and he's still behind me. What I then did, as I noticed I was heading straight for a long, small, dark path, only for bicycles, I decided to turn into one of the houses and hide in the dark shadows from their garage. I heard this person pass the house and break quickly in that small path. At this moment, my blood is boiling. Now I hop on my bike, and when I pass the edge of that street, I stopped and stared that person in the eyes. I biked so fast then, I did another few extra loops here and there until I felt safe and alone again to go home. I've never had anything like it afterwards, and I still don't know who or why it could have been. But I'm happy not knowing. This story happened to me back when I still lived at my parents' house. I was commuting to college at the time and had three siblings that also lived at home. My brother and two sisters. For some context... We lived on five acres in rural Ohio, surrounded on both sides by woods and farm fields. Additionally, during the week, my dad normally left for work at 2 a.m., so I always felt like it was my job to be the man of the house, because he was gone during the times when you would imagine something sketchy happening. However, on this night, because it was a weekend, my dad was home. I woke up to the sound of my brother's voice trying to get my attention. We had separate rooms upstairs, and coming out from our rooms, you could look down over the banister and see our front door. When I woke up, it took a few moments to get out of the haze and realize what was going on. I looked at the clock, and it was around 2.30 a.m., and my brother told me there were two men at our front door. Of course, now this is a real wake-up call. We quietly walk out of my room and peek over to look down at the front door. When we looked down, there was no one at the door, but I noticed my parents off to the side, out of view of the glass on the front door. I whispered down to my dad, and he told me there were two guys who'd been talking to each other and knocking on the door. Hearing my dad say this freaked me out even more. I went back into my room and grabbed my pistol, quickly shuffling down the stairs after looking to make sure they weren't at the door. If they had been, they would have easily seen me coming down the stairs, as it is in direct view of the door. My brother is right behind me as we head over to where my parents are, whispering to try and find out what is going on. My parents had woken up to our dog barking and come out to see these two men knocking loudly at the door. At this point, 
we see the men return, and they begin knocking again, despite the fact that no one had come to the door, and our dog is still actively barking. The fact that they were there at this time, in a location where houses are spread out hundreds of yards, and still knocking while the dog was barking, made the situation even more terrifying. After a couple of minutes, the men walk away, and we all shuffle across the kitchen into the family room to peek out of the windows into our driveway, which is lit up by our outside light. There was a black Cadillac sitting there, but no one was inside from what we could see. Immediately the question was, where did those guys go? They weren't in their car, and they were no longer at the front door. Unfortunately, we figured out the answer when the handles on our back French doors started jiggling. They were actively trying to enter the back of our house, which enters the kitchen. At this point, I just remember my mom frantically saying, David, as pure terror overwhelmed her. At this point, two things happened. Adrenaline filled my body as I prepared my handgun, horrified at the very real possibility that I might have to shoot these men. Secondly, my dad finally grabbed the phone, called the police, and calmly told them what was happening. Thankfully, after a minute of jiggling, they stopped at the back door and disappeared again, only to return knocking at the front door. However, at this point, several minutes had gone by, and suddenly we saw the local police fly up in multiple cruisers with their lights on. As they whipped into our driveway and front yard, the two men bolted away, attempting to run the long way around the house across the driveway. One of them disappeared out of our view, but the other one was intercepted by an officer yelling for him to get on the ground. He didn't, and he was immediately tased, and then proceeded to fall on the ground. Some of the officers went around the house after the other guy, and one of them came to talk to my dad and I as we came out the front. They ended up finding the other man hiding in my sister's little playhouse in the backyard. It appears both of them were drunk and or high, as one of them had cocaine on him. While they were both arrested that night, we never did find out what they were charged with or what happened to them. Needless to say, the whole experience wasn't fun. This happened to me at my previous job. Howard was a senior in my team. One day during chit-chat, he asked me to recommend some colognes to him, as I know a lot about perfumes and fragrances. I recommended some, and then he asked me to help him buy it. I suggested it's better to try it out in person before buying for colognes, but he insisted many times that I buy my recommendation for him. So I eventually did. After I bought it, I WhatsApp him with a receipt. He texted back, Thanks, I'll treat it as a gift from you. LOL. He did pay me back later, so I thought he was just making a joke. The manager of my previous team, Alfred, asked me to go grab a drink after work another day, as he noticed I was frustrated at work lately. He also said I could invite more people if I wanted, so I invited Kate, my closest friend in the company, who also was in Alfred's team. Kate suggested to me that I invite one more colleague, as she believed it was better to hang out in a group of four. I think for a bit, and invite Howard, as he had worked under Alfred before. I told Howard that Alfred wanted to buy us all drinks. I have drinks with Kate and another colleague Aiden together regularly after work, so that was the first time I hung out with either Alfred or Howard. After the drinks, we decided to take the last scheduled subway home. Only Howard and I live in the same direction. I knew he lived near a certain stop from previous chit-chat, and that's about ten stops before mine. I live quite far away from the subway station, so I planned on taking a taxi after getting off at my stop. After we got on the subway, Howard started saying things that made me uncomfortable. 
For instance, he asked when he could become as close to me as Aiden, or whether Aiden had ever been to my apartment. To be honest, I wasn't even that close with Aiden, and we were more like work friends. I was annoyed by all those questions, but I thought to myself, it's just a few more stops until his. I'd have my peace soon. Howard didn't get off at his stop. I asked him about it, to which he replied he had some errands near the stop before mine the next morning, so he'd be staying at a friend's near that stop. Luckily Howard shut up soon, probably because of my lack of response, so I just looked at my phone in silence. I just noticed Howard was still there when I was about to get off at my stop. He followed me off the subway and ordered to take a taxi together. He said he'd drop me off at my place and then go to his friend's place, which would make no sense as these two drop-off points were in completely different directions, so I declined by saying I planned to walk home. Then he offered to walk me. I said it's an hour away and persuaded him to get a taxi outside of my subway stop. He finally budged and called a taxi through the app which shows the estimated fare. I overheard him murmuring the amount, which was definitely more than traveling from my stop to his friend's stop. It was more like traveling to his first stop. I suspected the stay at his friend's thing was a lie all along, just to follow me home. A week later, Kate told me she overheard Howard insinuate to Alfred that we were in a relationship. I was creeped out by Howard, but didn't bring it up to Alfred, as he didn't ask me about it either. A month later, Alfred invited his team and a lot of people he previously worked with to dinner to celebrate the end of a project. After the meal, Alfred asked me where I was headed to as he knew I had two apartments. Kate and Howard were walking with us. I told Alfred I'm going back to the apartment in the same direction of Kate's. Howard joined the conversation and said he's going that direction too, as a friend was hosting a party there. Kate and I were doubtful. On the subway, Kate asked him where the party was, and Howard replied with the same stop as mine. So Kate and I pretended we had other places to hang out, and I was not getting off at that stop. Eventually the stop came and Howard got off. I rode with Kate to her stop, and then got on another subway back at my stop. I avoided him as much as possible before I could quit my job since then. For starters, my parents have always taught me how to be independent. I live 30-ish minutes away from New York City by train, so I was taught not to be afraid of the subway systems. I quickly learned how to find my way around New York City and my town in Jersey via public transportation, and was always checking in with my parents whether I was going to practice or a movie with my friends, so it was never a big deal. Anyway, a few weeks prior to the incident, the internet in our house wasn't working, and I needed the computer to finish some research paper. Since the library was closed, my brother took me to this internet cafe a few blocks away from our house. While there, my brother was talking to his friend Charles, and introduced us both. Little did I know, this Charles was about to save my life. Oh, I almost forgot an important detail. This cafe was on the main street of my town, and there was a bus stop a block away from the cafe. A few weekends after meeting Charles, my friends invited me to go bowling in the city. My parents said okay. I was 14 so obviously I had to ask for permission, and I was on my way around noon. We bowled, got pizza, talked about my friend's new puppy. Typical girl things. Everything was fine, until I was making my way back home. 3 p.m. There are delays with the subway system. Instead of waiting it out, I decided I could just take another subway home. It would drop me off at the Newark Penn Station, and I would be one bus ride away from home. No problem. 3.15pm. I'm on the subway, and I notice that this older man is staring at me. It creeps me out, but it's nothing new in New York City. I ignore him. 3.50pm. 
I arrived at Newark Penn Station, and this man sees me get up to go. He makes eye contact, smiles. He hurries behind me. Mind you, I'm a young, small girl at the time, so I'm an easy target. He's creepy, so I decided to walk fast and get lost in the crowds. Doors open. I speed walk through people. This guy must have had 20-20 vision because as soon as I arrived at my bus stop, he was right behind me. Around 4pm-ish, I'm sitting next to an elderly looking lady at the bus stop. The creepy guy is pacing back and forth less than 10 feet away from me. He's looking at me, smiling, pacing the floor. Every part of my young body is saying, run, now. He's bad news, but there's nowhere to go, and somehow sitting next to this older lady made me feel safer. I take my phone out to text my mom. It's dead. Wonderful. Thankfully, more people have arrived at this bus stop, and I feel better. There are witnesses around. He can't do anything, but he's still staring and pacing back and forth. 4.15 p.m. The bus arrives, finally. I quickly get in and sit as close as possible to the driver. I don't know why I didn't tell the bus driver what was happening. I was young, scared, naive, and didn't want to burden the driver. Stupid, I know now. My stop is the very last one, so I thought, the creepy guy has to get off the bus before me. There's no way he's going to stay until the end. Many, many bus stops later, this guy is still on the bus. He did this creepy thing. Whenever the bus stopped, he would get up with everyone else, and instead of getting off the bus, he would sit closer and closer to the front. There are fewer and fewer people on the bus, so I realize this guy is getting off whenever I get off the bus. This means, if I get off at my stop, he can follow me home find out where I live, or maybe I'll never get home. 5 p.m.-ish, there were only two bus stops separating me and my house. This guy, a lady, and I are the last ones inside the bus at this point. I decide I'm getting off early because I'm not having this guy know where I live. I get off a bus stop early. He sees me and follows me. I pick up speed. He picks up speed. Fuck it. I run. And now he's running after me. In mid-panic, I remember the cafe. It closes soon. I'm a block away. I run for my life to the cafe, and this guy is right behind me. As I'm approaching the cafe, I see Charles outside, locking up the place. He sees me and knows there's something wrong. I guess he sees the fear in my face and this older guy running after young me. I get to him, and Charles immediately pushes me inside the cafe and locks the door behind us, therefore locking the creep outside. My heart is pounding. I quickly tell Charles that this random guy's been following me across three towns, and that I was scared. He calls the cops. The guy is staring inside the cafe, and I'm staring back at him, protected by the lock, yet clear glass door. I had to remember him. The creepy guy smiles and walks away as if nothing had just happened. Little did I know that Charles' uncle is a cop in our town. A few minutes later, the cops show up. After describing him in vivid details, it takes them minutes to catch this creep still walking down the main street. We later find out that this creepy guy had a warrant out for his arrest for armed robbery, and he had prior accounts of sexual assault. Had it not been for Charles, I don't know what would have happened to me that day. Thanks for saving my life. And no, this did not deter me from public transportation or from exploring the city alone. My parents did freak out and got me mace though. As an adult, I traveled all over the world, sometimes alone, but I'm hyper aware of my surroundings because of what happened at 14. I 
I don't even know how to begin this. To be honest, I was only able to piece together what happened a few months ago. I guess I'll start from where I believe the beginning is, but I can't assure you it was the first time I saw him. At the time, I lived in a European city, very central and cosmopolitan. When I was about 15 years old, I was extremely interested in philosophy books. I didn't feel I could talk to my friends about the subject without boring them. So when this man approached me on the street with a pamphlet about Plato classes, I was pretty excited. He was about 28 to 30 years old, very tall, skinny, and crazy eyes. I remember I was a smartass and thought that reading two of his most well-known books made me interesting. So we started debating. It was a nice conversation and it lasted about 10 minutes, but it was getting late so I left it at that. He told me his name, but I honestly cannot remember it. A couple of days after, I found him on the same street at a totally different time. It was always very crowded, so I wasn't especially spooked about it. I was getting out of the subway after classes. Mind you, I took this route every day until I graduated high school. I didn't live on that street, but that's where I got out of the subway and then waited for the bus that would get me home. This time he didn't have any pamphlets. He had a lollipop in his hand. And I know it sounds cliche, but it was so eerie to see a six-foot guy just sucking his lollipop and staring straight at me. He said hi. I said hi back. He tried to get the conversation going, but I could feel this weird energy in the air, so I just decided to cut the conversation short. I'd see him once or twice a week, and I just assumed he lived there and happened to be going for a walk at the same time I was getting home. I honestly believe this weird guy, twice my age, just happened to find his way to me so many times. That is until I saw him in my neighborhood. I was having a coffee with a friend, and she was telling me that she met this cool guy while playing volleyball on the beach, when the guy, I shit you not, just appeared out of nowhere. He approached my friend and they talked for a bit. Yes, he was the guy she was talking about. He seemed mildly surprised that we were friends, but didn't give it much thought. So I didn't either. When he left, I started feeling uneasy, but my friend thought he was cool, so I didn't voice my concerns. There's this thing about teenage girls that makes them think they're very mature for their age, so we just assumed he'd befriended us separately and then found out we were friends. At the time, none of us had social media, so I can't understand how he managed to insert himself into my friend group. Eventually, my friend left to study abroad, and the subject died. I would see the guy now and then, on the same street of my commute, but we would only speak for a few minutes, and that's it. This went on for about six months. Sometimes he would pretend he didn't know who I was, but would still approach me, saying that I looked familiar. Sometimes he would greet me very warmly. Looking back, I guess he was dealing with some kind of mental health problems. Slowly, he was getting bolder. One time he asked for my number and tried to hug me. I could feel that something was very wrong, but at the same time, I thought I was being the weird one and he was just a nice guy. Still, I gave him a fake number. This other time, we went to a church on a school trip, and he was waiting outside, talking to my peers. He played it cool, saying that he'd seen my face somewhere but was not sure, as if I hadn't been seeing him almost every week for a year now. I was very stupid. I never thought about talking to my parents about this. After all, the guy was not violent. He was not mean. In my head, he was just a lonely man who happened to have a strangely similar routine. I started to get scared though. I'd look behind my back when I was alone at night. I'd avoid dark streets. I was kind of paranoid, but still, I ignored my gut feeling and shoved it in the back of my mind. After all, as long as I gave him a few minutes of my day when he called out for me, everything would be fine. When I turned 17, I stopped seeing him. I think this went on for about a year. It was a relief, honestly, 
I could sense that what happened was bizarre, but I'd explain it to my friends like it was funny, like it was a joke. Eventually, I started attending college, so my everyday route changed. I stayed in the same city, though. One day, I had to go through the same street again. I can't remember why. I just know that I was walking, minding my own business. It was maybe 9pm, and then I turned around the corner, and there he was. He saw me, smiled, and said he was lost. He asked for directions, and I swear to God, I felt primal fear at that moment. I felt I was dealing with a truly insane person because we'd crossed each other's paths for two years straight in this exact same spot and he was acting as if he didn't know me or the intersection. Something about that messed with my mind for a while. I just kept walking. I didn't look at him, didn't utter a single word, and then he lost his shit. For the first time, I saw what he really was. He tried to grab my arm and screamed that I was the biggest bitch ever. He said that he hoped my mom died of cancer. He said he would kill me. I know I wasn't alone as there were still quite a lot of people outside, but no one said anything. He kept screaming his lungs out and I just started running. I ran and cried. That was the last time I ever saw him. Two years ago. He has long since stopped talking to my friend. No one knows who he is. I can't remember a name to go to the police and file a report. It's like my mind has tried to erase him. He was a stellar stalker though, because I only understood that's what he was years after the fact. I'm just grateful I'm safe. I used to live in a small town where everyone basically knew everyone and people in the smaller towns in the area. In 2018, after I'd lost my job, I was going to a place where people from 16 to 30 learned how to look and apply for a job and a lot else. There I met a woman. Her name was Yivi. One day Yivi started to talk about a friend of hers who lived out of town with her mom, her dog, and her creepy German stepdad. Her friend told her that she desperately wants to move out because her stepdad makes her so uncomfortable. Her bedroom is right next to their bathroom, so she'd usually put on her new clothes in her bedroom, but now she does it in the bathroom because he'd look at her inappropriately when she walked to her bedroom. Her stepdad would get off the couch and try to spy on her while she was in the bedroom. I had a gut feeling that this wasn't the last I'd hear of him, and I'm sad to say that I was right. I broke up with my ex in 2019, but shortly after that I got a job at a thrift store, taking care of jigsaw puzzles and board games. 2020 came along, and I became so lonely that I downloaded an app that was only aimed at finding friendship. I started talking to a guy in January who said that he was 27 years old, and that he was from Germany, and that he lived in the exact same town that Yivi said her friend did. I thought that was odd, but out of curiosity I talked with him some more. He said that he moved to Sweden with his wife and their dog, and that's where red flags start to rise, but he's looking for someone to talk to because they're going through a divorce right now. He wanted to meet and perhaps go for a walk in the forest near his house. He talked about hobbies he had, like his motorcycle, and other things I've forgotten about right now. My creep meter was pegging, and I ghosted him hard. Eight months later, when I was laying a jigsaw puzzle, I heard a man with a German accent come in. I felt something was off, but I continued to do my job. For obvious reasons, we didn't have a lot of people who worked there at that moment, but this made me the youngest woman there. My male boss was going to do something before he showed him the place. While my boss worked, this guy roamed around and then asked if he could sit down and talk to me. I said okay, because of course there could be more than one German person even in a small community. Remember all the important things. Yes, 
he told me almost all of the same things again. He wasn't the age he said he was. He was old, if not older than my father, and he's now 53. The color disappeared from my face, and I started to scratch my neck in fear. He trauma dumped on me. He talked about how he slept with a young girl in Germany, got her pregnant, and was forced to leave because of this. Apparently she gave birth to a son, and his son reached out to him when he was older. His son had told him that he was gay, and that creep is now blaming himself for making his son gay. He talked about his dad's alcoholism and other things I can't remember. He also asked if we could eat together, but I declined. HR came into our working room and she called my name. I turned my head and she clearly saw that I was afraid. She said that she needed to talk to me. I only nodded, stood up, and walked over to her, still scratching my neck. We walked to another room where she sat me down on a sofa and asked me if I was okay. And all I could say was, I'm afraid of this man. And when I'd calmed down, I gave her the short version of what happened, and her eyes widened. It was close to closing time, so she asked if I wanted to go home, and she'd make sure that he'd leave ten minutes after I'd gone. I didn't even look at her once. I was so frozen in fear that I only stared at the wall while continuing to attack my neck. After a few minutes, I only nodded. She walked me to the employee's entrance and stood there while I walked home. I saw the damage I'd done to myself when I arrived home. My female boss wasn't there until Monday, and unfortunately, HR wasn't there that day. My boss came over to my desk and said that she'd spoken with HR, but she wanted to hear it from me. I told her exactly what had happened, and I also told her that I'd heard about him before. Her response was, and these are her exact words, but in English, I've heard of him before because I have an old friend who unfortunately is at a mental hospital right now. She told me that he's the kind of person who likes to attack young, thin, vulnerable, and insecure women. My fear turned into rage. I just looked at her and said, Are you crazy? You know what type of man he is. You knew that I'm working here, and you still hired him. She said that she talked with the male boss who also knew about him, and they decided that people can change. I said that I agree, but he's already shown that he's not willing to. She decided to make him work during the weekends, and forbade him to come to work during the week when I was there. Of course he showed up anyway. When HR was there, she'd tell him to go out. But when she wasn't, you could clearly tell that he was looking for another victim, or for me. My bosses are lovely people, even though they're severely confused. I should have reported them, but it's too late now. I moved to a city that's more than two hours away, and he doesn't work there anymore. I live in a little suburban area on the outskirts of a city. My apartment is on the ground floor and faces into a cul-de-sac with a car park. Recently, I've been hearing a lot of cat-related kerfuffle from the area. I didn't think much of it at first. There are plenty of cats, pets, and strays in the area. They fight, they screw, all that stuff. I'm well used to the kinds of unearthly noises cats can make. They can be pretty freaky, especially when you wake up in the darkest hours of pre-dawn to them. Anyway, I'd been hearing this one particular cat, I thought, for several days, and it always sounded like it was coming from the car park. I know we, as humans, tend to anthropomorphize these things, but it was a sad little cry. After a while, I started to think that maybe this was a pet that was lost or hurt. Maybe it had been beaten up by one of the big strays in the area. The old heartstrings started to pull every time I heard it, but I couldn't spot the little guy anywhere. I thought about trying to put out some tin fish or something, but there are so many other cats that I had no guarantee that this one would benefit from it. 
The next time I heard it, I decided to go take a more thorough look. It was about 10pm and it was freezing cold, but out I went into the car park, looking around the bins and checking under cars. The cat stopped crying as soon as I opened the door, but I guess it must have heard a person and clammed up out of fear. I got about halfway across the space, when a street light, right at the center of the cul-de-sac, the only one that lights up the space, went out. Now, that's pretty weird. The street light isn't motion activated or anything. It's time to come on at night and turn off during the day. It stays on all night. I've never seen it randomly turn off before. Alright, weird electrical fault. I turn back to my apartment. Fortunately, the motion-activated light above my door that turned on when I stepped out is still aglow, so it's not like I've been plunged into total darkness. Except that one turns off too, pretty much as soon as I turn around. Huh, <laughs> what a coincidence of timing, I say to myself, trying to ignore the growing sense of unease. What do I have to be nervous of? I'm standing in a car park in a cul-de-sac, not the middle of the woods or something, but it's surprisingly dark out there without those lights. Fine, I'll just trigger my light again by moving around, and the damn thing wakes me up all the time because it's too sensitive. It picks up cars and people as soon as they enter the cul-de-sac, except now it's not working. I wave my arms, move closer, nothing triggers it two weird electrical faults in a row. Not impossible, right? But I can't help but feel creeped out by it. Now the cat, that's been silent since I stepped outside, starts crying again. Except it's not just one cat. The crying is coming from several places at once and started almost at the same time. There've got to be at least three or four different cats screaming loud from different parts of the car park. I can't see any of them. It's just their weird alien voices. Enough is enough. I go back into my apartment. I'm not going out to investigate if I hear it again. It's not a paranormal event for sure, just a series of creepy coincidences. But still, it weirded me out. Last year, I was going out for drinks with my friends, but since I had to go to uni the next day, I only stayed till around midnight. My boyfriend promised to pick me up and go home with me, because I don't like to take the subway alone at night. But since I was pretty drunk by then, I took a little too long walking out of the pub. Unfortunately, we had to wait for the night bus, since the subway closes on weekdays at night. For context... My boyfriend and I don't live together, but very close to each other. It's around a 15 to 20 minute walking distance between us. Both areas are pretty shitty. He lives near a train station, and I live in a cheap, bad district with a high crime rate. My building has two entrances on two different streets, because it is a corner building site leading to a patio, and then to the apartment building and its doors. I usually use the entrance door that's nearer to the subway, and on my side of the apartment. We had to take two buses to go home. One drove us to the train station, and the next one from the train station to my apartment. After getting off the first bus, we realized we would have to wait for around 20 minutes or something for the second bus to come, and since I really had to sleep at home, I didn't want to stay at his place. My boyfriend didn't want to wait, so he persuaded me to walk instead of taking the bus which sober me would have never done. But since I was still drunk, I didn't care how we got home, so I agreed. So, we started to walk home and passed a few sketchy people, but nothing really bad. Then I saw a guy walking in our direction, and I somehow got a bad feeling. So I told my boyfriend that I wanted to change to the other side of the street, because I didn't want to pass him. Suddenly the guy yelled, Hey, 
as if he wanted to ask us something, but we ignored it and continued to walk. He got louder and louder until he started to yell. I could see from the corner of my eye that he was coming over, so I whispered, run, to my boyfriend. I took his hand and ran the fastest I could while he was chasing us. We ran and ran and ran, and then made a turn to the right and hid. It seemed like he was gone, so I took out my keys and we started running towards my building, taking the other entrance of my building that I normally didn't use. As I was trying to open the door, my boyfriend started to panic, throwing me inside the patio and closing the door aggressively and then pushing me to the building. He explained that the guy came running from the other side of the street, meaning he took a shortcut, probably thinking we were going to run to the subway or bus stop. If we'd taken the other entrance, he would have been clearly the faster one. Being in shock, we unfortunately did not call the police, which I regret. I stopped going out for drinks and clubbing for half a year after this and I slept at my boyfriend's place for two weeks because I was scared that he would come back. I think the worst thing about this is that he really wanted to get us for whatever reason. I still don't know why he chased us for so long. Two weeks later, a girl a few streets away was assaulted in front of her building by a guy who chased her home. I wonder if it was the same guy or just a coincidence. This happened to me eight years ago. It was my first month on the job and I worked night security at this pretty interesting place. For the record, I still work there and have more strange stories possibly to tell in the future. I'm a 38-year-old male. I've worked security jobs most of my life and the graveyard shift. I was an event security guard for various well-known concert venues for years, so... I've seen my fair share of strange things and crazy people. In other words, I don't scare easily and hardly ever go into panic mode when a crisis comes up. The place I currently work at is a resort-style apartment complex. To get the layout, there are three floors of apartment with 50 units on each floor. This place takes up one city block with a golf course in back, indoor swimming pools, hot tubs, and a small movie theater. You name it, this place has it. Most of the residents are retired doctors, lawyers, and otherwise rich. There are some younger people that live here as well, stockbrokers and real estate agents, and so on. Some just use their apartment in the summer and leave as soon as the snow falls. It's located in a well-known tourist town in the US. The building itself has 12 exits on the first floor, the doors are locked at 11 p.m. You can exit, but you can't get back in unless you go to the front of the building and ask to be buzzed in, or pick up the call box phone next to whatever exit you're at. It will ring the company's cell phone, and I answer and come let you in. The front lobby is set up much like a hotel, with sliding glass doors which I lock when I start my shift. In the middle of the building on the first floor, are two big slider doors which I also lock. They lead to the private parking lot. The parking lot itself is gated and you need a coat to get in. This was midsummer and while it's not really hot here, tonight was an exception. It was still very warm after the sun had set. I came in 10 minutes to 11 to start my shift. We have a routine to hand off keys, event log, and phone to the next person on duty. Despite its size, I'm the only security person here at night. My co-worker, who was leaving, told me the side iron gates that lead to the parking lot are open on one side, because they're stuck. This is nothing new, they do often get jammed. She told me the repair would be tomorrow sometime to fix them but to just do some extra patrol out there that night. This place sits across the road from a public park, and while the area is pretty decent, the park tends to breed druggies and homeless at night, 
who sometimes like to try and wander on the property or cause trouble. My night started out as uneventful. As a security guard in this place, we only have pepper spray, a large flashlight, keys, and a company cell phone to call 911 if need be. We are told not to confront with bodily harm, nor can we detain anyone. We're simply eyes and ears, and to call the police if something comes up. Of course you can defend yourself if you need to, but in all cases, if you're in danger, call the police is the company policy. Basically, I'm to walk the grounds and floors for anyone suspicious, watch the cameras in the security office, which is in the lobby, and otherwise try to stay alert. If a resident calls for a maintenance request, I would take the information down in the computer for day shift, or if a resident called with a security issue, I would attend to it. Pretty easy enough job, I thought. I locked the doors to the parking lot and the lobby doors. I did a sweep of all the floors and then found myself back at the desk. It was really quiet and it rolled around to 3am. I had just sat down to eat my lunch when the company's cell phone rang. The caller ID let me know it was from one of our outside call box phones. I picked it up and said, Thanks for calling Bluestone. This is Security Officer James. How can I help you? All I heard was someone breathing heavy. I glanced at the cameras and could see the shadow of a figure standing just out of arm reach from the door and camera view. All I could see is the open call box and the metal cord from the phone. I again asked, How can I help you? The man started to breathe heavier and laugh, and in silence. It was one of those laughs you hear in a movie where the lunatic is about to do something terrible. I got up from my chair and started to walk out of the office and to the door he was at when it rang again, this time from call box number two which was further down. I quickly looked at the camera and saw this large figure in a hooded jacket. I knew this was strange as it was very warm outside. He was holding a black bag in his hands but had his back to the camera. I'm coming for you and you're gonna die, the voice said in a raspy, deep tone. He hung up before I had the chance to say anything. The phone rang again. This time I picked it up, and before he could speak, I let him know that the cops were on their way, and to leave the property now as he's on camera. He tried the doors and both were locked. This time he was at yet another call box. This guy had to be running at top speed to make it to the next, and the next call box as they're a good distance between doors on the outside. I can see you. Are you ready to die? The cops won't make it here in time, the guy said. I spoke loud and pretended like I was talking to another security officer and asked him to send three other security guards to such and such location and that police are dispatched. The guy slammed the phone down loud against the call box receiver and I watched him on camera take off into the darkness to the park area. I figured it scared him off. I was going to call the police but honestly, the location of this place, it would take them at least 15 minutes to get here, and I figured this guy was just some tweaker from the park. I scanned the cameras and walked to the back lot, just to be sure no one was there. I had my pepper spray in my hands just in case, but no one was out there. I returned to my desk and wrote what happened in the incident log. About a half hour passed. I had finished lunch and just was about to do rounds when the phone rang again. This time, it was from an unknown number. I thought it would be a resident calling for a repair issue or something. I picked it up and said my normal line. Where are the cops? I don't see them, but I see you. The voice said. Fuck. It was that guy again. I scanned the cameras and didn't see anything. I went to the front door to look out, and there was nothing but darkness and a few floodlights on. I know you're alone, and you're going to die soon, he said. 
I basically told him to get fucked and hung up. I called the non-emergency number to 911 and let them know what was going on. The dispatcher said she would send out a car to check the area and make contact with me. Next thing I hear is a loud thud against the glass windows to the day manager's office, which sits across from the security room. Another three loud bangs. I run to the door and unlock it. I pull up the shades and shine my flashlight through the window into the darkness. I catch the face of this hooded man. He looked to be about 40, with long stringy hair poking down and these wild eyes. He looked right at me and grinned before slamming his head into the window to try and break it. I started yelling at him and told him the cops are coming and to get out of here. That's when he pulled the biggest damn butcher knife I've ever seen and made a slicing motion like he would use it to cut my throat. The guy was crazy and probably on drugs. He continued slamming his body against the glass, trying to break it. He used his head to try and break the window, but managed to bust his head open, so the window now has blood all over it. I backed out of the office and locked the door to it. I then decided to wait for the cops as this guy was out of control and my pepper spray wasn't going to stop him. And the last thing I wanted was to handle a bloody crazy person. He then ran to the nearest side door and took the call box phone off the hook. He then ran to each call box and removed all the phones, which caused my company's cell phone to ring and jam up the line. This guy had to be on meth or something, because he ran as fast as I could imagine. I watched the camera and noticed to my horror, the sliding door to the garage was open. Now it was common for residents to go out to their cars and unlock the doors themselves. It's just a sliding lock like the kind in department stores. But this is the last thing I need with this nut job running around. I sprinted across the building and took a shortcut through a couple banquet rooms to make it to the garage. As I was doing so, I saw that crazy guy running up the garage pathway. I slid that door as fast as I could and locked it before he got to the entryway. He then slammed his body into the glass, over and over, but the door did not move. I locked the second set of doors in case he got through the outside ones. He would at least be trapped or it would slow him down. I reached for my pepper spray, thinking maybe he would just leave, and yelled the cops are here. He started to laugh and howl, and then held up that knife again before running into the darkness of the parking garages. I called the cops on my personal cell phone to let them know that the man has a knife. The dispatcher told me the cops will be there shortly, and I let her know what happened. I made my way to the front again and locked myself in the security office. At least this place had no windows and I could watch on camera. I heard another loud thud and bang, and realized he was at the front lobby doors trying to get in. I was hoping the cops would roll up any minute, but they didn't. And while it probably didn't take them long, it felt like forever at this point. The guy was standing at the lobby doors with a knife in hand. He faced the camera, and by this time, his hood had fallen back. He was bald-headed, with wild, long, stringy and crazy hair on the sides of his head. His eyes were huge, and I will never forget that grin on his face as he mouthed to the camera, Die. Die. While making stabbing motions with that knife. Blood running across his face from slamming into the glass, he then ran out into the darkness. About five minutes later, the cops show up. They sent one officer. He asked me what the guy looked like, and I told him I had camera footage. He drove through the area first and shined a spotlight. The cop returned to tell me he couldn't find anyone, and he'd driven around the entire block and back area behind the golf course. I showed him the footage and printed out a picture from the camera. The cop said he didn't see any sign of the guy, and that he would patrol the area 
and to call back if the guy came again. It was now nearly 5 a.m. when the cop left. I waited until 6 a.m. when it was broad daylight and people were starting to get out and about before I walked around and hung up all the phones from the call boxes. The guy literally took all 12 phones off the hook. When my manager came in during the morning shift at 8 a.m., I told her what happened, and she said they would keep an eye out and have a meeting to let everyone who worked here know and to be aware. They had an extra security guard on my shift for two weeks after, but the guy never returned. The cops never found the guy or found out who he was. This happened to me when I was 19, which would have been in 2003. I was born and raised in a small town, and I was pretty sheltered throughout my childhood and teenage years. I was always warned about stranger danger, but had never really been in a bad situation before. That is, until this happened. After high school, my best friend Jennifer moved to LA to attend USC. I would say that at this point in my life, I'd never even been to a truly large city before, so when I went to visit her, it was a bit of a culture shock for me, especially things like the subway, bus, and train systems. Everyone seemed to know exactly where they were going, with no help from anyone, and it was overwhelming me. Luckily, I made it to her dorm okay from the airport. I stayed for a week or so, and we had a great visit. Jennifer and I were always together which made navigating public transit fairly easy and comfortable. However, on the day I was headed back to the airport, she had work. I didn't want her to worry, and I felt fairly comfortable after riding the bus and subway throughout the week. I said my goodbyes and managed to get on the train to the airport. The first stretch of my trip to the airport went fine. I think I'd even printed off directions. In case you've never used the LA train system, it travels through a lot of smaller neighborhoods before it hits more recognizable, typical, this way to the airport signs. At some point, I became convinced that I was going the wrong way, that I had no idea where I was, that I was going to miss my plane. Panicking, basically. I got off at the next stop and found the map of transit lines studying them like they were written in Greek. That's when he came up to me. Now when I think about what he looked like, it's a blur. He was big, that I remember, and had a hundred pounds on me easy. But he was a security guard, and he was very friendly, asking me if I needed help. He seemed to genuinely want to help me, and so when he asked if I wanted a ride to the airport, which was very close, he told me, I accepted grateful to get where I was going. For me at the time, security guard was as good as a cop. I know now that is not the case, but I implicitly trusted him because of his badge and uniform. The first odd feeling I had was the way he threw my suitcase into his trunk, just tossing it in and slamming the trunk. Then, I got into his car. It was filthy with cigarette butts and trash strewn throughout. I remember not knowing where to put my feet and had to put them on top of piles of garbage. Still, he had a picture of a little kid dangling from his rearview mirror, and so I thought, okay, it's not a big deal. He's a good person. We start driving, and I have absolutely no idea where he's going, but of course I wouldn't. However... After a while, it's clear he's not going to the airport, or at least not the direct route. I try and stay calm and ask him questions. He asserts that he knows where he's going, that this is the fastest, secret way, stuff like that. We end up in a pretty abandoned business area, a place for freight and other businesses that were either closed or empty. There wasn't a soul in sight just deserted stretches of road. He begins circling the same streets, retracing where he's already been. 
At this point, I'm freaking out, but I don't want him to know how scared I am. It's here that I feel like I wake up to the bad position I'm in. He had these reflective sunglasses on and was smoking cigarette after cigarette. After a while of me asking where we were and where we were going, he stops talking altogether, refusing to answer me. After a long period of driving in silence, he starts to ask me about my underwear, how long I'd been wearing it, what color it was. At first I played along, trying to be cool, I guess. I made up the color they were, saying that my boyfriend wouldn't like the conversation, stuff like that. I tried to placate him, not wanting to make him angry. Then he told me he would give me a hundred dollars just to see my underwear, and he began to reach over and tried to touch me, my knee and thigh. I just told him no, not interested, and he did not stop trying. At this point, I am fully aware of the danger I'm in. The only thing I wanted was to be able to get out of the car. I began to think of how bad it would hurt with how fast we were going. I began to tell him that if he just wants to drop me off, I can have someone come get me. I remember trying to make him think that none of this was a big deal, that he could just leave me, and that I would be fine. I just wanted to leave the car. I kept trying to remind him that I had a plane to catch, that I was worried I wouldn't make it. Though I imagined that I sounded calm, I know that, in my fear, I was shakily saying everything. It's hard to remember how long we drove around in what felt like the middle of nowhere. I was leaning far into my side of the passenger seat, thinking that I would just have to jump out if it got bad enough. And then, after a final refusal to let him see, touch, or smell my underwear for money, he speeds up and leaves the area we were driving around in. He drives me to the closest train station quickly, and pulls into the parking lot. Needless to say, I've never been so happy to see a train station. I quickly get out of the car and make sure people can see me. I can remember thinking that was important. He gets out, pulls my luggage out of his trunk, throws it out onto the ground, calls me a bitch, and speeds off. I did get to the airport and make my flight. I didn't tell anyone this story for a long time because I felt so stupid that I'd put myself into this now so obviously dangerous situation. I still feel this way, but now I worry that I should have told someone and maybe he did this to someone else who didn't get so lucky. I work at a jewelry store in a small mall somewhere remote in Canada. It's a fun job. I love my co-workers, love the customers, and love the fixed schedule working in a mall gives me. It's nice to know I'll be off by 6pm every night. Gives me plenty of time to socialize and study outside of work. The mall is a single loop with probably around 50 stores operating on average. They employ a staff of about 30 people to keep them all operating. Half of this staff works admin, the other 15 or so work security. As a regular 40 hour a week employee, I've had my fair share of interactions with security. Having them escort me to the bus stop, on the occasional night inventory had me working late, or calling them into the store to help me deal with an irate customer. Over the years, I became acquainted with a few of the security guards. My favorites were Will, April, and Mark. Will was the friendliest. He'll pop his head into my store and say good morning to me when I'm opening. April was the most, by the books, security guard. She usually helped me deal with difficult customers. Mark was one of the evening security guards, so my only interactions with him were escorts late at night to the bus during which he was quiet, but polite. The schedule shuffle last year put Will on parking lot patrols, April mostly on evening shifts, and put Mark on day duty. 
Not the end of the world. Just kind of sucked, no longer having a friendly conversation with Will as I opened the store, and not having badass April around to step in when customers get unruly. Mark was a lot more quiet than his two counterparts, and just wasn't quite as friendly. I didn't interact with him much for the first few months after this new schedule started. I'd give him a smile as he walked by my store, and it helped him out a few times with shoplifters. But beyond that, nada. No great friendship blossoming out of the schedule rotation or anything. About two months after the schedule had changed, I had my first bad encounter with Mark. I was walking through one of the mall staff hallways to take a washroom break. Mark happened to be walking just ahead of me, also going to the washroom. When we reached the doors, he looked me up and down and then remarked, This is gonna be hard. I got a bit of a chill when he said that, but assumed there was an issue in the men's washroom. Someone passed out in a stall or something, so I asked him, Oh no, why? Because I'm nosy, and was excited to have a bit of mall gossip to share with my co-workers. He got a cold, distant look in his eyes and said, My doctor advised against heavy lifting, and then he winked at me. I ran into the girls' washroom and texted my manager, freaking out about what he just said, knowing full well what he implied with that remark. Mark is a 45-year-old man with graying hair and a bit of a beer gut. He stands around 6 foot 2. I'm a tiny 5 foot 7 girl who was about 20 at the time of this. It creeped me out so much that I reported it to April, my next shift, who promised me she would handle it. I stopped seeing Mark doing patrols and assumed he'd been switched back off of day shift. For about two weeks, I'd heard nothing from him or any of the other security guards. I was just about to end my shift one evening, with about 15 minutes left before we closed for the day. I hear someone enter my store and look up to see Mark walking towards me, with just a look of pure hate on his face. I wasn't working alone so I stepped into the back room to avoid dealing with him. It didn't work. Mark threw the door to my back room open and stood there, screaming his lungs out at me. How it was my fault he'd lost his job, how I'd ruined his life, and how I was going to pay for my mistake. He viewed the sexual comment he made as a joke and thought I was a bitch straight from hell for reporting him. He screamed for a few minutes, and the second he paused for breath, I calmly told him to get out of my store because I was calling the cops and security. He ran out of the store, and a moment later Will sprinted in. He just screamed at me, Where the fuck did he go? And I pointed as I started to cry. I was shaking from the confrontation as I gave my statements to the police and mall security. Mark had been fired after my report but security was adamant that it wasn't my fault. Mark had racked up a bunch of complaints over his years, and it was just the straw that broke the camel's back. He was banned from mall premises the day he got fired and criminally trespassed when he came in to scream at me. Authorities issued a warrant for him, and it took weeks for him to reappear and be arrested. During those weeks, I was very scared. Mark knew what bus I take. Mark knew my work schedule. Mark hated me. Every time I turned a corner, I was scared he'd be there. I believe he's out of jail now. This happened to me a few years ago while traveling. I was private tutoring and my boss sent me to his office to pick up my paycheck at the end of the first month. He gave me the address, so me and my boyfriend at the time drove there, and he waited outside for me. It was a tall building, and I approached what looked like a security guard. I showed him the address I had written down to make sure it was the right place. He studied it, nodded, and told me it was on the fifth floor, and he showed me the direction to the elevator. As I got in the elevator, he stepped in with me. He pressed number five, 
I assumed it was his job to escort people to the right floors. He was staring me up and down the entire time. I glanced down at the address my boss had written down and realized it said, Second floor, not fifth. I turned to the security guard and I started to say, I think we're a little confused as this says second. He made out he didn't understand my language, so I started to repeat the number two in Vietnamese instead. He completely ignored me and instead turned and gave me this creepy smile. It still sends shivers down my spine when I think about it. He reached out and started to stroke my hair, saying, So beautiful. I froze to the spot and started to shout, No at him over and over. By this point, the doors to the elevator had opened. I stepped out and looked around, and there was absolutely nothing there. It was under construction. There was paint and dirty old sheets everywhere, all over the floor. I ran towards the window and looked outside to see if I could get my boyfriend's attention, but I was too high up. The creepy guy had gotten out too and was pointing me down an empty corridor. He looked really frustrated now. He was blocking the elevator by this point, so I couldn't get back in. I pretended to walk towards the corridor and he followed me. When I got to the door, I bolted back to the elevator and started to press the button to the ground floor, and he followed me. Whenever the doors closed, he would just press the button from the other side and they'd open again. He was shouting at me in Vietnamese and looked angry with me. Adrenaline had kicked in and I was literally thinking about anything I could use or how I could defend myself if he tried anything with me. I started screaming as loud as I possibly could to make him back off. As I pressed the ground floor button and the doors began to close again, he smiled at me once more. This awful, creepy smile that I think about all the time. My heart was in my mouth as I imagined what would be waiting for me when the doors inevitably opened again. To my surprise, the elevator started moving towards the ground floor this time, and I managed to get out. I ran out as fast as possible and was crying by the time I got to my boyfriend. He wanted to go back inside, but I stopped him and made him drive me home. Fast. The same day, I called my boss and explained what had happened. It turns out I wasn't even in the right building, never mind the right floor. I blame myself for getting the wrong address, but a different country in that. I don't know why the guy in there pretended I was in the right location, or what his intentions were with me, or even why he decided to just let me go. Maybe he was trying to scare me, or maybe he was trying his luck with me. I have no idea, but I think about it from time to time, or tell the story again to someone. And it really creeps me out to think of what could have been. I've never gotten in an elevator with a man again either. I'm a male security officer. I found a strange letter on patrol. For context, it's been raining in my area for the past couple of days. While on patrol, I found a letter. Despite the weather conditions, the letter, although soaked, is 100% legible. The letter contained this message. Mr. E, I don't know what's going on with me. The minute I get back to camp, I get uncomfortable around you. I straight up go into not able to shut up defense mode. The more it happens, the snarkier the comments become. I go on edge and stay that way until I go to sleep. So I leave and stay gone till the sun comes up. It seems that for some reason, I do not trust you when we're alone in the dark. I'm not sure why, but something has changed. Something feels wrong. And you don't seem to care all that much if I'm around or not. 
just as long as you have a place to stay until you get your camper. What I want to know is, what is it that needed to be done? The area I patrol is fenced in. There hasn't been anyone here except me. The ink is still legible. The paper is lightly worn, despite the weather. There's no camp within an hour's range of here. Who is Mr. E? Mystery. I don't know how this letter came here, but I don't want to meet you. So the other night, I was working this post that was pretty much shut down with roadblocks up to check any and all personnel that do try to enter the facility. Both roads that lead to my gate were blocked off less than half a mile just north of me, and another a little over two miles to my southwest, around a bend that was completely out of sight. Well, the one just north of me, when people do pull up to it late at night, the headlights will just be visible down by me on my cameras. I was sitting there drinking some coffee and trying to keep myself awake. I'd hardly seen anybody. My sight was inactive due to what we call a hard down, with only essential personnel being granted entry. A truck had just come pulling up to the guard shack just north of me as I watched on camera, and as the truck is pulling up and coming to a stop, I see a reflection in the camera that I thought was just the lights of the truck, until I opened my eyes a bit wider to focus, I saw it move. What it looked like was a complete silhouette of a person, and I thought maybe somebody was walking up to my gate in the dark, and it made me jump out of my seat to look out the front window to confirm a visual. As I'm looking out, I see absolutely nothing, and I look back to the monitor, and there it is on screen. The silhouette of a man that looks to be wearing a hazmat suit. I kept looking back and forth from the window to the camera, and as I'm doing this in live time, I'm just catching glimpses of what the camera is picking up. I radio the other two guards, asking if they'd let any personnel get through their checkpoints. I get a negative response back, asking me what's up. I told them to stand by as I review what I just saw on the recordings. To my absolute disbelief, I watched, stunned. As the truck comes pulling to the north guard shack, its lights shine on some movement. What I could make out was a silhouette figure of a man wearing a hazmat suit walking. When the truck comes to a stop, the man also stops. The man looks towards the truck, does a double take from me to the truck, and just walks across the road and disappears. I thought I was going crazy and maybe seeing things because of my lack of sleep. I clipped and saved that portion of the video and waited till shift change to show the other guards I worked with over the night, and the ones coming to relieve us. I never said anything about that night or anything to the guards coming on shift, and I played the clip for them. Everybody's jaw dropped and saw exactly what I did, without me pointing anything out. This is a regular occurrence. Out here, most of the guards that have been here a while have seen things and have stories. I just got what I've been waiting for, solid proof for myself. Four years ago, I trained a new worker who was honestly a nice guy at the time. Early thirties, seemingly healthy, very much into yoga, had a beautiful girlfriend, the works. He seemed very balanced and healthy. His name was Andrew. We had another longtime co-worker who was sort of Mr. Popular with managers, but honestly, really annoying. People could only take him in small doses. He was essentially the embodiment of a TikTok frat boy who would randomly dance on the job and freestyle. Extremely annoying. Anyway, his name was Brad. Now, before I explain, I should include that this workplace sucks. It barely holds a single star on Indeed. It's a large factory with no windows, toxic management, 
long hours. It was very hard on most people's mental health. So anyway, roughly a year into Andrew's stay, things started to change. He and I were mutually friendly to one another. We would have long civilized discussions about interesting things, but something was really out of place when he mentioned his new beliefs about the world being flat and a hologram moon theory. It was really unlike the old version of him, who was really rational. I sort of shrugged it off and said it's probably a phase or he's trolling. Fast forward a few weeks. Andrew has seemingly took a lot of interest in co-worker Brad and sort of developed some of his mannerisms, but in a more endearing way, kind of copying his silly dances and laughing. It seemed harmless, but as months go past, he continued to dance more and more, to the point he had to be asked to stop by supervisors. He would even be moving around at the morning meetings, using all the same mannerisms and phrases as Brad. This really started to creep out Brad, to the point he switched shifts. We theorized maybe he was on drugs, but Andrew was very vocal against all substance use, including alcohol and weed and such. He was also a vegan. Where things change for the worse is when Brad ends up getting with a new hire at work. She ends up becoming his girlfriend. They move in together and such. This is when Andrew shows up to work using Brad's name, even signing himself in on the logbook as him, referring to himself as Brad all morning. Then, later that day, Andrew stands up on a work table, screaming that he's in love with Brad's girlfriend, his arms spread out in a cross-Jesus formation, face to the ceiling. The whole place was silent, and after, he ended up standing in a corner with a broom, sweeping nothing for the next several hours. He would not turn around from the corner, not even when tapped on the shoulder or called by name. The only time I saw him away from that corner was when it was time to go home. He was the last one out. Unfortunately, my job being QC, I'm always among the last ones out as well. Despite both of us being the last in the building, I did my best to act normal when passing him in the hallway. I glanced at him. He was looking directly at me, head tilted down, making a pseudo-snarling dog face, eyebrows in a V, tongue and teeth out. The next day, our boss decided Andrew needed to go to the hospital, so we actually made an appointment and got him in an Uber. He was put on leave for a week. The security guards who I was friends with told me Andrew kept showing up in the middle of the night trying to sign in for work at the card reader, sometimes at 2 to 3 in the morning. Anyway, surprisingly, a week later, Andrew comes back and seems somewhat normal, almost like he has no recollection of anything he did. He even wrote an entire album on his phone in that time, which surprisingly was better than I thought it would be, but I noticed it was all love lyrics, sort of wacky country love songs. As things seemed to normalize with Andrew, he stated he really wanted to hang out with me, go for a hike and throw axes at trees and stuff like that. I sort of didn't agree or disagree and told him I'd get back to him on that, as I was secretly a bit on edge. He asked me later in the day if I was still down and I said unfortunately I had other obligations and he said, well I guess I can't throw an axe at your face then and I laughed, not knowing how to react at all. I told the manager about that, and he kind of just scratched his head uncomfortably and shrugged his shoulders. Anyway, Andrew ends up finding Brad's address due to a work get-together where everyone was invited and someone leaked it to Andrew. They eventually find rocks and sticks and weird formations on their doorstep, like shrines, and we all collectively knew it was Andrew. Things got really weird when they actually found Andrew looking through their windows at night. He was also scratching the windows with his nails, calling out Brad's name, repeatedly whispering, Brad, I need to tell you something. This is when our manager finally decided to take action and fire Andrew. Four years later, Andrew still stalks Brad's now ex-girlfriend, who had to get a restraining order against him. 
He annually makes new Facebook accounts and adds all 200 plus workers who used to work there. He uses a new name each time with a different selfie. He sends a message to each one of us as well, saying, Hey, it's Brad from work. So I guess my question is what would this behavior be called? And how did such a normal, likable, level-headed person turn into this? Is there a term for this behavior? What would your diagnosis be? One of my friends had the balls to ask him in a reply if he recalls anything, which he doesn't seem to, but he sure remembers Brad's ex-girlfriend and says some extremely concerning things about how she's the one and the only one. I'm the bigger one, she's the smaller one. There's a quote. He said that he was put on this earth to essentially save her. He also seemingly has no support at all from family or anything and is working a new job living alone, unattended. I feel like this is sort of a risk. Anyway, I'm interested in some of your feedback in what he might be dealing with. This took place around 15 years ago. I would have been about 13 years old. My dad has always taken an annual fishing trip with friends that would put him out of state for about a week. I have numerous stories about weird things happening while he was gone on said fishing trips, from paranormal events to someone attempting to break into our house, but this one is the most unnerving to people when I tell it. When my dad would go on these trips, I would usually sleep in my parents' bed. My mom and I treated it like a little sleepover and would watch movies, stay up late and gossip, even on school nights. I remember falling asleep after a late night movie and being roused from sleep what felt like just minutes later. My mom is a light sleeper, while on the other hand, it takes a catastrophic level event to wake me up from a dead sleep. I remember waking up feeling as if something was wrong. The room was illuminated oddly and there was a distant rhythm I was only partially aware of. I'm half asleep, and as I open my eyes, I can see my mom on top of the bed, on her knees, peering out of the window above her bed. I started to ask, what's going on, when she turned to me quickly and shushed me. I quietly joined her looking out of the small box window that was slightly cracked open, and the distant, rhythmic chanting became more and more clear. Our house sat in front of a strip of woods. The trees aren't too thick, and you can see through most of the wooded area. The chanting was getting louder by the second, and the odd illuminations finally made sense. You could see a line of hooded figures in dark clothes, holding torches marching east, chanting what sounded like demonic, dark things. It felt surreal and scary as we held our breath, waiting to see what they would do. Were they headed towards the houses to burn them down? Were they going to attempt to break in and sacrifice us? It felt like ages that we sat there, watching this line of people walk through the woods, their torches raised high, and their chanting continuing through the night. But that was it. They just walked away. After what was probably more like two minutes, my mom and I lay back down and discussed what we saw, trying to get back to sleep. We told my dad first thing in the morning when he called to check in, but I remember him not believing us. He thought it had to be a dream or something. That kind of thing didn't happen in our small town in Ohio. But the next day, there was an article in the local newspaper about a lamb being slain on a makeshift altar on the east side of my town. My dad stopped doubting us, and my mom and I got even more freaked out. My parents still live in that house, and we've never seen any other cult-like behavior in the area. But that one evening freaked us out enough that I decided to permanently camp out in my parents' bedroom every time my dad left town. 
until my late high school years. If you stuck around, I appreciate it. Thanks for listening and allowing me to get my story out there. My friends and I were reminiscing about creepy stories this weekend. This one came up and I haven't stopped thinking about it since, so I wanted to write it down and share. I'm a security guard for an alarm response company. We answer alarms for businesses and private residences. 99% of the time, it's a motion detector set off by a cat or a restaurant forgot to disarm their stuff before the stock truck arrived to unload. In this case, I was called out to a house where the back door alarm was set off, like it thought someone opened it. The owner was out of town, but she was alerted by her app and had her mother meet me there. We checked the door. It's locked. We figure maybe someone tried the door, but it didn't budge, setting off the alarm. But there's a light on inside. The mother mentions this to the daughter on the phone. The daughter says she isn't sure if she left the light on or not. It's a good idea to make people think someone's home, but she just isn't sure. That gave me a bad tingle. The mother wanted to go inside to check. However, she didn't have a spare key. The neighbor did, but they were asleep and the mother didn't want to wake them. So... I fill out my papers and go back to my normal patrol routes. An hour later, the same house sends an alert out. I'm the only one in my city zone, so I answer it again. When I pull up, police and CSI are there talking to the mother and the now awake neighbor. They are reviewing the video footage sent to them by the daughter. I look at the footage. Four armed men wearing masks and hoodies came out of the bathroom. A minute after the mother and I left, they proceeded to rob the place. They'd broken in and locked the door behind them for appearances. They're the ones who turned on the light. The mother told me three guys had robbed her daughter's home a month before. Somehow, they knew when this girl would be out of town. They appeared smart, desiring a quiet robbery without conflict, but they brought guns so they were prepared to shoot their way out of trouble, if need be. The mother had wanted to go in. If she'd had a key or woken the neighbor for a key, we would likely have been shot dead by these guys when we went inside. Work doesn't give me Kevlar vests or anything. If I ever get another house call and someone is there, I'm not going inside, no matter what is asked of me. I count myself fortunate the way was blocked this time, because I was prepared to foolishly go in and check if I could. The 1% of calls where something is actually off, it has never been as bad as this one. About five years ago, I worked for a high-end kitchenware company as a floor salesperson. At the time, I was about 20 years old. I'm a female and I'm a larger woman, and I'm five foot nine. I'm also mixed indigenous, so picture thick hair, dark features, wide build, that kind of thing. This is important for later. I'd been working at this job for a few months at this point. My boss whose side note was a total creep, had really warmed up to me and had promoted me to keyholder within a few weeks of working. I'd become comfortable closing on my own and working alone too. Often I'd be working either a full day shift, which is 9.30am to 6.30pm alone, or I'd work a crossover shift where I'd overlap with someone for about an hour. Then I'd close the store alone. That shift was 4pm to 9.30pm. One evening I came in, greeted my boss. He then decided to take a smoke break for about 25 minutes within his last hour of overlap. I didn't mind, as I mentioned. The guy was a total creep. But as he was leaving, I noticed a kind of strangely behaving man pacing outside of our store. Our location was inside of a mall, so you'd see window shoppers all the time. 
but this guy was pacing with intention. He was wearing a large jacket, sunglasses, and a hat, so it was genuinely hard to see him, but he would occasionally lower his glasses to peer into the store. I even called out to him from behind the desk at one point, saying something like, I don't bite, come on in, in a friendly way. He shook his head and said, just looking, in a low but clear sounding voice. He backed away, leaving the storefront. I brushed it off as some random just being too nervous to come into our store. Whatever, it happens all the time. It was at this point my boss returned from his smoke break and began finishing up a couple of his end of day tasks before leaving. I mentioned to him that I accidentally scared off a nervous window shopper. We kind of laughed it off and disregarded it as nothing, but something felt weird. He was pacing for a solid 20 minutes just by the window, staring in. Again though, it's retail. I chalked it up to weirdness. After a few minutes, the phone rang and I picked up. On the other end was a guy with a low and clear voice huffing, asking about getting a gift for his girlfriend. The conversation went like this. Oh, no worries. We have a couple of options for gifts. Is she looking for knives? Dinnerware? I, uh, don't know. <sighs> she liked knives, I guess. Okay, if you're not sure what she already has, you could get her a specialty knife. Fuck. God, yeah. Oh, sorry. Just... Sorry. Specialty knives. I know I should have hung up at this point, but I continued. It's okay, uh... Yeah, so, specialty knives. We have an assortment. Some are meant for meat and fish. Others are for vegetables. Does she like to cook a lot? He proceeded to say some very sexual and derogatory things. Excuse me. I questioned him. He continued on with the extreme comments. At this point, I promptly hung up the phone, shaking and nervously looking around. My boss knew something was up and asked me what was wrong. I told him what had just happened, and he expressed his apologies, but otherwise didn't seem concerned. It clicked in my head suddenly. The guy window shopping earlier had the same voice as the guy on the call. I was petrified. I told my boss I was nearly certain it had been the guy. At that exact moment, my boss got a call from his very young girlfriend, and he had to leave 15 minutes earlier than he had planned. So, there I was, alone in the store, and stuck there for another four and a half hours, and the stars were not aligning for me that evening. I ended up calling security and let them know I'd received a threatening call from a customer who I was fairly sure had been wondering them all. They stationed an officer near the store for the remainder of the evening, but I still felt entirely on edge. Every call after that, I let go through to voicemail. I was too scared to answer again. I was also working at another store in the mall at the time. I called my friend there to ask if after their closing shift, if I could walk home with them, and he agreed. I quickly walked over to the other store with a security guard nearby and started to walk home with my friend from my other job. The whole time I was scanning my surroundings, getting glimpses of shadowy figures outside and making myself anxious. Eventually I got home, calmed myself down and tried to get some rest. The next day I had a shift at my other job with the same friend who walked me home the previous night. At one point in the afternoon, I picked up a phone call, and it was the same guy. I much more quickly realized who it was, and hung up a lot faster this time around, but he got as far as saying, I like this uniform better. I can see more of those curves without. Then I hung up. I told my boss at the game store about what happened, and we made an official buddy system after that. Nobody leaves alone, ever. Luckily, we always worked in pairs, 
but we didn't separate until we were either at the bus stop or at home. Nothing happened after that, thankfully. It was just awful having it happen back to back like that and with no conclusion. The security guard stayed on alert for a while. I ended up speaking to other female workers in the mall, and as it turns out, there was a handful of plus-sized women getting harassing and violent phone calls for a little while, but they never caught the guy doing it. I still think about it years later. I wonder where he is and what he's doing. I never saw him again, I don't think at least, and if I did, I would have known. Anyway, thanks for listening. It feels good finally getting that off of my chest. I studied abroad in Costa Rica for about three months, and all the students in this program were living with host families nearby the university. As the country is considered far safer for men, I would often walk my female classmates to their host homes after class got out. The university had several security guards patrol the neighborhood on motorcycles to make sure that we were all safe, so walking at night never felt dangerous. This particular night, I was walking two girls home, and it was completely dark out. When we were about two minutes away from the first girl's house, a car drove by with two younger local guys in it. The passenger hung his head out the window and shouted some sexual things at the girls. Unfortunately, that wasn't a unique experience for the girls, due to the machismo culture, but it was a little surprising as guys generally won't say anything to girls that are with other guys. We continued walking until we were about one block away from the first house when we saw the car stop in the road in front of us. Both the passenger and the driver got out of the car and started to walk toward us. I told the girls to start walking the opposite direction while I stood there trying to figure out what I was supposed to do. There were two of them and only one of me and at least one of the guys was keeping his hands in his pockets, potentially hiding a knife or a gun. Luckily, when the guys were only about 15 feet in front of me, and I still hadn't figured out how one dad bod having college kid was going to fight off two fit and potentially armed goons, a security motorcycle came around the corner and sped toward us. The guys ran to their car and drove off. The security guard followed us for the rest of our walk home, and he would follow us every time we walked home for the rest of the semester. I'm a 17-year-old female working as a cashier at a popular thrift store. I've been there for approximately eight months, and I love my job and my co-workers. The common thing I've noticed is that unfortunately, any time a new younger female cashier starts working, she will be hit on by plenty of older guys, and I was no exception to that. I've never had to deal with creepy or weird customers until this job, and I worked in the food industry before, so maybe that's why. We of course get a handful of regulars, and while I've had a few creepy older guys hit on me before, there's a regular that comes in all the time. I want to say he's in his late 40s, and while he's always nice, my manager pointed out his obsession with me. I was called in the office the other day so he could show me how he acts and such with surveillance cameras. Here's a list of what's been pointed out to me that I didn't really notice before. He comes in at roughly the same time I'm working every day and apparently doesn't show up on my days off. I work closing most of the time, so he comes in around 6 p.m. When he comes in, he will immediately look at the register I almost always work at and will do a double take looking for me. He usually buys one bullshit item, spending about 15 minutes in the store usually. My manager has pointed out that he needs to buy something or else he knows it'll look weird. Every time, without fail, he will go to my register, and even when I was on the floor doing recovery, he'll ask me to check him out because 
I'm his favorite cashier. If there's a shorter line, it doesn't matter. You will stay at my register, waiting and watching me. He lingers around after buying something just to talk to me, showing me things on his phone, making sure there's no one else in line. My manager said he approaches me when I'm alone so he can talk to me without holding up a line. He's commented on my hickeys that I failed to cover up before on my neck, making weird remarks here and there. He says he usually checks because there's always about one or two. He said I would look good as a blonde, which isn't inherently weird, but paired with everything else, I guess it is. When I wasn't wearing any makeup, he would say something like, you seem out of sorts recently. I started wearing makeup again recently, and he's commented saying he likes that I'm back to my old self. I've noticed weird, flirty remarks with him, but I always brush it off, because customers are always kind of weird, and I deal with that often anyway. He'll lean over the register counter to talk to me closer, just his body language in general. He does a double take when he leaves too, keeping his eyes on me. I think it's possible he knows what car I drive. He was at my work this morning, even though I always do closes. I've asked my boyfriend, who works with me, if it's true that he never shows up when I'm off. He said yes, it's true. I don't think he knows my schedule, but he might know my car and see it in the parking lot. He always parks out of the store outdoor camera view, so I still don't know what car he drives. The general manager was made aware by the manager, but the creep didn't interact with me much today because I was never alone at the register or on the floor. I was training a new cashier today. He was there a lot longer than usual, I'm assuming because he was waiting for a time when I was alone and there were no customers. I think he gave up when he realized I would be training for the majority of my shift and seeing how busy it was. Since I worked opening yesterday, he came in before my shift at work, probably assuming I would be opening again. I'm working closing tonight. Apparently, he came in earlier and saw the new cashier, so we actually ended up asking one of them. New cashier? Who quit? Probably thinking I quit. It's only 4.33. He usually comes in around 6 if I'm closing. I'm just waiting to see if he shows up for the second time today. I doubt he will since he might think I don't work today. My manager and I are going to keep a log of what time he comes in and leaves. I'm going to keep his phone number saved in my notes so I can look him up and hopefully find his name and other information. I will possibly keep my phone on the counter to voice record what he says. I wish I could record him in person, but it would be too obvious. If I get shown more security footage, I will video that instead. Last night, my boyfriend and I got in bed. Lights off, TV on, in bed naked as usual. A couple of minutes go by of us talking and our cat jumps on the nightstand and is staring outside. He does this all the time so I assume it's a stray cat out there. He runs across the bed to my nightstand, so I peek outside. My cat's tail is all fluffy, so I think it's just the cat that he doesn't like. I look out the window and see a phone screen. I have no clue what was on it. I didn't think to actually look that hard. It was a red thing in the middle, but that's all I know. I look at my boyfriend. Assuming I'm just seeing the reflection of his phone, when I see my boyfriend is not holding his phone, I back myself into the corner of the wall so whatever's in the window can't see me. I just repeatedly say, there's someone outside, until my boyfriend finally gets up. I grab a sweater and pants from the floor, and we're just walking around the house as he calls 911. We come back to the room, and the guy is still out there but my cat will not let me get near the window without growling, so I don't get to see his face. The cops get there a few minutes later and search the block. They come from the front yard and the backyard, climb some fences, and they don't find anyone. 
They just say they'll be on the lookout and to stay aware pretty much. My boyfriend and I are both reasonably shaken up. I point out that Kat was acting similarly last night. Not exactly, but she was fluffed up and on edge. He pointed out that with how often I sleep naked or close to, it's possible the guy has done that multiple times to see. He also points out that with the lights on, you could definitely see into the bedroom from that window, so he would have been able to see us having sex if he caught us on the right night. There's no proof he's been there more than once, and with our neighborhood, he was probably just some guy on drugs wandering around. He left the gate open, stood there even though we clearly spotted him, and just didn't seem too smooth in his operation. I don't know. I just hope it was a one-time thing. I feel so helpless. I didn't go outside and do anything because I didn't know if he had a weapon, but I wish I could have. My boyfriend wants to buy a gun this weekend, and I hope that can at least give me some sense of security. Hello. I'm Evie. I wanted to tell my story because it was absolutely terrifying at the time. It all started the morning of February 14th, 2018. I was in middle school and the campus was buzzing with life. Guys were running around with gifts for their girlfriends. Girlfriends gave gifts to their boyfriends. Friends exchanged candies. All in all, everything seemed normal. I wasn't popular per se. But I knew everyone, and everyone knew me. But I preferred to hang around with a small group of close friends, because being around too many people made me anxious. During lunch, I was hanging around my usual group of friends, which consisted of two girls, Alex and Mia, and three guys, Nico, Adrian, and Elijah. Valentine's Day, of all days, made me even more anxious, because a lot of people would join our group because of my friend Adrian. He attracted a lot of girls, and my friend Mia was such a sweetheart, and a lot of guys wanted to date her. I began to feel overwhelmed, so I slipped out of my group and headed to a secret hiding place, which was just a bench that was way out in the field, sort of hidden by some trees. No one really went there, so it was a good place to catch my breath. As I was reading my book, I hear someone getting closer. I look up and see this guy. Emmanuel. When I saw Emmanuel, I instantly started to freak out, because he always seemed to have this sort of infatuation with me. Every day, he would force himself on me, randomly hugging me, trying to kiss me, telling me he liked me. And believe it or not, I would often see him around my neighborhood. I decided to play it cool and continued reading, when he suddenly just grabs my book out of my hands. Hey, what the hell, man? I yelled, and he simply responded with, Sorry, I just wanted your attention. I was still angry, but I tried to calm myself down. What do you want? I said. I really like you, and I want you to be my girlfriend. I swear, I'll treat you like a queen. After he said that, he handed me a box of chocolates and a cute stuffed bear. I thought it was a nice gesture, but I really felt uncomfortable whenever he was around. So I told him that even though it was sweet of him, I was already in a relationship, which obviously wasn't true. When the words left my mouth, he turned from being nice and calm to angry. He yelled at me, saying how dare I date someone that wasn't him. I tried to get up to leave, but he tightly grabbed my arm and forcefully kissed me. I tried pushing him off, but he was stronger than me, so I yelled for help at the top of my lungs and he quickly covered my mouth. So I bit his hand and kicked him in the balls. While he was shocked, I broke free and ran to my friend group. He yelled behind me, saying how he would assault me and then kill me. Obviously the duty guards heard this and immediately took action, but I just wanted to get to the safety of my group so I kept running until I bumped into Adrian. 
I hugged him and cried my eyes out. He comforted me until I was ready to talk. I told him everything, and then I was suddenly called into the principal's office. They wanted to know everything that had happened, and the police were called. It was a long day, and I just wanted to go home. After I told them what happened, I was allowed to leave for home early. I later found out that in his house, there was a shrine built for me, with pictures of me doing various things, walking with my dog, eating in my living room with my family, even of me changing. It was horrible and traumatizing. This story takes place last summer in August, when I went to visit my friend in another city. I'd been there for one day, and this night, we decided to go out for some drinks and then for dinner. While we were walking to the restaurant, dressed to the nines, a couple of men older than us stopped us and asked what we were doing that night. We chatted and then asked if we would be willing to come for a drink with them after. My friend and I, being young and liking the attention of course, said we would see how we feel, and they said that they would be staying at the restaurant that we saw them outside of, and that their usual table was right next to the patio entrance. We went for our dinner, and as we were walking back, not thinking of these men that we'd previously encountered, we heard them calling over, and they said, just join us for a drink. My friend and I kind of looked at each other, and it was only about midnight, so we decided that we would go and join them for a drink. My friend is hilarious, and we're both really assertive, so she decided to ask for two triples and a shot of expensive tequila when they asked us what we wanted to drink. They laughed and said how they liked that she knew what she wanted. The drinks came out pretty quickly, but the shots were taking a while, and one of the gentlemen had gotten up and left the table. We assumed to take a call. After a few minutes, the gentleman came back to the table and sat down next to my friend, and the shots came out not long after with the waitress. Not thinking anything of this, my friend and I took her shots, and almost five minutes later, my friend looked at me and said, Something's wrong. I don't feel right. My friend in general tends to overreact in some situations, so I brush it off and say, Don't worry. Everything's okay. The next part of the story is not coming from my own recollection. It's coming from my friend's recollection because unfortunately, I don't remember anything from that night. My friend said that I began slurring my words and acting a lot more drunk than I should have been, given the amount that I had drank, and one of the gentlemen suggested that they give us a ride home, because I wasn't looking so well, and I'd probably drank too much. My friend asked if they'd had a car, because in this big city, it's not common to drive around. It's more common to taxi or Uber and they'd pointed to a Rolls Royce that had illegally tinted windows and was running with a driver in the front about five feet away from the patio that we were sitting on, and it had been there for about 30 minutes. My friend immediately got a weird feeling, and though she was also feeling kind of loopy and dizzy, she got us both out of there. She said she provided no explanation, and she grabbed me by the arm and started dragging me down the street in a downtown, highly populated area while booking an Uber. According to my friend, the entirety of the Uber ride, I was sweating profusely, vomiting. I could barely walk. I couldn't speak. My eyes were rolled back, and I was completely incoherent. When asking my friend about how I got so sick and how she didn't, she reminded me that she'd been drinking a lot the night before and wasn't feeling that great so she only took about a third of the shot because she wasn't able to finish the whole thing because she thought she was going to vomit. Me, on the other hand, of course. I took the entirety of the shot down and clearly got a higher dose of whatever was given. The next day, obviously, I felt like absolute garbage, but needless to say, I think my friend definitely saved us both that night, if not just me from an unknown group of men 
who had unknown intentions with two young drunk girls and then drugged them in the heart of a big city. I moved into a large studio apartment complex a few months ago. I'm a single female with a two-year-old daughter. My sister and a few of her friends came over about three weeks ago to hang out, have some beers, and play cards against humanity. My studio has an enclosed patio, save for a door-sized opening. Since my child was sleeping, I had everyone chill outside on the patio. We were having a great time, joking, talking, and listening to low-playing music when the security guard entered my patio. Hi there, are we being too loud? Has someone placed a complaint? No, no, you guys are fine. I'm just doing my rounds. He lingered for a minute more and then strolled out into the night. We continued our activities and didn't really give him a second thought. He returned about 25 minutes later, right after most of the group had left. Only my sister, her friend Cody, and I remained. He was an overweight, late 40s, early 50s white male, and he wore glasses. He strolls into my patio once again and strikes up conversation. We learn he's a retired cop that had to quit the force after suffering a heart attack on duty. He states he had to undergo a quintuple bypass surgery, and after recovery, he started night security jobs. I felt sorry for him because of the medical history and sat and listened to him for quite a while. He must have stayed at least 30 minutes before my sister got uncomfortable and loudly announced that we were going to bed. He bid us a good night and left. Once inside, my sister said that she didn't like the way he was looking at me, and she thought that he took a liking to me. I initially told her she was reading into it too much, and that the guy was just lonely and had a long shift ahead. A week and a half later, my sister is visiting again, and we're sitting inside my place, talking. My studio has a black screen door and a wooden door. I had the screen locked and the wood door wide open to let some air in. My sister's talking to me, and I have the sensation that someone is looking at me. So I glance up. The security guard is standing at the doorway of my patio, staring. I say hello, and he jerks forward, as if expecting an invitation in or something but I turn my attention back to my sister, and when I glance back, he's gone. This week on Tuesday, I took a shower and threw on my red silk Japanese-style robe. I was washing dishes for about 25 minutes, and had poured a glass of wine. I turned from the kitchen to sit on my couch, and I strangled a scream. The security guard is almost pressed up against my screen door staring at me through the foot-long crack of the wood door. I was so startled and shaken, but the first thing I did was to make sure my rope wasn't exposing me. I ran up to the screen. You scared me. With no emotion and no apology, he said. I was just doing my rounds. My scalp is crawling and I'm still shaky, I say. Okay, well I'm going to bed now. He's still right up next to the screen door, all the way inside my patio. He turns and looks at my beach cruiser parked against the wall. Oh, you have a bike. You should put it inside because someone could take it. He said. Yeah, I'll get to it, I respond. I pretty much slam the door and lock it. I sit down with the wine and calm my nerves. I was shaken up but wasn't sure if he was really being a creeper or just a lonely individual that was looking for someone that had expressed interest. After a debate with my friends and sister, I contacted the property manager. I was actually surprised by how quickly it escalated. They took my verbal incident report over the phone and just informed me today that the guy has been fired. The property manager told me to call the police if I see him on premises again.
When I was in high school, I worked part-time at a local coffee shop. One day this kind of weird, overly friendly guy came in and started talking to me at the register. I wore a name tag with my nickname on it and he asked if it was short for anything. I said yes and told him my full name. He asked what kind of name it is. My name originates from a Greek name, so I told him that because it's kind of interesting. He asked if I've ever been to the Greek festival in my city. I said no, and he replied with, Well, you belong there. Them Greek girls are hot. Mind you, at this point, I'm 16, and this was a grown man. After that is when things got weird. He would show up to the coffee shop every day, and ask my co-workers when I would be coming in, or if I was working that day. Eventually, he would start sitting at the seat right by the front door, waiting for me to come in. One day, he physically stood up and blocked my path, and asked if he could buy me a coffee, and then he grabbed my hand. When I declined and tried to walk past to go in the back, he tried to follow me behind the counter and into the back room, he would hang out there for hours just watching me and would try to constantly talk to me. My managers eventually had to tell me to work in the back until he left every day. And then he started sitting in the seat closest to the back room. After that, I had to start coming into work through the back door and staying there until he left. My co-workers had to tell him I quit, hoping he would stop. Then he became obsessed with one of the other girls, and the cycle started all over again. He truthfully didn't seem that harmful, except for the time he grabbed my hand, but it was creepy and he was constantly there. The owner of the coffee shop had to file a restraining order in the end, because no matter what we did or told him, it didn't stop. And he was there, just watching and waiting. Nothing ever happened after the restraining order. He was allowed in the plaza the coffee shop was in still, just obviously not in the coffee shop and not near the patio by the front door. And we usually saw him go to the grocery store until the restraining order. He just disappeared after that. It's very creepy and kind of scary as a 16 year old. This happened back in the 80s, so very much the pre-cell phone era. I was in high school at the time. One night after dinner, my mom suggested we take a walk around the block to walk off dinner. My brother and dad were watching TV and opted to stay home, so it was just us, girls. We lived out in the fringes of the suburbs, in a subdivision that was semi-rural, by that, I mean there were houses, but no street lights or sidewalks. Everyone had septic tanks, as there was no sewer service and that kind of thing. The houses were all well back from the road, and the lots were wooded. Anyway, we were walking around the block, which is about 1.5 miles in total, and we're almost back home. It's pitch black that night. There was no moon, and we had a flashlight to use as needed. Without it, you couldn't see much past a foot or two around you. We mainly used it as a signal if a car went by, but there wasn't really anyone around, so we had it switched off and were just walking and chatting. Just as we turned the corner onto our street, we suddenly heard footsteps behind us. This was a bit weird as we'd just come from that way and hadn't seen or heard anyone walking on that street or coming down the driveways we passed. But, we just figured it was some neighbor also out for a walk, and we hadn't noticed them in the dark. So, I turned around to look, and switched the flashlight on to see who it was. They immediately switched a flashlight on too, so I could only see their light and not them. They said nothing. We kept walking, but the footsteps behind us sped up now. They sounded heavy, so we thought it was a man. We sped up. He sped up. I turned the flashlight back on, and he turned his on again in silence. We were too scared to call out, 
and now we were approaching our driveway. As we got there, I pushed my mom in front and told her to get up the driveway, which was steep and long. Once she had a start, I sprinted up after her. As I did, the footsteps veered away to the other side of the road and kept going. Nothing was ever said by this person, and normally people here wave and spoke when out walking or even driving by. When we got up to the house, my dad said it was probably just a neighbor. So, my brother and I got into my car and drove down the road to see who it was. No one was there. We went all around the roads and no one was walking on them. There wasn't time for him to leave the area. Either it was a nasty neighbor getting off on scaring us and then ducking into a house, or whatever it was came out of the woods behind us and then disappeared back into them. About four years ago, I worked as a laundress. I worked 5 a.m. to 5 p.m. and would often work alone. We usually have a security guard posted near the parking lot, and later in the day, they patrol the building. They carry a radio and pepper spray. Anyway, a new guy started, and I never saw him watching over the parking lot when I came in each morning. Throughout my shift, he would come into my laundry room. He was talkative but I noticed he would look at my body a lot when he thought I wouldn't notice. One day I came into work and started putting my stuff away and getting ready to begin. I hadn't turned on all the lights yet, so there were parts of the room I couldn't see. Suddenly I hear radio static in the corner of the room and I see a red radio light. I turn on the lights and the new guy is in the corner of the room, hiding and watching me. When I asked what he was doing there, he said he was just hanging out and started laughing. It was obvious he was waiting for me. He ended up doing this so often that I got used to it. I came in early one day and was working in one of our smaller areas. He came into the small room to talk to me. He's a big guy so I couldn't get around him. He was just talking to me, but I couldn't move or leave the room because he blocked the door. He asked me why I came in early that day, and I told him it was because I had to leave early later. He told me that I was required to tell him all my hours so he could always know where I am. He was leaning over me and felt like he was trying to upset me. I had this horrible feeling in my stomach that he was about to try something, so I pushed past him and called my supervisor, who said he would keep an eye on him. I told him that I had a bad gut feeling about this guy and that I needed to leave for the day. The next day, he was fired. Apparently, he wasn't in the guard tower at the start of the shift because he would spend most mornings in the woods near the parking area, recording girls walking in for their shifts each morning. They also found a huge collection of pop and soda cans and coffee cups in his locker that he admitted that he dug out of the various trash cans around where I and the other girls worked. His wife shortly left him and took full custody of their newborn baby. So this is an ongoing situation, but it went from annoying to seriously creepy. There's a maintenance guy at the office building I work at. He's hired through the landlord of the building, not our company. His name is Bob. Bob is an older guy, maybe late fifties, and a former heroin addict. I say that, but we're all pretty sure Bob still occasionally indulges in the habit. He's very socially awkward, and his mannerisms and way of speaking are strange. He talks really slow and pauses in places where pauses don't make sense or trails off mid-sentence. He also gets really close when he talks to you and makes intense eye contact, or stares at me through our huge front window that happens to be in front of my desk. So, overall, a mildly creepy guy. 
He's done some weird things in the past, like give me his personal number, bought a co-worker a $200 wedding gift, and had it delivered to her. The staring at people through the window, and he gave me a toy riding horse thing for my son, the kind that's on springs and rocks back and forth and he asks me personal questions about my marriage and tried to ask me to go on a date with him. I also found my car door open and a bunch of my stuff, like paperwork and some perfume and makeup I keep in my center console, moved around once when he was here. Today, he comes in the front office and just kind of stands there after saying hi. I ask my co-worker if I can go out and have a smoke, and she says yes. I go get in my car and keep the door cracked so I could smoke. I was parked under a covered carport thing outside the back door, across from the utility and supply room. All of a sudden, Bob is standing there, and kinda grabs the door and opens it a bit. I don't know where it came from, but I was listening to music, so I wasn't really paying attention. I took my earbuds out and looked at him like, What? He doesn't answer right away. He then asks me if I can take him to the store. A. He has a big white truck that he knows I know he has. B. He knows damn well I can't just up and leave while I'm working. I tell him that and he says, No, no, it's okay. I already asked another co-worker and she said okay. I ask him why he can't just drive himself. And he stands there for a second, looking at me and then he asks me to help him with something in the utility room. I say no, and I need to get back in before I get yelled at. He stared for a minute, and then smiles the creepiest fucking smile, and says, No, you won't. They think you took me to the store. We have plenty of time. I don't know if I'm accurately conveying the creepy, scary vibe he was putting off, but I was scared at this point. I didn't know what he wanted or what he was trying to accomplish, but it wasn't anything good. And on top of that, he wasn't moving out of my way and he was six inches away from me. I tell him to move and he stands there for a few seconds, but then finally moves. I dialed 911 on my cell phone and jumped out of the car and ran inside. I seriously thought he was going to grab me and push me into the utility room or something. I'm still shaken up about it. Oh, and he didn't ask a co-worker anything about the store. He made that up. He left right after the whole thing, and I really don't know what to do about the whole thing. When I was in my late sophomore through my junior year of high school, I was diagnosed with insomnia. I would sleep maybe an hour or two every 24 hour period, with sporadic binge sleeping rather randomly. Anyway, being awake at all time essentially made me alone a lot. So, one summer, I decided to walk to a gas station near my house to get a Gatorade or some shit. It's about 2am, no one is awake in my house so I just walk out. I'm arriving at the gas station after a pretty uneventful walk, and I'm approaching that glow from the overhead lights, so things on the far edges are visible, but illuminated very poorly. The gas station has a really steep drive to enter from the main road, and the other end has a small pothole-filled parking lot with a narrow little alley that leads to an avenue. As a relative side note, I grew up in a very average middle-class neighborhood, not a suburb, not inner city, and really close to a country town neighborhood than anything else, I guess. Anyway, I start heading towards the front door, and in my peripheral vision, something moves in the darkness. So, not being very suspicious, I lazily turn to look. I can make out the shape of a person, and they're very rapidly materializing from out of the dark. It's a kid probably a little older than me, and he's on a pretty fast clip jog. He jogs right up to me, and stops about half an arm's length away. We just stare at each other. The weird thing, though, is that his upper lip is essentially shredded. It was like he fell off a motorcycle or something, and he was bleeding. 
He was also bleeding out of his nose, and his lower left eyelid was drooping down and full of blood. He had a bunch of blood splattered on his white t-shirt too, as if he'd sneezed or something. I began to say something, but before I could utter one syllable, he just moved to my left and kept running. Without saying a word, I went in, got my drink and walked home. I was waiting to hear about it in the news the next day. I didn't. So, while hanging out with a close friend, I mentioned what had happened. We mulled it over for a bit, and then, he suggested something. He knew it was a wild shot in the dark, but he suggested that the kid didn't exist, and that I just really needed sleep. I hadn't even thought of that, and to this day, I don't know. So I was walking through the town center with my husband. We were just talking about what bills needed paying and that kind of thing. I looked straight in front of me, and there was a man. This was no ordinary man. This was a man whose face is etched in my brain, in my memory, a memory I locked away many years ago. When I was around eight, my aunt, who had a few learning disabilities, lived on her own. She was not very clean lived in a one-bedroom flat with around five cats. It stunk. It was dirty. But I used to go help her tidy up and look after the cats. There was a man who lived in the upstairs flat. His name was Chris. Chris also had cats, and his cats had kittens. Chris had befriended my aunt and used to come talk to her. They seemed like good friends, but I didn't like him much. One day while I was there, Chris turned up and he'd been feeding kittens for most of the night as the mom cat was rejecting them. He said he was tired, and if he fell asleep to wake him in two hours to feed the kittens. Two hours went by, and my aunt said we need to wake Chris so we could feed the kittens. My aunt tried to wake him, shaking him. All he did was grumble and say, Fuck off, get away from me. I'm sleeping. My aunt started to laugh, thinking he was joking and started pulling at his foot. She hit down on his foot and shouted, Chris, you need to get up and go feed your kittens. All of a sudden he jumps up, no emotion in his face, looks straight towards me, and started to march my way across the room. I tried to run for the door, but he managed to catch me around my neck with his hands, and they got tighter and tighter. I wanted to scream. I wanted to cry. I wanted my mom. I thought I was going to die as he raised me off the floor with his hands still around my neck, slowly creeping up the wall. I was eight, around 56 pounds, so I wasn't very big at all. I was quite petite. I could feel the life being drained from me. All of a sudden, I felt my body sliding quickly down the wall. I felt a very sharp pain at the top of my leg where it meets your backside and realized he'd slammed me down on a radiator that was on the wall. With that, he let go, straightened himself out, and said, I'm gonna feed the kittens. And he left. I was crying so hard, I just wanted my mom. My aunt just stood there, mouth open. She didn't try to help. She just stood there, screaming while he did it. Funny thing is, I know she was screaming. But in the few minutes that it took to happen, it was like silence for me. Pure silence. All I could remember is just looking in Chris's eyes, thinking I'm never going to see my mom or brothers or sisters again. My aunt rang my mom. She caught a taxi straight to her house. My stepdad came and went to find Chris. He disappeared. No one knew where he was. For two weeks, my stepdad waited outside the flats but Chris never came back. Some cat protective people came and got the cats and kittens and took them away. The police showed up as my mom was ringing them, as a neighbor had heard the commotion and rang them. They took our statements and took us home. I had photos taken of my injuries around my neck and just under my backside. I had a big gash from the side of the radiator. I had to have it dressed by a nurse for a while. It turned out okay but left a scar. 
Chris went to court and luckily I didn't have to attend because of my age. All he got was one year conditional discharge. That was not justice. It was a joke. I was scared to leave my home. I didn't want to play outside with my friends. My aunt went on to not talk to the family and marry that man. I wanted so much to wreck the wedding I hated him. Her. Them. I hated them to the point I cried. Why should they be happy when they stole my light? My light was now dark. It divided a lot of the family. It took a long time for nightmares to stop and the anxiety he was going to come finish what he started. I put it away in a box, never wanting to open it again. And there he was, stood right in front of me, right there. I wanted to go slap him, beat him up, but I also wanted my husband to just hold me tight and tell me I was okay. As I looked back, he looked at me, but I don't even think he knew who I was, but I certainly knew who he was. As quick as I saw him, he was gone. I stood on my feelings for a few days, but I think it's time to put them back in the box where they belong. I matched with Priya on Bumble some months ago. We got along very well, went on drives. Boutique coffee outlets like Third Wave got a lot of patronage from us as well. Usual late 30s couple, no kids, and significant disposable income, thanks to tech jobs in Bengaluru. We both lived relatively far away from each other. We'd stay at each other's place whenever we could. I was married before and I'm a cat parent. Ristray adopted me and my ex-wife some years ago, and since my ex moved to Europe after the divorce, I was left to take care of it for about two years. Apu, the cat, is a sweet, cuddly brown bundle. In 2019, just before the pandemic, my ex and I had been to the US to visit her younger sister. A seller on Etsy had listed cat collars for sale, which came with a bell. We'd brought a dozen or so of those collars and brought them back with us. The cat collar with a jingling bell on a poo was hilarious. He hated it for a bit, but then he got used to it. Over the past two months, the bell on that cat collar started disappearing. I didn't think much of it. Those collars were bought in 2019. I thought they were going to wear off sooner or later. And since I had about a dozen of them, I would always change the collar on a poo. But shortly after that, the bell would go missing. Last month, I decided to stay over at Priya's place in Whitfield. She lives by herself in one of those gated villas. I don't worry much for Apu. He does his business in the litter box and knows how to work the cat food dispenser. One thing about Priya, she cannot stand smoking. And I had, for reasons of my own hadn't disclosed that I do smoke sometimes. So yeah, I was staying at her villa, and it starts raining heavily every day. We don't have much to do. Stuck indoors, we finish a bottle of Amrut single malt whiskey. The neighboring villas are all flooded, they're pumping water out, and we realize it's only a matter of time before Priya's village will be flooded too. We want to secure the doors as much as we can to stop the water from entering. I ask Priya if she has any old clothes or blankets that we can use so we could create a barricade. A futile attempt, but we were drunk and we wanted to do something. She hands me an old, hideous green blanket, along with some old beige curtains and t-shirts. We plug the doors as best we can. We're tipsy and tired. We collapse on the couch. I vaguely remember saying something half funny about the hideous green blanket. That was my mother's favorite blanket. After she passed, I would always have it with me, whenever I'd have to sleep. But then I remember having it on me. When I had a miscarriage, I felt my mother's presence, she said. And you know what? She hated cats, she continued. So, my date doesn't have her mother, who hated cats when alive. She believes in the afterlife, and she's had a miscarriage. 
Yet, she's held onto that hideous green blanket for God knows how long. The things I realized one rainy, drunken night that I'd never known for months. The perils of modern day dating. I get this sudden urge to smoke. I excuse myself, lock myself in the bathroom and open the windows. Once I finished, I threw the cigarette butts into the toilet and flushed. That's when I hear an oddly familiar sound. I lift the lid off of the toilet tank. I see four of Apu's cat collar trinkets. I quietly walk out the back door. The streets are flooded. There are no cabs. I book a hotel room on a Goda app to stay for the night. I've blocked Priya's numbers. I've deleted Bumble. Apu's cozied up next to me, purring away with no care in this world as I type. It's raining again. It was June 20th, 2011. I was on duty working a detail on my day off. I had a little over two years on the job and was always eager to jump in to help other guys. I saw a call come out where a guy pointed a gun at his wife, loaded his car full of guns and ammo, and told her he was going to kill his adult kids who live about an hour away. She calls 911. He's gone by the time units arrive. No history of mental illness, not drunk. This came out of nowhere for him, according to his wife. I see the heavy units bolowing for him, so I get permission to leave my boring detail and help look. I get a weird feeling and text my dad that I'm looking for this nut and have a bad feeling that I'm going to find him. I just found out I was about to be a father and I texted my wife at the time and told her I loved her and that I had a bad feeling. I was sitting in the dead center of the county border between east and west on the very south county line in an area I always called no man's land because backup was usually the farthest there, six to eight minutes away on average. I had another guy there with me for a bit, and he saw me take my patrol rifle out of the roof rack and chamber around. He laughed at me and said, totally unnecessary, and eventually left for a different call. Now I'm sitting at the county line alone, and we get an update that the bordering county was in pursuit with him. He jumped out with a rifle and pointed it at the deputies. They back off to not get shot, and when they try to engage him, he disappeared in his car. Okay, so the guy is obviously now pretty damn committed to whatever his mission was. The description was a gray Toyota with an army bumper sticker and a navy bumper sticker. I see a gray Toyota go by me toward the next county, so I pull out to check the tag and I see two bright pink stickers on the window. I think to myself, the stickers are pink, not military, while I try to catch up. As I get close, I see one says Army and one says Navy. I grab the radio and call out. I'm behind the suspect, headed south into an adjoining county. That's all I get before he slams on the brakes. I don't try to light him up or anything. He stops in the middle of the road. I do the same. He's able to get out first because action is faster than reaction. As he gets out, I see a chrome 357 with a 6-inch barrel in his right hand. Fuck. He's facing away from me, which seemed odd. I jump out with my patrol rifle and retreat to my trunk for cover, since a Crown Vic door won't do shit to help me with those rounds. He turns towards me, gun still in hand. He's by his car, probably 20 feet from me. We make eye contact as I raise my rifle, flicking the safety off. As I'm starting to squeeze the trigger, he raises the gun to his temple, and his gun goes bang before I'm able to take a shot. He drops immediately. I get on the radio and announce shots fired. Pretty soon, backup arrives. A witness calls 911 and says, I witnessed the deputy shoot the man down. 
Now it's an OIS investigation until the autopsy the next day when they can prove it's a big hole in his head and not a 556 size hole. There was no dash cam because it was an old car they were getting ready to auction off. It was pretty awesome to see my body go into action and perform as I trained without having conscious thought about it. It happened so fast. Less than a minute passed from when I called out that I was behind him to when I called shots fired. I didn't get shit for it. No commendation. No award for my file. Nothing besides some PTSD as a prize. I didn't sleep good for six months because when I closed my eyes, I ran through scenarios of what would have happened if things were different. I played it out every single way, from he ran into the woods, to we exchange rounds, to he kills me. I did some emotional drinking, which didn't help me either. Everyone thought the traumatic part for me was watching him die, but nobody really could understand that was it. The haunting part was the sinking feeling as I threw my radio down, and for the first time in my life, I said, oh fuck, I'm gonna die. I never saw a shrink for it because I didn't want to look like a coward. I should have, and highly recommend it. It worked itself out for me. Not sure how, but I have no issues from it. Now it's just this wild ass story I get to tell. I don't know what time my kids were born, but I'll never forget where I was on June 20th, 2011, at 10.51, and when I get those weird feelings now at work, you bet your ass I follow them. When people find out I used to work in law enforcement, usually the first question I get asked is, what's the craziest thing you did or saw? It's hard to pick one, and after stumbling across a subreddit, I thought I'd share some. I worked for a small to mid-sized agency for six years as a patrolman, detective, and police sergeant. I also think people want to hear cool stories, but I usually trail off into something depressing. I haven't really told my wife most of these things, just buried stuff deep I guess. Summer 2014, officer involved shooting. I was working the night shift, and about two hours into my shift, my neighboring district officer asked if I wanted to go grab dinner with him. abso freaking lootly Mexican food during a slow weekday is always a good call. 229 Center Show me in 226 code 7. Officer K and I placed our orders and are drinking sweet tea, eating chips and salsa, and are just waiting on our food to arrive. Officer K is really deep into telling me some funny old war stories from his previous time in the military. He doesn't hear the tones come over our earpieces and continues to tell his story in hilarious detail. I had already stopped listening and began to listen to the radio call come in. Shooting just occurred at 1254 Belmont Street. Suspect shot the brother-in-law in the forehead with a pistol. The suspect is still on scene. White male, late 50s, wearing a white shirt, blue jean shorts. The suspect is still on the property. I'm familiar with the area and know that it's on the very edge of our city limits and is possibly a county call and not a city call. I hear my shift sergeant and patrol lieutenant get dispatched and are en route. Officer K and I are about a six minute drive from that location, maybe three to four minutes running code. I get up and tell the waitress to cancel my order and start running out the door. Officer K is still clueless because he didn't hear what was going on. He realizes what is going on when I'm running out the door. I didn't even think of telling him for whatever reason. I just tunnel visioned on the information dispatch was putting out and mentally making a map on the fastest way there along with the mental map of the area and where the house could be. I run to my Tahoe, start it up, and start hauling ass with lights and sirens. I see two of our patrol vehicles heading south on the highway already as I'm on the service road, 
It was the sergeant and lieutenant. I ended up about a minute behind them as we were all collectively driving toward the call, running code. Dispatch updates that the suspect is still on scene and is still armed and smoking under a carport. I catch up to them as soon as they hit the exit ramp for the main road towards the call. We all enter the area at the same time and drive towards the scene. The house ends up being on the corner. It was dark and it was hard seeing the house numbers to see where it was. The first two units in front of me start to make a U-turn to come back toward me while they are still looking for the house. I saw a white male smoking a cigarette under a lighted carport, matching the description. He was smoking a cigarette with his left hand, and his right hand was behind his back. I announce it over the radio while I step out of my vehicle, and the sergeant and lieutenant maneuver their vehicles and get out. The sergeant and I end up walking in a V towards the suspect, and the lieutenant walks far left to try to negotiate with him or something. We started about 50 yards away and continue walking closer to him. Both of us had our weapons drawn. I was telling the suspect to show me both of his hands. My voice was getting louder and louder, and both the sergeant and I were giving him explicit commands. The suspect kept saying things like, Why are you here? Or, My sister is over there. This is her house. The sergeant and I were about 18 yards away, when he moved the right hand away from his back. I immediately saw a pistol in his hand as it was coming up and being drawn towards us. I fired one shot that struck him in the left arm and entered his chest, stopping in his spine. The second shot I fired was a glancing round to the top left of his head that didn't penetrate. He was falling as I was firing. I don't remember aiming at all to this day, I just remember being focused on his hands and watching every movement he made. I believe that the firearms training I had and shoot-don't-shoot shoot drills we practiced during in-service training helped me. The sergeant and I walked towards the suspect and handcuffed him and called for two ambulances. The lieutenant went to check with the family members and the initial victim. The victim was in the last stages of dying. He was shot by the suspect's 25 caliber pistol in the middle of the forehead. From what I gathered, the family had a get-together and had been drinking all day. The suspect was planning on leaving to get more beer, and the victim was trying to stop him. The suspect had a felony warrant for DWI, and the victim was trying to help him. The suspect did not want the help, and after an argument, shot him. The ambulance came and regretfully picked up the suspect first. I don't think much could be done for the victim at that point, but I think he should have been a priority. The suspect was transported to the ER, and Officer K ended up staying with him until CID could make it for a statement. Since my patrol lieutenant was there, he began making all the admin phone calls to get CID over. I started setting out cones, marked the scene, and took some preliminary pictures. I called my wife to tell her I was okay if anything made it to the news in the next hour or so. The next call I made was to my police association to talk with the on-call lawyer. I had a call from the PA's president and vice president within 20 minutes to see if they could do anything for me or my family. I was impressed with their support and concern and later saw the benefits they would host to help out other PA members. CID arrived and inventoried my pistol. They collected it and gave me another one to take home with me. I didn't feel any grief or regret about what I did at the time. I still don't after knowing all the facts after the investigation was over. The suspect, now a convict, is still alive as far as I know. I went to a sentencing hearing. I was given about two weeks of admin time off and spoke with the counselor to make sure I was okay to come back to work. Stay safe. Please stress to young officers, learn the geography, and don't rely on electronic aids. I was able to picture the block the house was on just by knowing the street numbers. 
The house where the shooting occurred was a few houses from where our jurisdiction ended. It ended up being a county call after all. For context, I'm six foot two, and at the time I was like 18 stone, or 115 kilograms, so a big unit. In a past life, I worked as an officer in a tourist town in the UK, walking the streets, interacting with locals and visitors, the usual community engagement type stuff. On a hot day in the height of summer, I stopped off to get a bottle of water. I was stood in line with my helmet off enjoying the feel of the AC hitting the back of my head and going down my neck and back, trying to cool the space between me and my body armor. Crack. Something hit me across the back of my head. Turning slowly, my hand dropping to my CS spray, I looked to see who had just assaulted me. I was met with an old lady with a walking frame and walking stick. She proceeds to have a go at me. You should be out there catching criminals, not in here stuffing your face, she said. I'm just getting a bottle of water and did you hit me? I asked. Yes, because you were ignoring me, she replied. Right. I turn away from her as there's now a till free and purchased my water and left. About 30 minutes later, the inspector gets a hold of me on the radio asking to meet with me to discuss a complaint. So, he comes out to where I am and gives me the details. A member of the public had complained that I was being rude and belligerent to them and ignored them when they were talking to me. I asked when this happened and he told me today within the past hour. I then give him my side of the details and when I mention the hit to the head, he immediately wants to go to the shop. So, we go off in his car back to the shop where I got my water from. Once there, he goes straight to the till area and is excitedly asking me, Where were you standing exactly? I showed him, and he smiled from ear to ear and just pointed. There was a CCTV camera pointed right at where I'd been standing. We went and reviewed the CCTV, and sure enough, there I was, stood there, helmet in hand enjoying the AC on my head and the OAP behind me. You can see on the CCTV she's trying to talk to me, but I have an earpiece in and can't hear properly, so I genuinely missed that she was talking to me. Then it happened. She took hold of her walking stick and proceeded to tap me on the back, on my body armor. She did this four or five times maybe before she just cracks me on the back of my head. I turned in such a way my face could be seen on the camera, and you could clearly read my lips for the short conversation we had. With that, the inspector turns to the staff. I would like a copy of that burning off, and he just left, got back into his car and drove off, leaving me and the staff member there like, okay. At the end of my shift, I went to his office with a CCTV and he filled me in. This lady had been a serial complainer against police for anything and everything. Patrol cars parked in the wrong place. This officer looked at me funny. Officer was seen doing things they shouldn't. But this time, he had a counter-argument. When he called her back to advise that he'd spoken to me, he opened with, What did you do to get the officer's attention? I tapped him on his arm. She replied, Really? Yes, she said. You know there's CCTV in the shop, especially around the till area, he told her. So, she said. So, I have CCTV of you assaulting my officer. You struck him across the back of his head with your walking stick. Apparently after this revelation, she was very shouty and incoherent before calming down and being delivered the parting shot by the inspector. We will ignore the fact you assaulted an officer while on duty, as long as you stop making unfounded complaints against my staff. We are entitled to a break to get food and drink. We can park our cars in the visitor's car park of your complex, 
when dealing with incidents. We are human and should be allowed to work unimpeded. As far as I know, she never did make a complaint against an officer again. We did attend antisocial behavior in the area of her complex, which we were sure would create a complaint of why we were not doing something about it. But no, we didn't hear a peep. So we get a call from an assault in progress at the truck stop. Apparently a Greyhound bus had a bunch of people fighting, so the bus stopped at the truck stop and someone called the police. The security guard at the truck stop ends up fighting some guy and needs help, so the dispatchers have us run code 3. I'm first on scene and I see maybe 30 people standing around, and the security guard on top of a guy yelling at him to... Put your hands behind your back. A couple of guys are yelling at the guy fighting with the security guard. Just do what he says, man. But the guy is really drunk and being really combative. I run over, grab the guy and he's in cuffs pretty quickly. Other officers arrive and began defusing the situation. So once the guy catches his breath, I ask what the hell was going on. He tells me, Sir... I just got out of prison. I was locked down for the last four years. When the bus stopped, I grabbed a couple of four locos and drank them on the bus. This guy looked like your stereotypical gang member and ex-convict. Tattoos on his head, pressed t-shirt, black sweatshorts, and that kind of stuff. His friend walks up to me and tells me how they both just got released. And when this guy started drinking on the bus... He started a fight with the black guys on the bus because the black guy looked at him funny. The guy ended up TKOing our friend in handcuffs, so the bus driver pulled over and this guy started fighting with everyone. That's when security got involved. Well, I'm quickly figuring out that this guy is just a shitty drunk, and he's going right back to jail after only being free for five to six hours. Some old white guy who was on the bus also walks up to me and calmly asked, Hey sir, what's this guy's deal? He's been starting shit with people the whole ride. I tell the old man, eh, He just got out of prison after four years and had too much to drink. The old man says, That's no excuse for his bullshit. I just got out too. I was locked up for 36 years. You don't see me acting like a fucking moron. What's this guy's problem? I say, wait, you just got out today. 36 years and today is your first day out. He says, yeah, we all just got out today. The bus is dropping us all off in whatever city we're from. Just left of Houston on the way to San Antonio, then Dallas. Curious, I asked him, what did you do? Murder someone back in the 80s? Unfortunately, yes. Got no family anymore. I'm on the way to a halfway house and I gotta deal with knuckleheads like this. I decided not to dig any deeper into this old man's life, but the thought of serving 36 years in prison is nuts. Imagine all the change that's happened since the 80s. It probably feels like a time machine to this guy. Well, there's no point to this story other than some drunk ass managed to make it a few hours before going back to jail, while another guy spent a lifetime in prison. Have a good day, folks. The Tyranny of Feeling That's the problem with police. You don't show enough feeling, she said. You don't feel enough. She's right, of course. A drowning in a desert town with no lakes. My partner jumped into the canal and pushed a huge man to the bank. I struggled and pulled. He pushed and slipped. Both of us wet and covered with mud. Neither of us feeling the cold water. Our new officer arrived and I jumped into the scene, pushing on a man's chest while I hovered over his face, trying to see inside his mouth. His wife 
hands on my shoulders, screaming in my ear, screaming no. I couldn't feel her breath on my neck, her tears on my head. Finally, my partner says stop, just stop. I looked down and saw my pants were covered in a man's blood, which had poured from the bullet hole in his temple. I couldn't feel the wet blood soaking through my pants. She's right, of course. I couldn't feel enough. A gunshot in the basement of a home. As I made my way down the stairs, the air was filled with a haze. A man missing his face and a rifle sitting in a lake of blood on the bed. Three walls covered with meat. The mewling, writhing figure, unable to speak, but clearly letting me know the horror, the pain he was feeling. A few inches of jaw glued to the carpet, the stubble of beard visible from inside. The home now filled with explosive gas, a mother unaware, a mother begging us to let her son die. As I grabbed the woman by the arm, I couldn't feel her brittle old bones under my grip. I couldn't smell the gas, couldn't gag as I pulled the jaw from the carpet. I couldn't find it inside me to feel the horror. She's right, of course. I couldn't feel enough. A mother, worn by the chemotherapy, held hostage. A son, a mind broken by drugs and now holding mom hostage until a girlfriend returns. I can't feel the gun in my hands. A pain develops. A promise of a drink for a thirsty mother, worn by the long negotiation. A foot through the door. A son brings the knife towards my partner. I can't feel my friend get cut. I can't feel my gun, screwed into the temple of a man who's so close to having a mind broken by a bullet. I've got the knife. The officer behind me yells. I can't feel the relief. She's right, of course. I couldn't feel enough. A breathing problem. A medical call. Leave it for the medics. But I'm here, and this lady isn't breathing. Won't breathe again. I can't feel her granddaughter behind me, watching me place the shock pads on grandma's chest watching me push helplessly on grandma as the machine tells me to push harder. Later now, the medic's gone. As her husband pulls me into a hug, I can't feel his heart breaking inside. Her husband has to say goodbye, and I go to her first. I never knew her, but she wouldn't want to be seen like this, not for a goodbye. I pull a breathing tube from her throat, I can feel the bulb catch on her teeth, her stiffening jaw fighting this release. I pull on the bone needle screwed into her shins. I can't feel how the diabetes has scarred her lower legs. I wipe the blood from her nose and mouth. I can't feel how cold the blood already is. She's right, of course. I couldn't feel enough. A naked monster celebrating his first day outside of prison with a cocktail of street drugs and liquor, kicking in the door. A boy, just eight, standing behind the door, holding a bat to protect his four-year-old sister from the monster outside. I can't feel their panic. I don't know they stand just feet from where the monster and I fight. I can't feel his fingernails, carving deep and bloody into my arm. I can't feel the burning as sweat, blood, and mace spray into the bloody cuts. He can't feel the pain. He's well beyond feeling. As he breaks the porch, breaks the door, breaks my skin, breaks the quiet peace of the neighborhood, I can't feel his hair in both my hands, pulling him back from the sidewalk where he slams his head. Even today... I can't feel those five long scars on my arm. She's right, of course. I couldn't feel enough. A stolen car, a property crime, a man, too much time inside bars, reaching for the gun wrapped in a white t-shirt, 
cleaner than any of his other clothing. I can't feel his hands around my waist as we fight, as we drag him from the car. I can't feel the cars driving by us as I punch. His girlfriend screams, but I can't feel her fear. As I continue to punch five, six, seven hits, why won't he stop? My wrist breaks, but I can't feel that right now. I'll give you this, he says later as we laugh together. You boys know how to get down. I ain't never been punched like that. I can't feel the admiration. Can't feel how sometimes the only one who understands is the guy you have to fight on the other side of the game. Months later, putting together another Lego set for my son, he can't feel the bone inside my wrist give too much, the sharp pain that makes me gasp. I can't feel the wrist, the back, the shoulder that is given too much. She's right, of course. I couldn't feel enough. Another friend, another loss. Years ago now, he pulled that girl out of the cold creek. Did he feel how the six-year-old body was too heavy, too water-soaked? She was the same age as his daughter. His daughter the same age as mine. His daughter's handmade cards along my daughter's on the fridge. He'd felt enough. He must have had enough. This happened about seven years ago, but it's a story I try to tell every officer that I train. It was summertime, and just one of those hot, nasty, sticky nights. But thankfully, we were not really dealing with any of the unrest that had been rolling through the country for the past two years. However, because of the aforementioned unrest, attitudes towards police were at an all-time low. We had what felt like very few on our side, and I'm not even going to get into the politics of the region. Anyways, I'm riding with a senior officer, and the man that would later convince me to become a training officer, and we get dispatched to a noise complaint. Apparently, a bunch of teenagers are having a party, and the mixture of music and fireworks is upsetting the neighbors. We arrive on scene, and it is exactly what has been reported. Loud EDM music, fireworks being fired from the backyard, and even at the front door. You can smell alcohol and weed smoke. Pretty standard start. Knock. Knock louder. Try the doorbell. Knock again. It takes a minute or two before someone answers. Now, the kids in the town are smart and their parents normally have enough money to have a big enough house that we cannot see anything from the doorway. We tell the young man that opened the door to turn off the outdoor music as it's past the city's quiet hours. We also remind him that fireworks are illegal in the county. He assures us that he's going to turn the music off directly and that the fireworks aren't coming from their property but from the field behind them but we didn't actually see any fireworks after we pulled up to the house, so we can't confirm. So far, pretty routine, nothing of note. Until a teenaged girl comes wandering into the foyer while taking a big drink of her twisted iced tea. Before I even get a word out, my partner calls her out by name. She's apparently on the cheer team with my partner's daughter. So, we detain her. And since we're all young and stupid once, my partner's trying to get a hold of her parents, but reminds me that since we're detaining her, we have to run her. And while she isn't exactly taking us seriously, she's calling us pigs and other horrible stuff. Anyways, my partner and I don't expect to have anything flag when we run her, but we are wrong. Bench warrant for FTA on a pending charge of disturbing the peace and resisting arrest. I call my partner over and ask if he wants to break the news or if I should. Well, the way we normally work arrests, assuming they are not resisting, is we will have one of the officers first inform of the arrest and reason. 
Then they will read our department's Miranda card. During that time, the second officer will cuff and do a pat-down. Yay. I get to be the unlucky officer that has to frisk a teenage cheerleader in front of her friends. I do an extremely cursory pat-down, trying to avoid any appearance of misconduct. I do not care that I have a body-worn camera. I just don't want to deal with the blowback and reputation of liking to touch little girls. I, of course, do not find anything. And since she's been so cooperative, we cuffed her hands in front of her to give her a little better comfort. In the meantime, while we have drawn a crowd, the music has been turned off. No fireworks and no other obvious underage drinking. We radio in that we're coming back to the station with one juvie in talks with a bench. Did I mention that my partner was also the department's senior club patroller? Yeah, he would often make sure all the curbs were exactly where we left them. As we're leaving the neighborhood and turning onto the main drag to head back to the department, yeah, curb check. I give my partner an annoyed look. I seriously think he did it just to annoy anyone that rode with him. But seconds later, we hear him. Oh shit. From the back. I wish I could tell you that it was from her going to be sick. Or that she was warning us of what was coming. Like maybe shit herself or something. But no. I don't think anything would have prepared me for what I saw when I looked into the back. She'd taken out one of the cheap box knives that had the scored blade that can be easily broken off, and it cut deep into her leg. When we hit the curb, apparently it stabbed and broke. I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, blood all over the back seat. I tell my partner to pull over, radio for a bus, and I grab out our little first aid kit. As soon as we pull over and I rip open the door, she starts acting like she had forgotten what she'd just done and tried to pull away from me. After I told her that I have to try and get her bleeding to stop from her self-inflicted stab wound, she sobers up a bit, remembers what happened, and completely panics, seeing the blade in her thigh. I managed to, with what little we had, tape some cardboard onto the blade in hopes it wouldn't cut anyone else, apply a pressure bandage and get it taped, EMS arrives and we transfer her into their care and follow them to the hospital. The rest of the night was spent in ED until she was admitted for a 72 psych hold before being released back to us. Turns out, the box cutter was hidden in her bra and had I done a proper frisk, running my hands past the underwire and up her sternum, I would have found it and avoided this whole mess. And the takeaway... Always do a proper search. You just might prevent yourself, your partner, or your arrestee from getting hurt. For those that care, she was diagnosed with some mental issues and got the help that she needed.